Should be power underneath it. This, this should be that strip underneath it. Should be extra. If not, let me know and we'll, we'll get it. why I saw an earlier one. We, we've got to make sure that we update everyone's bios. And as soon as I've been seeing them kind of pop up, I've been going through, but you have to do it right on your digital device. Yeah. Do the all right. If we're not acting as judges, we won't do the all right. Okay. That's you. Listen, I was thinking about you. Tip it back. <laughs> this is for me, not me. Me protecting you from me.
Well, the walkway's empty cars, so quite a bit. My cell phone number. Okay. Call me if you need this all you here for any reason. So how long have you been marshaling here? Eleven years now. Eleven years. Never. Yeah. I left. Uh, I was deputy director at FX Chief, and I came here. And I was driving for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Just turned in. It's been a strange year, hasn't it? Well, look, we're glad you're here in the day. Well, I'll have to eat a I don't walk out of here. Check the other one over there, Jane. Good luck. Oh, wait till next year.
In a trial. In a Supreme Court case? Yes. <laughs> Call down no, I, did. I, Call was down a, I was a, I was a mock witness for my husband. Okay, mock there trial. you go, there you go. So you did what? I've done that. You know, I, I taught for a year, I taught trial practice in the student's final exam was a mock trial. They had to go, you know, they go get their witnesses and all. And then first year law students would be the jury. And the first time I did it, I send the jury out. And they're not coming back. You know, the first year law students, they got to argue about everything. So after a while, I say, okay, well, well I got five minutes to reach a verdict. And then, whatever, and then after that, I gave them 30 minutes and said, you're just going to be in the 30 minutes. It's the end of 30 minutes, guys. Yeah, you, all you get is 30 minutes. Because you're on the clock. The students want to know if they want to. They want to know if they want to. So, even though we're doing it, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't Okay. Where did so they get those photos from? Because like they got an old photo of mine, too. That's my high school Yes. Okay. <laughs> just like that, so maybe you, you can see okay? I brought yeah, this one well. that you sent to me. So I that. That's from me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know that it is. You, you can probably share that with Jake. Okay. Here's my room. I get up at 8.30. Well. That's a good one. Jay, I've got two I need two cookies for dinner. Okay. Can I go to brush my teeth? I've got my teeth. So then I go down, hey, Brent, and then I go down. That's nice. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Yeah, no, I'm done with two people for a while. Jack Larkin is going to call me to get the record and then my turn is going to go and call the special. I've got my shaker. <laughs> oh, my God. Good thing that I got a mask on tomorrow. <laughs> so, Lori brought some coffee. Yeah, I'm going to get some. Let's go. Yay? Yeah. Here's your copy of the defense of the prisoner. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I guess this is my other notebook. Do you have a legal pad? I do. A pen? I do. Yeah. <laughs> Lori, you're my legal advisor. I had a call. I can leave my name plate up here. Go see how long it lasts. <laughs> yeah. Is that a good idea or not? No. <laughs> Somebody just, somebody just might destroy it. <laughs>
a lunch menu in here we're going to order in. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Adventure. Yes. Um, so I, I, talk, I, I talked to Jessica. Good morning. You must be Bland. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. We, we have never, never met. met. Yeah, we, we, we've only met on the phone. Yes. <laughs> it's nice to finally meet you. So I talked to Judge Evander, mm -hmm. and the mics will all be hot. Okay. Um, and broadcasting. Okay. If we need to see a sidebar, and obviously we won't come up here because we will turn the mics off. You just have to let me know because mm -hmm. I'm coordinating with the streaming service. Mm -hmm. See that red light up at the very top in the left white? Yes, in the box up top. When that is off, we are off the air. Mm -hmm. So if you need to have a break, let me know, mm -hmm. and then wait for the light to turn off. Okay. Simple and easy. Okay. Um, Laura is our court reporter this morning. She's getting all set up. Mm -hmm. I think we've got you up here somewhere. Are you on the end? I'm right okay, here, perfect. next to the witness. Perfect, that's great. Okay. Um, everybody should have Is their Laura going to be close enough where she can hear the witness? They're all amplified. Okay. So when they're on, they should all be. Um, my time is it's your choice, wherever you want to be. Are you on? Testing one, two, three. Testing. Is that, uh, can you hear that? Or I can, I can turn it up. Is this gonna be acceptably loud, Laura, or do we need to turn it up? I don't think they're gonna be this close to the microphone. So, can we turn it up a little bit? I think you're gonna need to move up. I mean, I just think that under the best of circumstances, court reporters have trouble taking uh, witness testimony down based on accent or other things so and these are not the best of circumstances so I think you're gonna need to move do you need a table of any type or I do. Go in my bag. It's the big black bag. Mm -hmm. You'll see them all over okay. the place. <laughs> okay. Testing one, two, three. Uh, Alex? I mean, does she want to be there or does she want to be closer? Uh, I think she wanted, she has all her equipment there. I think she wanted to be there. But. Okay. Whatever's good for her is good for uh, us. Testing so. one, two, three. One, two. One, two. Okay, let me go get my five. You got pen? You got pad? Yep. Anybody need a mask? Oh. Getting uh, an extra mask for the spirit series. Oh, you need to ask the marshal if the witnesses and the lawyers can remove their mask for it. Alex Brown's uses mask. Um, they're okay if the witness removes their mask. Okay. And we can use a face shield if the Witness wants a face shield. Oh, do we have a face shield? Yeah. I brought some. Great, yes. wonderful. If anyone prefers, I have some. Um, they, they fit on your head like glasses, though, so you can wear glasses, that could be. Um, I'm going to call Judge Sosa from the first screen for the dad died last night, so he needs to leave. Okay. So, the goal is to get him out of the building if we could. Mr. Randolph, can I that? Better tell him first thing. Of course. That's uh, uh, You know, the last two weeks have really been tough. Al lost a rough guy. Al lost a rough yeah. guy. And Greg Coleman had back emergency back surgery. Father just died. So we had. Uh, Two weeks, mm -hmm. and December 19, January 20. Who good friends? Nephew and the brother. And the brother-in-law and nephew, there, you know, it was um, mom and daughter, both my husbands. Uh, the mother's uh, two weeks before her now, mother's was expected for right. his cancer in time. His nephew was cancer. He's off. Yeah, okay. You got, you got your coffee? Yeah. Bathroom run? 
<laughs> this panel Where doesn't need a bathroom. bathroom. That's what we need. Yeah.
We're in the case of uh, an inquiry concerning the Honorable Barbara Hobbs, Supreme Court case number 20-605. Uh, my name's Kerry Evander. I'll be presiding. I'll introduce the other panel members in a moment, but first let me get introduction from uh, counsel. We'll start with JQC. Okay, and for the respondent. Good morning. My name is Roosevelt Randolph, and I represent the Okay, thank you all. Uh, the other panel members here to my far right is um, Mr. Jay White. He's an appointee of the Florida Board of Governors. Uh, Good morning, seated, everyone. Uh, seated to uh, his immediate left is Abigail MacGyver, who's a gubernatorial appointee. Uh, then we have Mr. William Shafino, uh, also appointee of the Florida Board of Governors. Good morning. Um, to my immediate left, James Ruth, a county judge in Duval County. Good morning. Good morning. And then Larry Tyree, uh, appointee from the governor. And then our counsel, the hearing panel counsel, Lori um, Ross. So thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm going to go over some procedural matters, and then I'll take up any preliminary matters that the parties may have. Um, first, because the, the panel members serve as uh, both a judge and a jury, um, but they also have the opportunity to ask questions. So what I'll do is after the attorneys have concluded examination of any particular witness, the panel members will have an opportunity to ask questions. After that, I'll let the attorneys have the opportunity to, for follow-up questions, but the, they'll be limited in scope to questions that uh, were raised by the panel members. Um, Panel members also have the, the right to question you uh, during opening and closing. I don't expect many questions, if any, on opening, but you certainly may get questions as far as closing argument after you've done your closing. We try not to interrupt the closing. Um, I understand that as far as exhibits, there, <coughs> is it correct that there's no objections from either party to the other party's exhibits right now? Okay, then what we'll do, all the panel members have all the exhibits. Um, you can use the number that's in the book, whether it's JQC Exhibit 1 or, or Respondents Exhibit 3 or whatever it is. And um, if you're questioning any witness on it, we have the books available up there for them as well. So that should make it easier. I, there may be some exhibits that are duplicates. If so, that's, that's not a problem. Just refer to it as either, you know, JQC whatever number it is, or respondents, whatever number it is. Um, yes? Okay, we'll go ahead and go off the record for a minute. Uh, the, Um, if there's any objections during testimony, if you uh, direct your objections to the chair, uh, just state your grounds, uh, no speaking objections. If you wish to be heard further, just ask me, uh, or if I wish to hear further argument, I'll let you know. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I apologize.
Okay, as a um, general proposition, I'll be ruling on the objections. However, because all panel members serve as both judges and jury, there may be times or, um, where I decide that I want to get the other members' input, and then we'll take a quick recess, and the panel will decide on any objection or any motion. Uh, similarly, a panel member can indicate to me they wish to, to conference on an objection or a motion. Um, so, are there any questions on any of the matters that I just covered? Okay, with that, uh, let me hear if there's preliminary matters to be raised by the parties. Mr. Williams, anything for the JQC? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, again, we're being televised and the mics will be streaming today, so if we need to go off the record, please let me know so I can try to coordinate with the streaming service to um, regards to that. Um, so we're operating using the pandemic guidelines and procedures. Um, so today face coverings will need to be worn and the witness box will need to be sanitized. So bear with us as we deal with that as well, please. Um, we have extra face masks and shields if you need that. Um, uh, just to make sure, I believe Judge Vander said everyone received their exhibit binders. Uh, there should be two, one from each of the parties. Um, at this point, I, I would ask that we just formally move all of the exhibits that have been uh, proposed into evidence, um, if we could do that. All right, any objection? No objection. Okay, all of the JKC exhibits will be accepted in evidence without objection, and the same with, with respondents' exhibits. All right. There is, there is an additional exhibit uh, that I am intending to offer and admit um, it, through the testimony of two witnesses, I believe uh, Mr. Powell and Mr. Randolph uh, said that they may have an objection. So if we want to deal with that now, or we can do that while the witnesses are testifying, um, it relates to uh, some talking points that were prepared um, and, and used. Um, oh, with the chair. What, are the, what are the exhibits? What is the nature it's, of the it's exhibits? One, it's a two-page memorandum um, that will be offered. Uh, through the through two of the witnesses. Okay, I'll go ahead and wait till we see Perfect. what the foundation is. Yes, thank you. Um, and then, lastly, um, you know, I think trials are pretty fluid, so I will endeavor as best I can to keep things moving along from the JQC's perspective. Um, but I would appreciate um, um, you all's patience as we deal with the the pandemic and these weird things that we're dealing with. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. All right, uh, Mr. Randolph, anything for the respondent as far as preliminary matters? At this point in time, uh, Your Honor, we have no objection. Okay, thank you. All right, then we will uh, go ahead and ask the opening statement, Mr. Williams. Counsel. May it please the court, good morning. As I said, my name is Alex Williams and I'm the general counsel to the Florida Judicial Qualifications Commission. I represent the investigative panel in these proceedings. The commission today is proceeding on the amended notice of formal charges. It's in your binders as exhibit nine. Essentially, the allegations stem from events that took place some months ago, in, in fact, in mid to late 2019. And because of the pandemic, uh, this hearing's been postponed a number of times until it could be tried in person, as was properly requested by the judge. As I noted, the commission intends to call several witnesses. We've entered 29 exhibits, uh, including videos, that I believe substantiate uh, and corroborate the allegations made in the amended notice of formal charges. As to these events, I believe the evidence will show that while presiding as a circuit judge in a criminal division, Judge Hobbs presided over cases or, and hearings or status conferences in which an attorney who was simultaneously representing Judge Hobbs' son in a 2018 DUI also appeared on behalf of criminal defendants in front of Judge Hobbs. She did not recuse herself from those cases as required by the canons and emphasized by the Judicial Ethics Advisory Committee. Other, cha other charges in this case have their origins in late July of 2019. 
and in very brief sum, during the evening hours of July 29, 2019, Judge Hobbs' son was arrested for a shooting that took place in his residence. Her son shot a female visitor two times with an AK-47 and as he was allegedly attempting to shoot her dog through a closed door. Judge Hobbs' son was transported to the Tallahassee Police Department headquarters where he was placed in an interview room, handcuffed, under video and audio monitoring. During the next few hours, Judge Hobbs came to the TPD headquarters to arrange for someone to take care of her grandchild, and she acted as her son's attorney during his nearly two-hour police interrogation. The video of this interrogation, parts of which I, I intend to show, show that Judge Hobbs was present, was permitted to have not one but two private attorney conferences with her son, and by my count, interrupted, explained, clarified, or shushes her son on no less than 16 occasions during the interview. She argues legal points with the investigators. She asks several times for her son not to be booked or arrested that night, <coughs> to let him go home with her because he was going to live with her, and that the investigators could finish their investigation while he did so. The evidence will show the investigator respectfully declined, telling Judge Hobbs he can't not let someone go when he has probable cause to arrest someone for a felony offense. She even asked the investigators to issue some kind of appearance, which is not something that's permitted under the rules of criminal procedure. And the investigator tells her that a charge of that severity would require a first appearance, an arrest, a booking, and a first appearance. At the conclusion of the interview, Judge Hobbs tells her son not to say anything else and is allowed to privately confer with him again for six more minutes. Subsequently, Judge Hobbs' son was arrested and charged with aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. That was eventually upfiled by the state attorney's office to attempted second degree murder. He was booked into the Leon County Jail and on July 31st, 2019, was given an initial or first appearance hearing where attorney Gary Roberts was present on his behalf. Also present at that hearing, at council table, was Judge Hobbs' judicial assistant, Judy Ware. On July 31st, 2019, Judge Hobbs called the JQC and spoke with myself at the suggestion of Chief Judge Sostrom to discuss her conduct in acting as her son's attorney. She was advised to write a self-report to the commission and cautioned not to ask for any special treatment that any other person or member of the public would not get, including unmonitored visitation. Separately, the Chief Judge of the Circuit, Judge Sostrom, Trial Court Administrator Grant Sladen, met with Judge Hobbs on or about August 1st to highlight certain ethical responsibilities that she has and specifically advised her but they heard her JA was present in court and at council table during her son's hearing. The chief judge advised her that the JA represented the judge, is personal staff to the judge, and in fact is like family to her, and it's inappropriate for her to be at council table, and that if Hobbs, Judge Hobbs could not do that, then her JA should not either. The evidence will show that just a few days later, during a second detention bond hearing, Judge Hobbs' JA again sat at council table during that hearing. Around the same time, the evidence will show that Judge Hobbs asked the trial court administrator, Mr. Sladen, to arrange for non-recorded, unmonitored visitation with her son at the jail. Separately, Judge Sostrom initiated Judge Hobbs' transfer from the circuit criminal docket to the circuit family division. The evidence, I believe, will show that her failure to properly train and supervise her JA resulted in a series of ethical issues and even security problems. In one instance, her JA personally escorted the mother of Judge Hobbs' grandchild down to the clerk's office through secure portions of the building, the courthouse, to file an injunction against the person who was shot by Judge Hobbs' son. In another instance, while Judge Hobbs was out of town, 
Her JA loaned her personal all access security badge to Judge Hobbs' son. He used the badge to access secure portions of the courthouse, winding up in the employees only area of the clerk's office. Chief Judge Sostrom admonished Judge Hobbs and her judicial assistant about this serious breach of security. The evidence will show that he told her that this is probably a fireable offense. Judge Hobbs did not terminate her JA. Once transferred into the family division, Judge Hobbs either failed to timely review emergency motions or failed to ensure that her JA was appropriately processing the emergency pleadings. In one case, the evidence will show that a case manager told the JA that since Judge Hobbs had designated a motion as a true emergency, the JA would need to contact all parties and schedule a hearing right away. The JA replied that she didn't think she had time for that shit and would tell Judge Hobbs to take another look at it and mark it as a non-emergency. The matter was subsequently redesignated as a non-emergency. Finally, the evidence will show that immediately after the JQC sent an amended notice of investigation to Judge Hobbs inquiring about the delays in the family law cases and her JA's comments to the case manager, Judge Hobbs summoned the case manager to her office to question her about the source of the JQC's information. As a result of Judge Hobbs' behavior towards the case manager, the evidence will show that the chief judge and the trial court administration made the decision to move the case manager to another county in the circuit, requiring additional people to move their duty stations as well. And in the end, I will ask you to not only consider the egregious nature of these individual charges, but to consider the cumulative impact of them on the judiciary, court administration, and the public's perception of the judiciary. And consider it in terms of Judge Hobbs' fitness for office. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please, the panel. On behalf of uh, Judge Hobbs and her legal team here today, we would first of all like to thank you in advance for providing us this opportunity uh, to set forth some essential facts about what really happened uh, beginning on the late night of July the 29th, 2019 at Tallahassee Police Department. Most of the charges stem from that particular night. Now, at the beginning, I know it's very clear to everyone in this room that it is uh, Attorney Williams' responsibility to prove these allegations by clear and convincing evidence of the proof of the former charges that he's made here today. I think you're going to find that some of these facts we agree on and some of those facts we do not agree on. But first, let's say, and, and I'm saying that I'm going through the amended former charges as to what we expect the evidence to, uh, to reveal in this case. Now, we have 17 exhibits, which I think have been supplied to each of you prior to coming here today. But I want to say, want to say something about the first uh, particular allegation, and that relates to what happened on the night that Judge Hobbs went to TPD uh, when her son was under arrest. I want to say up front that what we agree that there was a violation of the canon as relates to Judge Hobbs going to TPD and indicating that in fact uh, she was acting as his attorney. And that when, at the same time, she of course was on the bench here in Leon County as a circuit judge. We don't oppose that. We are saying that that was in fact a violation of the canons. What we're saying, however, is that you need to look very closely at what occurred here. 
got the, I think you're going to find out, and there are a number of witnesses who will be testifying throughout, but I think you will find out after listening to exactly what occurred is that her natural instinct as a mother actually came into play at that point, and she was acting more as a mother and as a lawyer at that time as opposed to a judge. As I said, we are not contesting the fact that there was a violation of the canon here. But her actions eventually were self-reported to JQC, as Mr. Williams has indicated. Now, having said that, we viol that my client violated the canon here, I think that I want you to make sure that you take a look as we go through this evidence or in this case about the circumstances surrounding what happened here. There is a, some mitigation which I believe that you will have an opportunity to take a look at. First of all, in your booklet, exhibit number one is the affidavit of Jerome Magna. Jerome Magna is the lead detective in the investigation that night when uh, attorney or Judge Hobbs, that is, actually went to TPD. He is given a statement on the road. He was in the room the entire time. He talked to her. And if you will note from that affidavit, you're going to find that he said, I'm the lead investigator on July the 30th, 2019, during the interview of her son, Justin Haynes. He says one other officer was in the interrogation room. And as Mr. Williams has indicated, uh, this is all on videotape. But here is what I believe you want, if you review that affidavit that he says about what happened that night. He said, I knew Judge Hobbs was a sitting judge on the circuit bench of the Southern Judicial Circuit at the time of the interview. But look at what he says after that. He says that Judge Hobbs did nothing to hinder nor did her presence in the interview room hinder TPD's investigation of the incident and the questioning of her son. In fact, he says, she encouraged her son to tell the truth. Now, she, this interview went on for about two hours. And you will find that the investigator also says, that during the interview of Judge Hobbs' son, that she told her son not to, uh, she did not tell her son not to provide any information. Uh, and the only time that she said, don't give the information is when he referred to the young lady having given him an STD. Judge Hobbs did, when you review the tape, says, you're not being asked about that. Don't talk about an STD. And you will see what the officer, the detective says. Justin, also, Justin Haynes' remarks regarding the STD was not responsive to the area of inquiry that we were pursuing during the interview. So she was there. She cooperated. And as I said, it was a violation of the canon. But I believe those fights and circumstances should be in mitigation of that particular canon. Now, Let's move to some of the other areas. That is the main one that is in this particular case. The second one is a totally different story. And this is under the, uh, uh, we believe that the second, we know that the second uh, amended uh, charge that was made involves seeking preferential treatment. Now, we have entered a denial on that particular uh, allegation. We ask you to look very carefully at the facts and circumstances in this in, in that case. Basically what has happened is that once Judge Hobbs's son was taken to the Leon County Jail, uh, she wanted to see her son as a mother. Now and I think I mentioned to you, she is the one who reported this action to the JQC investigative committee. 
But she wanted to see her son. This is his, you will find this is, she has two sons. She is divorced and she's raised these sons herself. And she wanted to see her oldest son. So she asked, how could I get out to the Leon County Jail and not cause any problems as far as security is concerned? Because she was on the Leon County criminal bench sending people to jail every day. And she wanted to make sure that she knew that her son also would be protected. So there's a question that you're going to uh, you'll hear evidence about uh, is as to whether or not she tried to use her position to arrange unmonitored and unrecorded uh, telephonic or video access to her son. Something that is being alleged that the others, other parents coming out there or other friends coming to the jail would not have been able to do so a charge of preferential treatment. Judge Hobbs denies that allegation. And here's what we believe that you're going to hear. There's several witnesses that you're going to hear as it relates to that charge. You're going to hear uh, Mr. Grant Slayton, who works for Ju Justice Schuster, Judge or Schuster in this case, you're going to hear, more importantly, from the chief, a man by the name of Chief Edward Lee. He is in charge of the Leon County Jail. He's going to appear here tomorrow on behalf of the defense, and he's going to tell you exactly what was asked of him. There were discussions back and forth between uh, the jail and initially Judge Schustrom's staff about allowing her an opportunity to see her son. Eventually, Judge Schustrom said, no, 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 I don't, based on what you're telling me, we're not going to be involved in that again. It was left to the Leon County Jail, Mr. Lee, uh, for any efforts regarding that particular charge. What you're going to find, you're going to hear Mr. Uh, we're going to hear, hear Chief Lee's testimony, but I believe he's going to say at no time did she ask for any special consideration when, to see her son. And he's going to say to you uh, that what happened is that Leon County at the time had a pilot program. That is because people like to come out to the jail to see their children or their friends or whatever, but they had started a pilot program that would have allowed you access, video access, to the jail itself. They give the inmate or person who is being held out there a computer, a laptop. You're able to access, you pay for it, but they, the, the person on the outside is able to access that information. Now, that is exactly what they were working on at the Leon County Jail, and they had it already uh, op operational in some respects, but they had problems with the system. You hear Chief Lee said that I tried to get that set up for Judge Hobbs, but there were problems in getting it set up. He says at no time did she in any way ask for anything preferential as it relates to uh, making sure that she has access to her son. So I ask you to look and listen very carefully as that uh, unfolds as well. And I believe that evidence will not be in this case that she violated the canons in any respect as it relates to preferential treatment. And then we have the recusal cases. To the members of the panel, you're going to hear these witnesses. And one of these witnesses that you're going to hear is the attorney representing uh, Judge Hobbs' son, Gary Roberts, a noted local attorney, criminal defense attorney here in Tallahassee. He's going to appear before you uh, when we begin our case tomorrow. Here's what we believe uh, you will hear. Attorney Roberts knew 
her son. Her son worked at the clerk's office here in Tallahassee at one time, early on. Judge Hobbs had been assigned to Gaston County. She was over in Quincy, Florida, the neighboring county. And she was on the criminal bench over there. Well, her son hired him for a DUI. Her son was charged with a DUI and Mr. Roberts was handling that case. That was a couple years ago. Well, when this incident happened in, on the early morning hours of July the 30th, the very next morning, after Judge Hall went out there that night, the very next morning, Attorney Roberts was contacted. And Attorney Roberts came into this case and he went to the first appearance. He also tried to get bond set at a, about four or five days later, but he was in charge of that case at that point in time, not Judge Hobbs or anyone else. He would tell you, I took control of that case at that point. Now, the recusal matters, of which there are former charges, took place because Mr. Roberts, uh, as a person who does a lot of criminal work, actually came before the court. He had two cases pending in Leon County that you're gonna hear about. There's State versus Ponder, and the other one is State versus Madison Felton. And one of those cases, <clears throat> after Judge Hobbs had transferred to Leon County, was on the criminal bench, they had not completed the DUI case at that point. She came before he came in front, uh, in, into the courtroom, of which Judge Hobbs had just taken over the docket from Judge Dempsey, the criminal docket. He appears, uh, and they, what they do in that case is a case involving a stand your ground effort. They have something that Judge Hobbs is going to explain to you. It's, it's like a, a cow call with lawyers. All the lawyers show up on case management. And they go through and one of the lawyers and prosecutors are standing there and they call up the case and she said, well, what, how can I help you today? And he's judge, we need a 30 day continue. They continued the case. That's what happened here in that case. She did not take any action uh, other than ministerial acts uh, and I, at that particular point on that state be part of the case and it was continued. Later on, you find out, when she moved to the family division, Mr. Roberts was still on that file, and he went in front of another judge. He signed, he filed a stand your ground uh, uh, action and motion that was heard by the other judge. Now, there was a second case, right? But remember, the testimony is going to reveal that these two cases of which they talked about an added former charges that relate to Judge Hobbs occurred before the allegations that were made on July the 29th, 30th uh, of 2019. These two cases that I'm describing. The second one is called State versus Madison Felton. In that case, the evidence is going to show that uh, Mr. Roberts appeared that the prosecutor and Mr. Roberts simply walked up to the judge and said, Judge, this is a DPA. This is a deferred prosecution agreement. Passed the case. The prosecutor and Mr. Roberts left. Uh, she just simply said, case passed. Now, I'm that's sorry, a, she said what? Case? Hmm? The case is now, uh, she, she continued the case because they said a deferred prosecution agreement. So, so right. it's Thank continued. You. As those of you who have been in court under those circumstances understand that when you have a deferred prosecution agreement, the judge has nothing to do with it. The judge is not a party to that. That's between the state and the council. The only thing the judge does is wait to see what the prosecutors and the defense attorneys will do in that case. 
but they have no action. They take no action in that case whatsoever and can't take any action in that case. These are the two cases that we believe that you're going uh, to hear about. Now, one of the things that I think you maybe already read about, uh, if you read of the, any of the information regarding this case, is that in this county, and you're going to hear this brought up today from Judge Schuster, Leon, uh, the second judicial circuit is a circuit in which uh, the position that is taken is that uh, when you have a case uh, of this nature, that there is no standing order of recusal. In some parts of Florida, down south, large cities, they have a standing, you can, it's a standing order. If, if a person, if, if the judge looks online and sees that that person has something pending, then of course, they are obligated to uh, recuse themselves. That's not what happens in this circuit. Listen to the testimony of Judge Schuster, because that is the policy in this area, is that we are small, this is relatively small, as a, compared to what happens down in South and Central Florida, and so the judge is obligated to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to make a determination of whether or not they should recuse themselves. And in this particular case, based, we, we believe that when you hear all of the testimony from the parties involved in this case, that you determine that that is not, uh, Judge Hoff did not have to recuse herself as alleged in these former charges. Now, the next area, and there's two more areas, and I, I apologize, but I, I believe that I needed to get this information in front of you as to what you would expect. There are, there are questions about her uh, judicial assistant, and that is Judy Wehr. I think counsel alluded to it a few moments ago. Judy Wehr is a, her judicial assistant, has been with her for years since she became a judge. There, there's allegations in this case that Judy Wehr did several things. And you heard Judge Houston said, I told him, be very careful about that. Don't do that. When this incident happened, that is, after she went out to, to the, uh, uh, went to the police department, Judge Hobbs then became, she was ill. So she took some time off. She was not at work during that period of time. Unbeknownst to her, her J.A., who knows the family very well, went to the first appearance. And what you will find from, find from the evidence, Turner Roberts is going to tell you that she had her, I had her father, who in case we, we were able to get a bond, sitting there, her 92-year-old father, sitting there beside her, beside him. He would tell you that I look back and he, was, he couldn't understand what was going on and that I motioned for, I saw uh, her assistant, whom I know, sitting there in the courtroom. And that they came forward at that point in time. That he, he motioned for her to come up to the uh, podium, to, to the actual cops table. So what you're gonna see, the video that was taken on of this only has a strange shot with everybody sitting at the front uh, at the table, counsel table, before the judge came in. They got another judge from another circuit to handle this because of Judge Hawks. The video does not show, uh, the surveillance does not show what happened other than it, they were sitting at the counsel's table. It didn't, it didn't go back, that's when they, they activated the system. So that is one allegation. Then uh, they also say that she failed to supervise her JA because uh, during the work hours that she came, the, 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 her, she has a grandchild. And the grandchild, there's an affidavit in this file that is already in the exhibits that you have from a Christine Rosen. 
Christine Rosa is the baby's mother, her grandchild's mother. She came to Judge Hobbs' office after filling out an injunction. The injunction was against the, as said, the young lady who's involved in the shooting. She came there, had it already filled out, and she asked, I want to make sure, because it, remember, this has been transferred over to the third DCA judge. Make sure that this is filed appropriate. So she asked Judy, uh, Judy Wuerl to go down and make sure she got to the proper clerk's office. That's what the testimony is going to be. She went down, and at that point in time, she, you will see from a chart that's available how long it was, and she came back up to her office. That's her involvement. And of course, that is one of the charges saying that this is inappropriate conduct. And finally, the one that there is some merit is the one involving the badge. Uh, we do not deny it. That was uh, Judge Hobbs at the time was down, was at the investigative hearing of the JQC at the time. And while she was out, her son came by and asked to get into uh, the mother's car. Her JA at that point in time said, well, okay, he said, I need to get some insurance papers out of there. He came, she said, well, take my badge and go downstairs uh, to her and you can get to her car. He did so, he came back up, and that, of course, was inappropriate. That should not have been done, but as we, as we say, the testimony will indicate that Judge Hobbs knew nothing about that at the time because she was in front of that investigative hearing down in uh, South Florida. So those are the areas there on the recusing filing. Just briefly, you're going to hear about the final charge, is, which is involving her failure to do, to, to house some emergency orders. You're going to find out that there's two cases. There's Pittman versus Smith. You're going to, and there's another case. Uh, which she has. Okay, there's two more cases that she has. There's three cases. Each one of those three cases uh, were on the docket. And this is where there's a very interesting matter that's going to come before you on this case. The former charge said she did not handle her uh, cases in an appropriate manner. She was delayed in uh, actually handling emergency cases. Well, what you will hear is, and that there were some problems relating to those three cases that should have been handled on an emergency basis. What you will find is that her mother died right around this same time. Judge Hobbs uh, is the only uh, female uh, in her family. She has other brothers, but she was short. She died here with Judge Hobbs at that time, and they were away. She was away for over a week during that period of time. She did some emergency orders on these cases, but she left. While she was out, the, there, the, there were things that occurred on those three cases. What we don't know, we know that this circuit has senior judges. We have on duty judges, judges that will handle certain matters if a judge is out of time. In both instances, nobody stepped in while she was away during that period of time uh, in order to handle these cases. The other problem you're gonna, you're, gonna see, you're gonna hear about is that in Leon County, here is what we have in our circuit. And this is the exhibit number Look at, make sure that you look at exhibit number three. Exhibit number three is an administrative order. And their order uh, involves uh, training. Is this um, JQC exhibit or your exhibit? I'm sorry, that is our exhibit. Uh, number three is the deposition of sure. Yeah, State. my number three is a video deposition. Yes, 13. All right, thank you. I'm sorry. Right. It is exhibit number 13, the administrative order. 
Now, this is an administrative order that stems from the Florida Supreme Court. And it basically says that if you're going to put a judge uh, uh, on the family law uh, bench, that judge has to be trained, receive training within 60 days of the time that they're placed on the bench. Well, that didn't happen here. There was no training. Judge Hobbs was transferred over or off the criminal bench. And this is when these cases occurred during that time frame. But what you will hear is that Judge Hobbs, the only time she had been in family law was when she first became a judge. It was about three or four months after that. They, put, they moved her to, to the criminal bench in Gaston County, and she'd been on, on, on the criminal bench since then. When this incident happened, they moved her to family law. You will hear that in, in Leon County, there's a problem here relating to the clerk's uh, office in some respects. They have unwritten procedures. Judge Hawes did not receive the training as mandated by that administrative order, and the clerk's office has un, uh, they, they do not have, a, they have unwritten procedures that you, that to follow. So she didn't have the information, she could be, uh, at that time because she hadn't had the training. And this is, if you look at that order that I placed in under no, exhibit number 13, it says that it's mandatory that if you're going to go into family law, you have to have the training. Now, what you will hear is Judge Hobbs uh, suggested that she's going to get some training uh, by November. Well, these incidents of which is, are before you now have already occurred. No training took place. So we ask you very carefully to uh, take a look at that training in, in this particular case, that that is something that is very uh, uh, interesting and that should be some, uh, an area that you would take a look at. Now, in coming to my conclusion on this matter, I ask you very carefully to look at not what was said on the charges, but to look behind it because there's a lot that is going on in these cases in, in regarding the procedure. It's different various places, but they have charged her. The former charges are made as if the matters occurred in perhaps other locations other than here in the second judicial circuit. So I ask you to look very carefully. We appreciate this opportunity. I hope I apologize for the length of time. But I thought that it would, be, it would be necessary for me to give you an idea of some of the testimony uh, that you're going to hear. The witnesses that we're going to present by agreement will be tomorrow. Mr. Williams, of course, will make his presentation today. And we have our witnesses lined up to appear tomorrow. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you both. All right. Will JQC call its first witness, please? Yes, and I would note that I believe the rule has been invoked, so our witnesses are standing by at this time. All right, uh, counsel are responsible for making sure that their witnesses are advised the rule of sequestration has been invoked. At, at this time, the JKC will call Chief Judge Jonathan Sostrom, and we'll take a moment to bring him in. <coughs> <laughs> Good 
in order to limit the person-to-person -person contact, I'm going to go ahead and place a copy of the exhibit that I intend to introduce on the witness stand so he can take a look at it. I've provided a copy to counsel with their exhibit binder on Friday. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> All right, sir, if you'll raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Good morning. Uh, if you would, please introduce yourself to the members of the panel, and probably going to need you to spell your name for the court reporter. Well, my name is Jonathan. J -O -N thank you. Thank you. My name is Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, last name Sherstrom, S-J-O-S-T-R-O-M. Right. And Judge Sherstrom, uh, can you tell us what's your position with the Second Judicial Circuit? I'm a, I've been a circuit judge uh, right at 19 years. I'm the, uh, been the chief judge. It'll be six years in July. And you were just elected to another term beginning in July? Yes, sir. Okay. And how long have you been a lawyer? Uh, 19, since 1989. Are you also the chair of the Conference of Chief Judges? I'm chair of the Justice Administrative Committee, which is a committee consisting of every chief judge, uh, trial court chief judge, as well as the conference officers, circuit conference officers. Thank you. I'm going to get right into it. Judge, Judge Hobbs' son was interviewed and arrested on July 29th into July 30th, and his first appearance was on July 31st. When did you first become aware of Judge Hobbs' son's arrest? It took a little bit longer than I thought. I, I think the first call that I got, I was thinking about this, I think the first call that I got was from um, the state attorney telling me that he was asking the governor uh, to have someone appointed um, for uh, outside of the circuit to serve the prosecuting role. Um, and I would, I'm guessing that was the 31st or the 1st, uh, but I'm not certain of the specific date. It might have also been Grant Sladen. I, I, I don't exactly remember the, um, the, the very first time that I heard about it. Fair enough, and this was some almost 20 months ago. Did, who, who is Grant Sladen, just so we know? Grant Sladen is the trial court administrator. That's the chief administrative um, officer. Each of the 20 circuits has a trial court administrator chosen by the, uh, by the judges of the circuit. And how long has Mr. Sladen served in that capacity? Longer than I've been a judge. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, when did you find out that Judge Hobbs had acted as her son's attorney during the police interview? Fairly early on, um, I saw a copy of the probable cause affidavit, and I don't remember if I learned about it like that or if I learned about it um, from uh, trial court administrator Sladen telling me about it, but it was almost at the same time that I very first um, heard that the arrest had occurred. Okay. And what was your first reaction? Did you consider that to be a serious breach? Oh, I knew, I knew from my experience with uh, judicial qualifications cases and reading authorities that there was a serious, serious ethical question. At some point, did you speak with Judge Hobbs and suggest that she call the JQC? Yes, sir. I, 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 um, I think I texted her. I think it, what happened is I, and my memory of the exact communication is not uh, clear, but I asked her to come and see me, is my, is my memory, within, within a day or two of the arrest. <clears throat> And if you would, there's an exhibit binder. Uh, the black one in front of you uh, is the JQC exhibits. 
If you would turn to tab 18, please. I'm there, yes, sir. And if you would just briefly describe to us what this collection of documents is at tab 18. So at, at tab 18, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Randolph subpoenaed me for a, I think it was Mr. Randolph, subpoenaed me for a uh, deposition, which I gave. In that um, deposition, he asked me about documents, and I, I, I had printed out, Grant Sladen had maintained a file. I had some documents, um, Word, Word documents that I had opened up um, as the events developed, and I, everything that I could find, I told um, Mr. Randolph that I would produce, and I did. That's what this is. So these documents are memos to file that you had created? Some memos to file. I think there's at least one document that I made to give to Judge Hobbs or to um, her judicial assistant, Ms. Okay, and I'm looking at hand-numbered pa hand, uh, page five in the lower right corner. Yes, sir. It, this appears to be sort of a chronology. Is this something you had sort of put together as it, events were transpiring? Uh, I think I probably started doing this sometime after August the 30th. I know there's, it's not complete as I was sitting here thinking about this um, this morning. It doesn't have the date that for example, of a change in the assignment, uh, uh, Judge Hobbs swapping with Judge Marsh. Um, but as far as the dates that are listed here, where, it, for example, I'm looking at says uh, 7.30 of 2019, that'd be July 30th, order of the governor assigning that case. The order of the governor assigning refers to the state attorney. Okay, and, and so, and then the first appearance, video 7.31, and then also there's a notation, seven, July 31st, you, you, you wrote, noted the text message from me, that would be you, Judge uh, Sherstrom, to Judge Hobbs at 8.51 asking she come to my office, also text message from me to Judge Hobbs with Alex Williams' contact. Does that refresh your memory about when that meeting occurred? Yes, sir, except I think that that meeting occurred before the actual first appearance. Okay. Both on the same day, I think. Understood. At some point, did you hear that Judge Hobbs, J.A., had appeared in court and sat at the council table during the first appearance? I did not hear that. Okay. I, I learned that I think I learned that, I, I got, trying to figure out how to deal with this situation, I pulled up the first appearance video, I have the ability in my office to, to pull up any um, court proceeding that is digitally reported, which first appearance is, and I watched the first appearance uh, video and recognized Ms. Ware. I don't think anybody, I think I was the first, I think I, f I figured that out before Judge, uh, before Mr. Sladen did. And what was your reaction to seeing that? I, I was very much worried about um, the appearance of impropriety. I was very much worried about um, the judicial assistant acting um, outside of her, outside of the judge's public uh, responsibilities. I was worried about um, lending the prestige of judicial office to the, um, the accused. I was, uh, I, 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 very, very, very concerned. Okay. So after that, did you and Mr. Sladen have a meeting with Judge Hobbs? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we had several meetings, or, or at least contacts, about uh, this situation. Okay. And there was certainly one that happened after that. Understood. So there's a document on the table in front of you marked talking points. Did Mr. Sladen prepare these talking points for you? Yes. Yeah, so this is a document, the, the, the typewritten 
This is a document that I, I wasn't aware of until, I think, this weekend, but, um, but TCA trial court administrator Sladen um, typed this, and then all of the handwriting on this is mine. I recognize it. I recognize the, the pen that I used to write it with. This is a document that I prepared. And, so uh, it's a fair and accurate representation of the document that you reviewed and went over with Judge Hobbs in that meeting? I believe so, yes. Uh, Mr. Williams, I assume this document is not in evidence? It is not in evidence, and so this would be tentatively ID'd, I think, as JQC 30. It would be JQC A for identification right now. For, okay, for identification purposes, JQC A. Uh, okay. But at this point, I would ask that we admit it, um, subject to any arguments, or if Mr. Randolph or, or Mr. Powell would like to voir dire the witness. All right, any objection or any voir dire? Voir dire first. All right. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Judge Schuster, you just testified that um, you saw this document for the first time this weekend? So I saw this document for the first time since I made these marks on it this weekend. I had, I had completely forgotten that this existed. All right, sir. Uh, at the time of your deposition, you received a subpoena and you provided documents to Mr. Randolph and Mr. Williams subsequent to the deposition, correct? After the deposition, I sent over the documents under, under eight, under that cover letter. Yes, sir. Was this document included in those? I, I, it was not. I don't think it was. Is it fair to say that you did not have this document at that time? Uh, at which time? At the time you provided the documents that were requested by subpoena. It, it was, so, it, so there were two sets of documents that I had at the time of the subpoena. One was the file that Grant Sladen kept, and then the other was the, the documents that I had made on the um, computer. This document, and that's what I, that's what I pulled together, and I thought it was comprehensive. Um, I didn't remember making this document at the time, and, um, and I, don't know where, I, I don't know where this document uh, came from. It was inadvertent on my part that y'all didn't get it. All right, Mr. Chair, uh, at this point in time, we would object admitting this document um, it's clear that uh, Judge Shustrom has no prior recollection of this, even though he has indicated that these uh, notes on here are his writing. I'm sorry. I don't believe that was a testimony. I believe he said he did remember. He just didn't remember how. Right, we'll go ahead with your okay. objection. Thank you. Um, Judge Shustrom has indicated that the notes on here are, his, are in his handwriting. He has indicated there were two files, one <coughs> kept by <coughs> Mr. Grant Sladen and one that he had on his computer. And it does not appear that this was a document that was kept by Judge Shustrom. And since we were not provided with this prior to, I think Mr. William gave it to us Friday, uh, then we would object to it, it, at it coming in. Well, let me ask you this. Um, is there any uh, prejudice that the respondent has uh, suffered because of the late disclosure of this document? I would say yes, Mr. Chair, because uh, these talking points spell out something which we are not, uh, were not completely aware of during the deposition, and also the documents that he provided to us. 
And he, he did uh, talk about in his deposition that he met with Judge Hobbs and he counseled her, but the document pertaining to that counseling was not this document. Mr. Williams, uh, would you agree that the document was disclosed uh, beyond the deadline set by Mr. Coleman? No, sir, not at all. Okay, why is that? Uh, the document was provided to uh, Judge Hobbs and her counsel as part of the disclosure made by Mr. Grant Slayton during the appropriate discovery period. Okay, so did y'all- It was not listed as an exhibit by myself by the JQC until Friday when I told Mr. Randolph, okay. intended to enter it, but they certainly had it in their possession. I have no additional arguments necessary. All right, so did y'all have that document? We, uh, we did, uh, Mr. Chair. In the deposition, I'm sure Judge Schustrom will testify to that today, or Grant Sladen, that only Judge Schustrom talked to judges, not Grant Sladen. So even though this came from Grant Sladen, it was not clear that Grant Sladen was the one who had these talking points. Well, let me ask you this. Even if I was to sustain the objection, wouldn't uh, the witness be allowed to, to give testimony on his meeting and use that as a, uh, something to refresh his recollection? I think that would be acceptable, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, that would be allowed anyway. So, yes, sir. So would there be any reason not to allow the document in? What I would say to that, Mr. Chair, is to admit it into evidence would indicate that everything on here is correct, but to refresh his recollection, um, is not an admission that everything is on here is correct. All right, Mr. Williams, uh, what's your argument? Mr. Chair, um, if I can have just a moment to question the witness, I think we can bring some light to this topic. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Judge Schuster, the talking points memo that we've been referring to, is that something that Mr. Sladen prepared for you to use during your meeting with Judge Hobbs? Yes, that's, that was the purpose of this uh, document, and it's not the, well, yes, that okay. was the purpose of this document. Thank you, and the document itself has various bullet points. Some are crossed through, some are not. They're visible fully. What's the, what's the meaning of that? The, the meaning of that is that the purpose of the trial court administrator is to assist the um, chief judge in a circumstance like this, but my words are my responsibility. My supervisory authority is my responsibility. And that the trial court administrator proposes something to me, I've got to make the judgment. I mean, this is too, this is too serious for me to delegate any of this responsibility to anybody else. So what I, the, 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 what I wrote on there was based on my judgment of what I thought was appropriate for that discussion. Okay, so would it be fair to say that the strike through portions are not things you covered with Judge Hobbs in the meeting? It's possible that even though I struck through them as we were having give and take, that I said something about it, but that was my intention when I struck through them. And the topics that are fully visible are topics that you mentioned during the meeting? I think, I think yes. And the handwriting you recognize to be your own? I do. Okay. All right. Mr. I, Mr. Chair, I believe that these are relevant and reliable under the standard. Mr. Chair? Yeah, I have a question to make sure my understanding has the clarity I need. The document was produced before the discovery deadline. Yes. It just was not listed as an exhibit. Is right. that, is my, do I have clarity on that? That, that is correct. Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and overrule the objection to be admitted as JQC number 30. I need a copy of the, uh, I need a copy of that exhibit. I'll go ahead and produce these to you now so you can follow along. Okay, thank you.
Madam reporter, would you let me know if you cannot understand me? Because sometimes with these masks, I probably don't talk as loud as I should. Would you like to see? Okay, thank you. It's just one page. You may continue. Thank you. All right, Judge uh, Sostrom, if you would turn to the second page, I think it's on the back side of yours. It's I'm referring to uh, the page at the top. It begins, I'm talking to you because. Do you see that? I do. Yes, sir. Uh, if, if you could, for the court reporter, just read that second page, um, and, and I'll ask you to stop. Very well. I'm talking to you because I understand that your judicial assistant, Judy, sat at council table during first appearance. That is too close to you. She represents you and his personal staff. She is subject to many of the provisions of the Code of Judicial Conduct, just as you are. Canons 2B and 3B9 are pretty clear on this point. You probably could not sit at council table, so Judy shouldn't either. I know she's like family. She was there to support your dad, but that's just the way it is. Let his legal counsel handle this stuff. As these situations come up, and they will, you can come to me, the chief, or Frank Allman, or other judges you might trust and talk about what to do in advance. That's it, okay. Thank you, Judge. Um, I'm gonna ask you to turn now to tab 20 in the black binder. Now that's been admitted as a screenshot of Judge Hobbs's son's first, first appearance. And that occurred on July 31st, 2019. Can you identify that courtroom? Yes, sir. That, that's a, a courtroom at the uh, Leon County Adult Detention Center. Um, so in a, a county jail. Okay. Can you identify the individual seated at council table? Uh, starting in pick a direction. So uh, starting left to right, um, is Mr. Gary Roberts, a lawyer that I've known for many years. Um, in the middle is a person identified, I think, during the, um, during the um, first appearance as uh, Judge Hobbs' uh, father. I did not know him previous to that. And uh, on the uh, right in the uh, pink sweater and the white blouse is Ms. Ware, which is uh, Judge Hobbs' judicial assistant. So your counseling session with Judge Hobbs, where you're describing uh, the talking points memo, you're using the talking points memo to describe her JA seated at council table. That had to occur how soon after that uh, July 31st first appearance? Let me, let me back up just a little bit. I, I had this, I, I'm certain I had this document when we talked. I am not certain that I read this document to her like I just read it, read it to you. Okay. The purpose of this was sort of to prompt me. Okay. Um, Did you cover that point with Judge Hobbs? I, I believe I covered all of these points. I'm not sure that I covered them in exactly the language that is in here. But I, and tell me your specific qu question again. Sure. Mr. I'm sorry. How soon after the July 31st first appearance where Judge Hobbs' JA sat at council table, did you counsel her about her JA sitting at council table? I think I watched the first appearance video the next day, and then I think the counseling session happened either that day or the day after that. So on or about August 1st? First or second, I think. Okay. If you would turn to tab 22 in the JQC binder. In there. My mistake, 21. All righty. 21 is the picture again? Yes, sir. That's a different picture 
This has been admitted as a screenshot of the August 5th detention hearing. Can you identify the individual seated at council table? Yeah, I, I believe this is the same courtroom in the Leon County Jail, is that right? Yes. Okay, can you identify the individual seated at council table here? Gary Roberts, uh, Judge Hobbs' uh, father, and um, Mr. Wood. Mr. Mr. Williams, if I might introduce for a second. Um, Judge, could you explain for the benefit of the lay members in particular what a uh, what this detention hearing was for, and also, as far as the jail courtroom, um, is there video of the courtroom for others uh, to be able to view the proceedings that are, as far as the pub members of the public? So, two, uh, so uh, two things. This is a, this is a bond hearing. So, first appearance is an initial detention hearing after someone has been arrested. If they can't. If they don't get pretrial released, if they're not uh, bondable without seeing a judge on our bond schedule because of the particular offense, um, the Constitution and statutes require that person to see a judge within 24 hours of arrest for the judge to decide um, whether they can be released and what the conditions of release will be. Um, if they are uh, denied an initial bond, um, an accused has the right uh, through counsel um, if represented, to file a motion um, to set bond. And I think what this is, is the second hearing. I think this is the bond hearing. I'm just guessing based on the date. I had never, I never watched the video of this, I don't think. So would it be fair to say you would be surprised that Judge Hobbs' JA showed up and sat at council table after she was told not to? Assuming my, assuming my counseling with her is when my memory of it is, and I'm wishing now that I had dated some of the documents that I did not date, but assuming that my, that my counseling of her was before this, this would be, I mean, it's disheartening anyway, um, but it would be extraordinarily disheartening had I counseled her and then Ms. Ware went to the went to another court proceeding and sat at council table. Was anyone else present with you during this counseling session with Judge Hobbs? For any counseling session where I asked Judge Hobbs to come see me, I believe Grant Slade would always have been with me. Sometimes uh, Judge Hobbs um, came to my office to talk to me without me knowing in advance that she was coming, um, which is normal. I mean, ju judges come show up to my office. Door is always open, to, of course, to every judge. Um, but unless, if it was a meeting that I planned, I tried to have someone with me. I tried to have uh, trial court administrator Slayton with me to, every time, and it would always be trial court administrator Slayton because I, this was too serious to. I did not want another employee um, to, to be involved with a judge with something that was this serious. So, after the counseling session, was it your expectation that Judge Hobbs would? discuss the matter with her JA? Yes. And what, in, in general, what's been your experience about Judge Hobbs's attitude towards correcting or disciplining or training her judicial assistant? Judge Hobbs did not like to, to have conflict with um, where my, and, I, and I think you'll see later on, there's a document where I asked her, I specifically asked her to counsel Ms. Ware, and she asked me to do it instead. Um, but m my sense of it was that Judge Hobbs did not like to uh, certainly discipline uh, Ms. Ware and was very, very reluctant to correct Ms. Ware. Well, let's, I think I, I think I am aware of the document you're referring to. Let's, let's turn to tab 18 again, if you don't mind.
And I'm referring to hand numbered page three. It's at the bottom right. Yes, sir. Right. Take a minute and read through this um, briefly uh, to yourself. Is this, the, is this the instance you were referring to about you asking Judge Hobbs to talk to Ms. Ware and her telling you, no, you do it? Yes, sir. Um, recounting, I, I'm recounting um, using this document. And this is a document that I prepared myself. TCA Sladen did not prepare this. And I know that because of the typeface that's used. But I also recognize my own style. But um, um, I went through the, the discussion. And what I said was that Judge Hobbs listened to what I said. I told Judge Hobbs it was her responsibility to inform his where of the limits that applied to her. Judge Hobbs declined to have this conversation and asked that I do so. And immediately after speaking with me, Judge Hobbs sent does that Does this recorded account match your recollection of that event? It does. And did you speak with Ms. Ware? I did. Okay. And in general, not on the topic of the matter, but in general, what was her response? What was her attitude towards your counseling? She was, at first through body language, um, and then explicitly disrespectful and, um, and um, extraordinarily defensive. Okay. And was Mr. Sladen present for this uh, meeting as well? He was. Okay. Well, let's turn for a second to a little different topic. Um, part of your role as the chief judge is sort of the chief administrative officer over the circuit. Would that be a fair way yes. to put it? Yes, sir. There's, we have constitutional, statutory, and rule authority. The most specific is Rule 2215 of the Florida Rules of Judicial Administration. Um, really defines the Supreme Court's um, charge to us and expectation uh, to us. The general charge is for administrative supervision of all of the courts and officers within our circuit. Okay. So let's talk about the employment status of judicial assistants in the circuit. Um, can you tell us how they're paid, where that money comes from, who's considered to be their employer? So the, yes. I apologize. I didn't mean to talk. No, please continue. So the judicial, the judicial assistant um, has, this, as far as I know, a unique um, uh, role in state government. Um, the initial, for supervision purpose, the, the judicial assistant is considered to be uh, personal staff to the judge. Uh, judge hires, trains, uh, disciplines, uh, sets the uh, parameters of work, working hours, expectations, so all, all of that, but the, but, the, but the judicial assistant is paid by the state government. So the money comes from the state government, but they're the judge's sole employee or employed at the judge's discretion, I guess. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. Okay. And so let's touch on the training issue. I think you mentioned that the judge is responsible for the training of the, and supervision of the judicial assistant. Um, who's responsible for training judicial assistants about their ethical responsibilities under the canons? So things have, in my experience anyway, things have evolved somewhat when I very first started 20 years ago. I have, I, have, I have a practical answer and I have a legal answer. The legal answer is it's the judge's responsibility. I don't know of, of anything that sets out any other basis for the uh, judicial assistant to know their well, if I can interrupt you for just one second to ask, under Canon 3, is it the judge who's supposed to be responsible for the uh, administration of their, uh, and their employees? So I can't quote you the specific language of the Canon, uh, but I've read the cases. And I mean, my, I, read, I read the cases as they came out. And uh, my uh, uh, understanding is that the judge is absolutely responsible for the training and development of the judicial assistant and setting the work parameters. Do the circuits, or is your circuit, occasionally have supplemental training to aid and assist the judge in training their JAs? 
in terms of the ethics? So I know that some of our um, judicial assistants have had some um, training through our uh, surrogate, very limited. There's a lot of informal training that goes on among the JAs and the, and the, the transfer of institutional knowledge, memory, skill sets uh, among the JAs as they're newer, as they move into um, divisions. Um, formal training we have made available, um, I want to say scholarships. Uh, there's, a, there's a statewide um, Judicial Assistance Association that does some training, although I don't know that there's a lot of judge supervision of that organization, um, but that does some training. And some of our judicial assistants have been active, some have not. I think a lot of that depends on what the judge how the judge feels about it and how the JA feels about it. Um, uh, we have one specific training that we're, that we're working on now, but, um, but, um, but we do not do a lot of formal training of judicial assistants in the Second Circuit. And Mr. But, Williams, if yes, I could sir. interrupt again. Uh, judge, I know you, you mentioned that the judge will normally have the uh, hiring and firing authority over their JA, correct? That's my, that was, do you understand it? There, I, I, I suspect, among, well, I know, I, among the chief judges, there are, there's a difference of opinion on this. Okay. Um, I thought that, I thought that only the judge had the authority to terminate. All right. Do you, and certainly to hire. Do you, do you have an understanding that you had the authority to terminate or, or would you be limited to directing the judge to terminate, or what's your understanding on that? So, I asked for some technical, because of things that happened later, for some uh, uh, technical information about that, and that's how I came to the conclusion that there was a difference of opinion about it. I think the chief judge, and where I came down on it was that I was not confident that I could directly terminate the employee. Um, there were some administrative, there was some administrative authority that, that I could have exercised that would have had very close to the same uh, result. I am responsible to decide who gets ex uh, issued a security badge. I am responsible to decide who has access to the confidential um, non-public uh, parts of our uh, computer uh, data system. Um, and, and in retrospect, I think I had the authority to say, well, I think th th this person should be um, terminated. I don't have the authority to terminate her, but she's not going to have a security badge. She's not gonna be allowed in the non-public parts of the courthouse. She's not gonna be allowed to have access to the uh, non-public -par parts of the, of the um, the court files. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'm actually going to fast forward a bit so that we can touch on some points that uh, the chair made. So um, fast forward a bit in your mind, if you will, um, all the way back to uh, later in 2019. Um, how did you come to find out that Judge Hobbs' son had used her JA security badge? So. Something had happened. We had we had things happen two days in a row, and and um, the second thing was that I believe TCA Slayton came and said that some clerk's office employees. Um, you have to understand the layout of the building. So Judge Judge Hobbs's office is on the um, third floor, where all of the circuit judge's office is, but it's in a kind of a remote corner of the uh, building, served by. Um, a secured elevator. It's a non-public elevator. To get in that elevator, you've got to have a security badge. Um, that elevator goes from the third floor to the parking garage, and in between is the first floor, um, is the first floor clerk's office. One of the uh, somebody came to uh, trial court administrator Sladen and said that the doors open, uh, opened up, the clerk, some clerk employee opened the doors uh, to get on the elevator, the doors opened up, and Mr. Haynes was there, and the, the 
people in the clerk's office know Mr. Haynes because he is a former employee of the clerk's office. Um, how quickly the, it went from those events to Colonel Sladen to me, or Colonel Sladen, TCA Sladen, he's a retired colonel in the Army. <laughs> how soon it went from TCA Sladen, from the clerk's employee to TCA Sladen to me, I was under the impression that it was a few days, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Right. Well, just in general, what's the concern here about someone use, allowing someone else to use their security badge? The purpose security of the security badge is security. The, the, the reason you're issued a security badge is because you've been through the background check. You, you're, you're, you've been entrusted with the responsibility of that um, security. Um, we are, we're drilled on security. There's a reason for security. It isn't perfect, but that, that, that security badge lets you in any judge's um, chambers unless their individual doors are locked. Most judges don't lock their doors um, in, our, in our circuit. Um, it, it, uh, if, if someone walks away from their computer and their computer's on, it allows you access to the uh, computer. And purpose of, the, purpose, the purpose of security badge is security. Okay. I don't know how else to say it, Mr. Williams. If you have a security badge as a judge or a judicial assistant in the circuit, is that an all access badge to the courthouse? Are you, well, let me ask it this way. Are you, would you be able to bypass the secured entrances where you have to go through the weapon screenings and, and other security procedures? Yes, sir, you, uh, yes. You, you, so the way the courthouse is set up, we've got two public entrances with uh, magnetometers staffed by um, sheriff's deputies whenever we're opened. We also have two staff um, parking garages, two. Two staff parking garages, and if you, can get into, if you can get into the parking garage, then you can get into either one of the public or non-public um, elevators and I mean, you can get into the public parts of the building, of course, but you can also get into the secure parts of the building. So I want to touch on something you said. I believe you said that, um, that Judge Hobbs' son was at one point an employee at the clerk's office, but was not at this time? I don't was know when he was actually formally um, terminated. I, I know that he was not very soon after this. My, my understanding is that he was no longer allowed to be in the, as soon after the arrest, he was no longer permitted to be in the clerk's office. Um, when exactly that happened and when he was formally terminated, I'm not certain. Okay. And, and so at the time that he used this badge, he would not have had uh, privileges in the clerk's office, non-public areas. He did not, no, he did not have a, I had confirmed, well, I say that. Uh, Court Administrator Sladen told me that he had cons confirmed with the clerk's office that at that time uh, Mr. Haynes no longer had a security badge from the clerk's office. Okay. Um, and this occurred at the time that Mr. Haynes was out on bail from the shooting. Is that your understanding? Yes, sir. Okay. So you find out about this. Did you then meet with Judge Hobbs again to discuss this incident? I, I did. Okay. And. What, what, in sum, what did you tell Judge Hobbs? Well, I, I, had, I had prepared a document for, um, for that. Okay. I believe I gave it um, to her, but I, I told her this, this happened, it couldn't happen, and I thought it was grounds for, I, I, I can't remember when I eventually found out that it was Ms. Ware who had given the security badge to, to Mr. Haynes, and I, and, and I told Judge Hobbs that I thought that breach of security was grounds for termination of Ms. Ware. Well, let me be clear. You told Judge Hobbs you thought that that was a fireable offense. I did. Okay. And what was her response to that? What did she say, if you recall? I don't I think she said, really. I, I don't, she, she said, said really. She said, really. It's the tone of voice. You get to you know people for so long. You, I know her tone of voice, and I know her that she, it was what, she, she was not expressing doubt in what I was telling her. Okay. It was 
unhappy, unhappy news for her. Did she subsequently fire Ms. Ware? She did not. Okay. Can you open the white uh, exhibit binder now? This would be the Respondents Exhibit 12. Before you do that, uh, what was the approximate date of the security badge incident? Hope, I think I want to say October fourth, something like that. I, I I have it written down in my documents somewhere. Okay, so at least a couple of months after the arrest. Y yes, sir. He he had been out on bond. Okay. All right. Thank you, Judge Sostrom. Um, can we put a bookmark in uh, Respondents Exhibit Twelve? If you would turn to Tab Eighteen and, and uh, the JQC's Exhibit Binder again. Yes, sir. I'm looking at hand numbered page eight. I'm sorry, Mr. Williams, you've lost me. Which, which exhibit book are yes, we in? Um, I've done my best to do that. Uh, the, exhibit, uh, the JQC exhibit binder, the black one, yep. tab 18, hand numbered, page 8. Perfect, thank you. And I, Judge Sostrom would direct your attention to the memo to file. Uh, it says, from Sostrom, read Judge Hobbs at the bottom. Uh, it's dated October 4th, 2019. Does that? Yes, sir. That helped. That that is the that is the document that I was thinking of that made me think it was October in October, and it was October the fourth. Okay. Can you read that first paragraph there? Um, Grant Sladen informed me today that he was approached by employees of the clerk's office who stated that Justin Haynes used the secure non-public elevator yesterday. When the door opened, they saw Justin Haynes in the elevator. Mr. Sladen reviewed security camera images and confirmed that Justin Haynes was inside the elevator unaccompanied, suggesting that he has access to secured areas of the courthouse. It seems unlikely that Mr. Haynes could have such access unless he has possession of a courthouse security card. Okay. And so you counseled Judge Hobbs. Did you also counsel Ms. Ware, the judicial assistant? My or did you ask Judge Hobbs to do that? I I think I asked Judge Hobbs, is that the document that you showed me earlier where I asked her to do it and she asked me to do it? Or I don't think I counseled her that day. I think she came to talk to me unexpectedly. I was not expecting to see her and okay. she came to my office. So the uh, Respondents Exhibit 12 in the white binder now. Yes, sir. It says counseling points for JA slash judge. And this has been entered as Respondents Exhibit 12. Um, code of Conduct and Public Employee Responsibilities. Do you see that at the top, sir? Yes. Okay. And, and what is this document, uh, A through D, it looks like? This is a document that I prepared sometime soon after October 4. It probably was not on October 4 because after I found out about it, well, after I talked to... Mr. Sladen, I then did a whole series of things hoping against hope that it wasn't true. Um, and so this document is after I was convinced that, um, that, that there was something to it. Well, let me ask this, and maybe this will help clarify. Did you ask Mr. Sladen to investigate the matter or to look into how he was able to come to the secure? Uh, well, yeah, so we, we have some ability, it's, it's not as, as easy as you might think, but um, we have some ability to go back and look at security cameras, that is fairly easy if you know the date. Um, and then to go back and look at the data from the card access points. Um, and I think I asked him to do that, and I think he, have asked uh, our trial court marshal to assist him. You, I think Mr. Wills is usually the one who looks at. We almost never look at the security card. My whole six years of doing it, I don't. I can't really remember another time that we've done it. Other than this, because you knew the exact kind of the real specific time. So you would have been able to determine whose security card was used 
to access that, that, that he was in possession of. Is that correct? Not me personally, but the, but the people who know how to do it can do it. Sure. And so I guess what I'm trying to ask is this memo, the counseling points for Judge J.A. Uh, relating to this incident must have been you must have been developed after you realized that it was Ms. Ware's card who'd been used. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. And then I see I see some writing in the corner. Is that something that you generated or do you recognize that or know where it came from? So that says ten twenty one of two thousand nineteen. That is not my handwriting. I is that JRW? It is. That is what that looks like. So I, I'm, I think those, that's Ms. Ware's handwriting. Okay. And, um, and I can't remember whether I gave her this or whether Judge Hobbs gave it to her. Okay. But you did speak with Ms. Ware about this incident? I, I, I am not absolutely certain. I, rem I know that she came and spoke to me. And didn't I didn't really say anything to her when she, on that on that when she came to my office. Okay, understood. Um, let's go back for a second to Judge Hobbs' son's arrest. July thirty first is the first appearance. How did you first hear about her request regarding visitation? So. When, that, that very first time uh, when you know, I'd read the probable cause affidavit, I'd spoken with uh, trial court administrator Sladen, I had some idea of what, it, uh, what, what the accusation was, I had some idea of um, what judges, Judge Hobbs' reported discussion conduct was on the night of the arrest and uh, and so my, my purpose I had two purposes in counseling her one was I, I mean honestly my first purpose was there cannot be another mistake you're in this terrible agonizing position I can't imagine I cannot imagine the seriousness And the terrible position that you're in as a parent does not matter for purposes of our integrity, for purposes of our ethical responsibility. And so I was trying hard to get past the overwhelming emotions that I knew she must so that I could communicate with her There can't be another mistake. Um, she, she, her purpose was, she, she did, I could not reach her. I don't have a confrontational style at all, and maybe it was, if I did. She did not understand the seriousness of her ethical circumstances at that point. So she was more talking about facts of the case and the son's legal situation and it wasn't as bad as it sounded and uh, all and some practical things and then one of the practical things that she talked about was wanting to um, have, be able to communicate with her son have access to her son and and at first I thought well you know we can we can help with that you don't, you don't really want um, a judge in the public visiting areas of the detention center standing next to the uh, person whose loved one is uh, also detained and might have resentments or, or, or any or, or other potential ex parte communications. And so, and, so she, and so she asked me about that. She asked me, is there any way we can set up a way to um, communicate, for her to communicate with her son while he was in custody? 
And when, did, when, when is this conversation occurring? Is this at the meeting, the, so the very first one around August 1st? The very first. Uh, With the talking uh, points? Yes, sir. Okay. And so she asks you, is there anything we can do about visitation or, or communication? I don't even, it might not even have been that. She just might have said something about communication and I said, well, maybe we can, maybe we can work with uh, the sheriff's department to put something in place that would be, that would be more secure than the public visit, uh, visitation area. And so you asked Mr. Sladen to look into that for Judge Hobbs? Yes. Okay. And what did he later communicate to you? He had found out and what had happened? He said, he said that, um, so Administrator Slayton uh, does, does not like to say no to judges. Even if he has to say no to judges, he will almost always say, let me get back to you. Um, and so th there were, I don't know, some logistical technology issues with trying to set up this um, visitation. And while he was talking to me about it, because, because I, know, I know the public defender's office has a video booth, Polycom, um, there's telephone calls that are available. And he said something offhand that he, that, that Judge Hobbs had said she didn't want to go through those because those were recorded by the, we, we all know if you, if you try criminal cases long enough, every um, inmate call is at least subject to, and I think every single inmate call is actually recorded and the inmates, the inmates, Detainees and inmates will sometimes do things to try and get around that all, for all kinds of reasons. So we're all very aware of, if you've done any criminal work at all, you're all very aware that there's these recordings. And, um, and, and that would mean something to me that Judge Hobbs might not want to be recorded on a call. Uh, but it did, it did not mean anything, I don't think, to, to Mr. Slade. And as soon as he said it to me, I said, we're not doing that. So he informed you of Judge Hobbs' request of him to arrange something that's not monitored or try to? Yes. Okay, and you said? Absolutely not. Okay. I said, I said we're not, we are no longer going to be involved in Judge Hobbs' um, communications with her son. If you would turn to JQC, the black binder, the exhibit binder, uh, again, tab 18, and we're looking at hand numbered page number one, the bottom right. Yes, sir. And it says, draft at the top, it says, Dear Judge Hobbs, this email memorializes our telephone call this morning. Is this? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Um... Oh, yes, sir. I was on the wrong page. Oh, so uh, hang on here, dear Judge Hobbs. I'm there. Yes, sir. Um, it's it, hand numbered page one at the bottom. Yes, sir. I see it. Okay. Um, is, this, is this a document that you provided to Judge Hobbs, or is this something you just created after you spoke with Judge Hobbs? So I wrote this. Um, I, I wrote this thinking I would send it to her, but then I didn't send it to her. Okay. So at the bottom. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, about the middle of the page, uh, in the larger font, it, there's a sentence that says, I directed. Can you read that out loud? Um, I directed court staff to re refrain from working on your Leon County Detention Center visitation issues. Okay, so after Mr. Sladen informed you of Judge Hobbs' request regarding unmonitored visitation, did you call Judge Hobbs and you had a telephone conversation with her? I believe that I did. Okay. Um, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir. Well, I'm just going to ask. So the sentence you just read out, is that something you told her? Maybe not those exact words, but... Yes, I told her. Uh, my memory is that I called her and said, we are not going to, we are not going to um, provide any additional assistance on your communication through the detention center. Did she have any response to that? My memory is, my memory is that she basically ended the call 
and said, well, I don't want to go through where they record me, is my, is my memory of what she said. Okay. Um, now that we've gone out of order a little bit, so I appreciate your flexibility and your patience with us. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here again. Uh, at some point, there was a decision, I guess, you made as the chief judge to move Judge Hobbs out of the criminal division that she was in, the circuit criminal bench, to a family division. How was that decision arrived at? So, and, and when was it made? I apologize. All right, so I did. I was thinking about that, and I did go back and look at the administrative order that I issued doing it, and it said August the 2nd. Um, so th there's a whole series of technical things that has to happen. Um, the, the, the state attorney's office uh, asks for the um, third circuit I have to make an evaluation and determine whether I think there's any judge in the second circuit that can do it. If the uh, judge in the second circuit, if I don't think it's appropriate for a judge in the second circuit to handle Mr. Haynes's criminal case, then, um, then I've got to uh, work the uh, process, the administrative process uh, through the Florida Supreme Court to get another, to, to, ask the chief justice to assign a judge from another um, circuit. So as I was working on all of that, I was trying to decide, there's no playbook on how to do any of this. Um, what was an appropriate, what, what was appropriate for Judge um, Hobbs to do and what was not appropriate for Judge Hobbs to do? And as I, read and as I um, spoke with a uh, trial court administrator, uh, maybe spoke with an, another uh, judge, I came to the conclusion that, that I could not have um, Judge Hobbs assigned to cases where law enforcement, and not just the law enforcement directly involved in her son's case, but law enforcement in general, um, those cases coming uh, to her, either because the appearance of impropriety is just so strong. Is law enforcement going to give her son a break because she's deciding on, her, on, their, on their cases? Is she gonna give law enforcement a break, hoping to get a break for her son? I just think that, I just thought it was untenable for her to be assigned to felony um, cases. And I came to that conclusion in short order. Okay, so in making that decision and moving Judge Hobbs, does that create additional administrative work for the circuit, for you and trial court administrator? Yes, well, and I mean, I'm, I'm stretching my memory now, but I'm with no, you know, usually when we change assignments, you know, so we, we change assignments in July, I try to issue um, an assignment memorandum by uh, March and a final administrative order, typically by the end of April if I can, so that the judges can anticipate what their next assignment is gonna be, start to prepare, and, um, and um, start to learn the, the difference between their present and their, and their next assignment. Well, I'm now asking a judge, and Judge Marsh at that time was a fairly new judge and had not been in the family law division for very long. And so, you know, with no notice, essentially less than 24 hours notice, he learned that he was going from family law to felony. So that's the judge who swapped with Judge Hobbs. Yes, sir. And the Judge Marsh's judicial assistant also, would, of course, switched. Yes. So th there was turnover besides just Judge Marsh and Judge Hobbs as well. Is that fair to say? Meaning the judicial assistants had the to? judicial assistants. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, now, now his judicial assistant is extraordinarily experienced, but yes, okay. she had been in felony before. Mr. Williams, uh, yes, let me know when you're at a good stopping point. I think we. I think we're there. Okay, because I know the court reporter probably needs a break, so we'll take a um, 
15 minute recess and we'll go off the record.
Uh, Mr. Williams, you may continue your examination of the witness. Thank you. So, Judge Sherstrom, uh, before we broke, we were discussing Judge Hobbs' transfer to the family division. Um, and you've been a judge for, what did you say, almost 19 years? Yes, sir. During that time, did you have some experience with the family division or serving in the family division? Yes, sir. Probably, probably six years doing uh, divorces and paternity cases and probably another six years doing uh, juvenile delinquency, juvenile dependency, the other family law case types. Okay, so in general, what what is an emergency motion in a family law case, and, and why is that different than any other type of motion that might be filed? Sure, so um, I believe there's a rule of judicial administration that may be in the family law rules, but, in, but I know in practice, um, anything, if a litigant writes the word emergency on a document, the clerk's office has been instructed, it's been this way the entire time I've, I've been a judge, to bring that document in me, to the immediate attention of the judge. There's other kinds of documents that are also required to be brought immediately to the judge, Most, motions to recuse or disqualify the judge, for example. Um, but but a, um, an emergency motion is to be brought immediately to the, uh, to the judge, and um, the judge has to make a judgment about whether it's an emergency or not, whether to afford an emergency treatment, whether to take some other action like um, sending it to the, uh, in a, depending on the case, um, sending it to the um, Department of Children and Families, is it a report of abuse or neglect? A, a judge, but a judge has to make a decision as quickly as practicable. Sometimes you're in a trial or doing something else. But as quickly as practicable, to decide whether it's an emergency or not. There's emergencies. The word emergency is the bane of these family judges' uh, existence in a lot of ways, because it is a hand grenade in the haystack. Um, there's a lot of things that a litigant writes emergency on because they are frustrated and they want relief soon, but it's not really an emergency. On the other hand, um, I mean, I've had a call on a Sunday night. Um, this, this mother's a Christian scientist. Her son is going to die without an operation. Um, you, need to, you need to decide whether he's going to get this operation or not, and you need to decide within you know, a matter of hours. So e emergencies are, the word emergency is very much overused, and, it, and you can't treat it as routine. So who's in charge uh, once an emergency motion is filed by a litigant? Who's in charge of deciding whether it is in fact an emergency, a true emergency, or one of these other not as uh, emergent issues? Who makes that call? Yes, who's in charge of that? Oh, that is the judge's uh, absolute responsibility to decide whether it's an emergency or not. And what's the timeline for making that decision and getting that tr decision transmitted to the clerk? Well, I mean, to, to some extent you rely on, you know, if, if a judge is in trial or, or on the bench, you rely on your judicial assistant to use some judgment about, um, about you know, dragging you off the bench or um, sending you a text message or whatever, or whatever it is. Um, and I don't know that there's a specific um, rule or statute providing for a timeline. For me, certainly by the end of the day, I mean, my rule for myself is that everything routine gets signed every day and everything that's an emergency gets done before anything routine gets done. So we're looking at a timeline of a day, but not weeks, certainly? It shouldn't be a day. I mean, it should, it should be before, certainly, if you get something that's, that says emergency on it before close of business, you should decide whether or not it's an emergency by close of business. That's, that's my rule for myself. Okay. Once the judge decides that something is a true emergency, 
uh, in general, what's the process that's followed? Who's, who's in charge of setting, checking the judge's calendar and setting the hearing and contacting the parties? So the way it works, the way it works in my office, if I get something that's an emergency, um, I used to have a stamp that said emergency or non-emergency or expedited treatment. Now I just write a note, a physical note on the document. Um, and, and, and if it's a true emergency, and we've got to clear the decks, I go out and, and you know, with, within 24 hours, or that day, sometimes get something in the morning, we're gonna have a hearing today, um, walk out to the, my assistant and say, this is what we gotta do. Otherwise, I'll write, typically, um, uh, this is an emergency or this requires expedited uh, treatment hearing within, uh, you know, probably most typically five, five to 30 days. Um, and you hand that to the judicial assistant and then the judicial assistant works with clerk's office and case managers to get things set. But ultimately setting it is the job of the judicial assistant? It is the job of the judicial, judicial assistant to execute the judge's direction. And it's, and it's the judicial, because you don't want to have ex parte communication. You don't want the judge out there calling litigants to set a, to set a, um, a, a hearing because of the ex parte rule. So it's the judicial assistant's job to contact lawyers and litigants, get the matter set for hearing. Coordinate schedules with Coordinate the parties. Coordinate schedules, sure. If it has to be digitally recorded, if it's domestic violence or dependency issue, make certain that you got court reporting resources, whatever resources need to get, to get the matter set. Okay. Uh, at some point in the fall of 2019, did you become aware of concerns regarding Judge Hobbs' uh, failure to timely rule on emergency motions? Yes, I, I, I want to say it was maybe the, the day before or the day after the issue with the domestic violence injunction or the, or the um, security badge. I, it was sometime in October, I think. Okay. And were you also made aware that Judge Hobbs had summoned a case manager to her chambers uh, to question her about um, notice of investigation that she'd received. I was Tell us about that. I was I was told of that um, after apparently after it had happened. I think uh, uh, Mr. Sladen came to me and said, "My memory of it is vague, but that that an employee felt." Um, very insecure about some communications that she'd had with Judge um, Hobbs about uh, communications with the uh, Judicial Qualifications Commission. Okay, and so what action did you take uh, or did you direct Mr. Sladen to take based on that information? So I moved the, I moved the employee to uh, no longer work, be working with Judge Hobbs. I believe that's the only thing I did. I, I, well, I mean, that's not true. I mean, I called the employee up and reassured her, look, your responsibility, just like my responsibility, your responsibility is to is to uh, cooperate, to to uh, assist, and we have to be absolutely transparent. We have no, we have our integrity is at stake. We have no choice. Um, as long as you do that, you've done nothing wrong, and I'll do everything in my power to make certain that there is no adverse employment um, from, from fulfilling your responsibility as a government employee, responsibility to the court system. So I tried to make, I tried to make certain that, that the employee was reassured that as long as she told the truth, as long as she had in integrity, there would be no adverse consequences for her. Right. Um, for clarification, Judge, was this employee a, a case manager for family law cases? Yes, sir. All right, so this would be someone separate from a JA, and they're in charge of uh, getting out orders and schedules and things like that to litigants in family court? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, and does this particular individual serve more than one judge? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have, we have, we have at least... 
I think we have at least five judges doing family law cases throughout the six counties that we, that we work, um, plus uh, county judges doing um, simplified and other kinds of it. So and I think we have three family law case managers that serve the whole circuit. All right, so I'm, I'm not certain of the exact number of family law case. Managers. All right, so this family law case manager would have been placed where she would no longer be under or, or handling any of Judge Hobbs' cases. That is correct. All right, thank you. If that wasn't she transferred out of the county? If you know, not physically. Um, she, she, I mean, well, maybe she was. I, I don't know how much she does her work by technology and how much she is physically in the office, but she was no longer, she was transferred to work, I believe, in another, for another judge in another county. Okay. Mr. Thank Chair, you. can I ask a quick question on yes. this topic? Um, so you actually met in person with this case manager? I spoke with her by telephone. Okay. Did she relay to you the conversation with Judge Hobbs and by that, I mean, was there anything threatening or threatened? by Judge Hobbs, or was it just a question about did you provide the information to the JQC? I don't remember that we went into a lot of um, detail because I believe what happened was that that kind of communication was done by trial court administrator Sladen, and by the time I knew about it, by the time I spoke with her, I think I had my assumptions about what had happened. I don't think I said, I don't, I don't think I was doing any investigation. I think I was, I, I was doing my role as, as the ultimate administrative um, supervisor and I was just trying to reassure her that there were, I did not think there would, I would do what I could to make certain there was no adverse uh, employment action. Okay, taken. so if I understand you, to your knowledge, there was no threats by Judge Hobbs to her? From, based on your conversation with this The sense employee. that I had from her was that she felt threatened, but I don't know any. Well, here's why I'm asking this. I mean, we got we got to, the JQC has to prove each point by clear and convincing evidence. And if you're just assuming or not, I need to know that. Sure. And if you're just making an assumption that she felt th or she felt threatened or the judge Hobbs threatened her that's one thing if you say hey this employee told me the judge Hobbs threatened her a b and c i'd like to know that also i don't remember her and and, and i think i'm saying exactly the same thing that you're saying <laughs> i did not i did not ask her what did judge Hobbs say to you okay did J judge Hobbs make a threat Anytime an employee is with that person who wears a robe and walks in the room and people stand up and they call you your honor, lots of employees are nervous. Um, under this particular circumstance, with I think at this time there was JQC, at least an investigation going on, I think the employee would have had a hair trigger. Um, but I don't know what was specifically said. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it, your honor. If you recall, how did she seem on the phone? Was she nervous or scared? She was terrified. Okay. Um, give me just a moment. I think I've reached the conclusion. Judge uh, Sherstrom, do you recall uh, Judge Hobbs taking some time off um, after her son's arrest? Uh, vaguely. I don't have a lot of recollection of it. I remember asking her, telling her, I remember telling her I thought she should take some time off. And you recommended that she should take some time off. Was that during that talking points meeting with you and Mr. Sladen? It was several times. Several times. Are you aware of any unwritten rules regarding how family law cases should be handled in the clerk's office? The clerk's office having unwritten rules of procedure? I don't, I'm not certain I know what you're talking about. I, I mean, 
I mean, if, if you're doing something that's a repetitive thing and you do, people develop their ways of doing things. But I don't know any specific unwritten rules. Okay. I don't have any other questions. All right. Thank you. Any cross-examination? Uh, yes, Judge Schuster, you've given testimony here today regarding what your recollection has been regarding your conversations and what has occurred in this case. Now, you, do you recall I questioned you for almost two hours? I did. Uh, back uh, several months ago. Is that correct? I think it was December 1st of 2020. Yes. And during that entire two hour time, as far as uh, uh, some questions relating to Judge Hobbs, I asked you questions that are not, sir, about when she came to see you. Do you recall those questions? I don't recall the questions. The, the initial time that she came to see you. Let me know when you're ready for me to answer. Yes, I'm ready. I remember you generally asking, I generally remember you asking me about the initial time, but I don't remember the specific question. Well, sir, as you sit, we're sitting here today, when is the first time, if you recall, when she talked to you? After the arrest of her son on the night of July the 29th, early morning hours of the 30th. Are you asking me for a date? Yes. I don't, I'm not certain of the date. Well. Let's, let me ask you this way. Did you not, the first time that you talked to her, give her the name of Mr. Attorney Alex Williams to call to make sure she, that she reported this incident to the JQC? So it's, it's kind of two questions. I gave her Mr. Williams' contact information. What I told her was, this is the most serious ethical situation that I've ever had involving one of the judges, and you need to call Mr. Williams right now. All right. And do you remember that date that you told her that? No. I'm not, it was within a day or two of the, it was, it was within a day or two of the arrest. My best memory, I, my impression is that she was exhausted from being up half the night, so I'm, it was within a day or two of, of the arrest. Did she come to you or did you call and ask her to come see you? I believe I sent her a text message asking her to come to see me. Right. Now, you recall actually, uh, but the first time you did give the information to her as to how to call Mr. Williams. Is that correct? I misunderstood you, I'm sorry. And the first time you talked to us, we were discussing now, you did give her the information, the contact information of Mr. Williams to report this incident. Is that I correct? Be, I believe after, after we were done talking, I, I called Mr. Williams to get his, actually that may not be accurate. Usually before I send anybody, really anybody's contact, I will call them and ask permission. I think in this case, I thought it was so urgent that I just went ahead and sent the, the contact information to her immediately after we were done talking. All right. Sir, do you, would you take a look at exhibit number, exhibit number one and of you, the JQC documents, yes. exhibits? Yes. You have that in front of you? I do. Now, on exhibit number one, does it not say this is a when Judge Hobbs self reported this incident uh, regarding her son? Uh, and that was a date of August the 1st, 2019. I have never you seen do? this document before. May I read it? 
Yes, I'm sorry, I thought you, you would uh, read this. So, I mean, the document is dated August the 1st. I, I, have, no, I have no knowledge of this before. Now, does it also say in the same document, pursuant to our discussion of yesterday, July the 31st, 2019? Now, if she got the information, the contact information from you, that would mean that she would have had it, she got it somewhere around the next day after this incident happened. July the 31st, 2019. Her son is arrested, 29th, early morning hours of the 30th. She would have contacted you because she didn't have Mr. Williams' information before that time, is that correct? I have no memory of her telling me that she had communicated with Mr. Williams the first time I talked to her. And you have no reason to believe that the information that's contained on this document is inaccurate, do you? I have never seen this document before. Right. I know nothing about this document. All right. But the document does contain that she received information the next day after it happened on July the 31st, 2019, in order to call Mr. Williams and self-report. The document says what it says. Mr. Randolph, I, I, I have no knowledge of this document. It says what it says. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you anything about this document other than reading it. So. Yeah. All right. Well, Judge. When you met with Judge Hobbs, I think you mentioned something about there were some, you talked to, to her at some point in time about communications with her son uh, by telephone or some type of assistance program so that she could talk to her son at the jail. Do you recall those discussions? I remember that we had a discussion about her communicating with her son at the jail. All right. Now, sir, did you tell me uh, in, at the deposition that uh, you had Mr. Slater actually handling these, that, uh, com the communications issue with the Leon County Jail? I did. All right. Now, did, did you say this statement? That I was concerned about a statement Judge Halls made to TCA Slater suggesting that she wanted assistance with communication with her son other than by telephone because of her concerns of LCSO listening on phone calls. You remember me asking you about this? That's on page 25 of the deposition, line 24, 25. I do not have a copy of the transcript in front of me, but I, I, I don't doubt that, I don't doubt your accuracy of your reading the deposition. All right. May I approach? Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you so much, Mr. Randolph. Want a moment to take a look at page 25? Sure. Pitiful, I know. So I'm looking at page 25, Mr. Randolph? Yes. We have a copy of this transcript. I believe, I think you have. Yeah, I, I, I think I see it. The they do not. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, if, if you're impeaching him or anything like that, you can just yeah, call, call attention to the page number, you know, for the benefit of opposing counsel, go ahead and ask your All right. question. Okay. I've, I've, I've read page 25, Mr. Randolph. All right. Now, does it not indicate uh, that uh, you got your information there? This is on line 25, 
line 24 through 25 down, does it absolutely say at the end that you were not exactly sure uh, what uh, Mr. Slater was saying uh, to Judge Hobbs uh, regarding this issue? You said, I'm absolutely, I'm not absolutely sure what it was that was saying. You were relaying to, to us what, what, what he, he said. I don't think that's what I'm saying there. What, what, would you read it out uh, loud, yeah. sir? Beginning page 25, I, I line 24. This, this makes it sound that I learned that information from Mr. Sladen, maybe not from her directly, but I would have sworn she said something <laughs> similar to me. Are you sure of that now after having read that? I'm not absolutely sure. I'm not absolutely sure. Now, Ed, that's the fourth part that I want to get to, sir. As we sit here today, you were not sure on that day uh, of that statement. You said, I'm not absolutely sure, not absolutely sure. Is that your position today that you're not sure as to, because you didn't write it down specifically, it's not in the documentation that you kept? Is that, is that a fair statement? I, I am not absolutely sure uh, if, um, My memory, listen, memory is fallible. I've read Loftus. My memory is that I delivered the message to Judge Hobbs that we were not gonna help her with the communications with her son. And in a very brief statement, she said to me something to the, to the effect of, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna go through the public defender or the polycom because it's recorded. That's my, that's my memory, my best memory. Judge. And I'm not absolutely sure of it. All right, that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Now, <clears throat> is, it, would it, would it, is it fair to say that what we know about that, is, that incident should be gathered from Mr. Sladen, who you have uh, designated as the person to look into that issue? Mr. Sladen was not on my call with Judge Hobbs, though. I mean, every, everything that he did directly, you should rely on him. Everything that I did directly, you should rely on my testimony. All right, and on your testimony, without going through it again, you're just not absolutely sure. That is correct. That is that correct? Sustained. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, some other areas. You indicated early on we know that the, the arrest took place on the late night, July the 30th, 2019. And I believe you told the panel here that a few minutes earlier that it is your belief that uh, you told her, that is Judge Halls, before the 5th <clears throat> of August that the conduct in having her J, J. A. Uh, present at the first appearance that you told her between that date and the 5th of August. Is that your testimony? I am not certain of when I spe had the specific communication. I can't, I can't specifically remember what I just All right, so. said, but I, I am not certain of the specific date. And in fact, if you look at, if you look at the, memo that I wrote uh, uh, where where I wrote a memo where Ms. Ware says the, the, about Grant Sladen kicking Judge Hobbs's butt when she was down, I think that it's dated after August 5th. So I, I am not certain of the date that I had the conversation uh, with her about uh, about the um, sitting at council table. So in essence, sir, as we sit here today, you can't say to this panel that you had this conversation before the second time that Miss Wehr appeared on August the 5th. Between, she know, we know she appeared there on the 31st, and then the next date would have been the 5th because we have records of that. You can't say for sure that you had that conversation. I cannot. All right, thank you. Now, <clears throat> You also can't say, as we sit here today, that Judge Hobbs was even in town, in, in uh, Tallahassee, 
between July the 30th and August the 5th, can you? I don't have any idea where Judge Hobbs was. Okay. Well, even though you don't know where she was, you, you can't say that, that she was around on August the 5th as well. Is that correct? I, I don't know. Now, let's talk about these, um, well, first of all, before we move forward on, on this. You want to make have stuff? Judge Schuster, is the PD polycam recorded or not? I'm sorry? The PD polycam, is that recorded or not? I assume it, it would not be recorded because the public defender has attorney-client privilege, but I don't know. Okay. I, ha I have never used that polycom myself. Judge, as we sit here today, you do not have any idea of what the conversations were between the jail, that is Sheriff Lee, and Judge Hobbs about how she could come to the jail to talk to her son. I do not, other than what she told me. Okay. <clears throat> Judge, do you know whether or not as we sit sat here, we, as you sit here today, as to whether or not Judge Hobbs uh, actually uh, became, actually worked out a project so that she could talk to her son by phone through the Leon County Jail. I, I know nothing about that. I don't know. The only thing that you recall is that you told uh, uh, Mr. Slayton to make sure that your office would not be involved in that decision. And I told Judge Hobbs that, I told Judge Hobbs that that was our decision. That's my best memory. But yes, I, told, I certainly told uh, TCA Sladen that we were not going to help with the uh, communications with, through the jail. Have you reviewed any other communications between Mr. Slayton and Sheriff Chief Lee of the, of the jail, other than uh, what we've already talked about. Any communications whatsoever in writing? Involving Judge Hobbs? Yes. No, not that I know of. I don't know that there are any. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's talk about you in charge of the uh, as chief judge, all of the judges, and to some extent, in many instances, if training is necessary, you would be the one that would be in charge of making sure that it occurred. Is that correct? Each judge is an elected constitutional officer. They have, I am not the boss of any judge. I have administrative supervision. The, um, I am not aware, I don't, I don't review um, the individual judge's uh, judicial education other than I will get the occasional, I will get the occasional reports of whether people are qualified to serve in um, uh, death penalty school. Um, they ask me what track they should take for a uh, new judge's college, but I mean, I'm, I'm not the boss of the judges. I don't have appellate responsibility or authority. I mean, it is, it is I don't know. I mean, the, it's administrative supervision. Judge, if there's a requirement by an administrative order in the Southern Judicial Circuit, 
you would be responsible for making sure that it occurred if it applied to judges. Is that correct? An, an administrative order that I issued or that the Supreme Court issued? Well, that the Supreme, the Supreme Court, does it not, tells uh, the chiefs <laughs> in each circuit as to what is applicable. And they, in essence, it starts at the top, flows down to you, and you have to make sure that they abide by it. The judges that are under you abide by it. Is that correct? Sort of, for some things. Um, the, it, I mean, it, I, I, I don't think that's an accurate statement for everything that a judge is responsible to do. Um, I have no authority over the decisions that the judges make in their individual cases. Uh, uh, but I have, I have authority if there's an ethical breach that I am aware of, I am responsible to respond appropriately. You'd have to ask me something more specific because there's lots of things that the Supreme Court will direct judges to do that is not enforced by the chief judge. It's, it's the individual judge's responsibility, I believe. in front of you, do you have exhibit number 13 of the just hall exhibit number 13 in front of you? I certainly can get it. Yes, sir, I have it. Mr. Chair, you might want to admit all these into evidence. All the respondents' exhibits have not been admitted They, yet. they were. Uh, they were? Yes. Not only the respondents, the petitioners were. Both were. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, do you have it in front of you, Judge? I do. Now, this is an administrative order 2004-01, handed down by the Florida Supreme Court no, as guidance. No, sir. Handed down by the Second Judicial Circuit. This is signed by Chief Judge Francis. All right. And Chief Judge Francis operated under, uh, through the Florida Supreme Court, just like you do, doesn't it? The Constitution and the statutes. Yes. yes okay. Now, this is something, this is an order that's presently on the books. If we go to the computer, you would see administrative order number 2004-01 under the Southern Judicial Circuit. Is that correct? I believe so. We still, I know we still have unified family court. I don't know if, I, I we have, Several hundred administrative orders, I think, and I know a lot of them pretty well. I don't have them. I don't know every single one of them. I know we still operate under Unified Family Court, under the rules of judicial administration, and under the family law rules. I assume this one. If you tell me it is, Mr. Randolph, I got yes. no reason to doubt you. All right. Okay. All right. I'm saying, of course, that it is. If we checked on the on the line as we speak now, it is in front. It is on in uh, the uh, online has been an admin active administrative order here in this county. Now, in regard to the, to the order itself, does it not denote that you have, uh, as far as, and this turn to page two, I'm sorry, page three called under rotation of judges. Yes, sir. You see that? Yes, sir. And it reads, judges who are assigned to the family division for the first time or who have not served in the family division for two years should receive mandatory training in the fundamentals of family law domestic violence, juvenile dependency, and it goes on, before assuming the assignment or within 60 days after assuming the assignment. That is what the document says, yes. Yes. Now, at the time that you signed, assigned Judge Hall to the family division, she had not had any training. Is that a mandatory training as looks like is required for this administrative order? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether she had had, she certainly didn't have the training in the day that between when the 
arrest occurred and when I signed the order taking her out of, um, out of uh, felony. When she last had uh, training in fundamentals of family law, domestic violence, juvenile dependency, and juvenile delinquency, I think that requirement comes right out of, oh yeah, this, well, yeah, uh, the, uh, the cases cited there. It's out um, of the Supreme Court of, of Florida, is that not true? Yes. That's where this came from. Yes. Now, and you don't know if she, as we sit here today, as to whether she received any training within 60 days after assuming the assignment. I, I'm almost sure she did. All right. I can ask a clarifying question. Is the education requirements referenced here put on by the Circuit Court Conference or Oscar as opposed to by the Second Circuit? Yes, sir. The, the, uh, I want to make certain I'm absolutely accurate. I don't think the Second Circuit has ever done a single family division training. This is, I believe this is referring to the family division track at the Circuit conference, the, what, what is now the annual circuit conference. Okay. All right. Thank you. Chair, a question. Yes. Uh, Judge, can you explain to me um, a little bit of the differences between the way that family court and criminal court cases are handled or if there's differences? Sure. Sure. So criminal court runs on a docket. Every time, every time you have a criminal case, until it is resolved, there will always be a next hearing set. Every criminal defendant, unless they, um, unless they decline counsel and invoke their, stat their constitutional right to self-represent, has a lawyer appointed um, to them. You get a clerk of court in every uh, criminal hearing. Every criminal hearing is uh, digitally court reported. There's, you, you can't lose a criminal case in the, in the cracks. A family law hearing, you, um, a regular divorce case, if it's not a domestic violence injunction case, getting a court reporter, there's no right to counsel, there's no, I mean, it's, it's which is one, another one of the reasons why we use, um, why we use case managers. Nobody else I mean, you, you've got to manage those uh, dockets and cases um, um, yourself because you don't, for most of our family, family law cases, we don't have a clerk in the courtroom. It's all on the judge. So they, they operate on a, on a different uh, process because the government hasn't restricted the liberty interest of those litigants. It's the litigants starting a lawsuit and asking for the from the court. So they, they run differently and they require different kinds of case and docket management, if that makes sense. Uh, follow up really quickly. Um, so as someone who had sat in on the criminal court um, side of the bench for an extended period of time, would she have, would Judge Hobbs have been familiar with the procedures of handling family cases? I believe Judge Hobbs had previously been assigned to family law is my best memory. I, this was not the first time she had been assigned as a judge. I think the, in fact, I think the first assignment she ever had as a judge was in family law. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Ms. Ram, I hate to interrupt again. I believe we have one other question. Just a quick question. Uh, the language here says uh, this mandatory training should be received. It doesn't say must. My question is, uh, how much of the burden is on the judge to make sure that he or she receives this training versus on somebody else's responsibility? So, for, for me in my, in my career, 100% was on me as far as I ever knew. And for me as the chief judge, it's 100% on the judge in the division unless there's a problem. And every once in a while, once in a long while, thank goodness, I will get a notice from the Supreme Court or from the Office of the State Courts Administrator that some judge has a C, uh, continuing judicial education issue. They don't, they haven't done their, their they don't have enough things. They're coming up where they're going to be, not be qualified for to sit on a uh, capital case or whatever it is. And then I'll go to that judge and so far, 100% of the time, I'm straight. Not of him. I've never gotten any 
So, I mean, if it's working right, it should be 100% on the judge. You have a question? I have a question of counsel. Yes. With Judge Hobbs ever in family division? Judge Hobbs, six, six years before then, was for about three months in Leon County. She was transferred to the uh, to Gaston County as the felony judge. That is the only involvement that she had had. Thank you. Right. you may continue. Right. Judge, we talk about the issue of, of whether or not training is essential. Um, sometimes there are, there's a system that has provisions that are not recorded as to what the process is. Is that correct? Would you repeat it, Mr. There are sometimes some issues in family law that depending on the circuit that the process is not recorded. It's, it's an unrecorded process that you have to learn to handle those cases by dealing with the clerk's office. Is that correct? Um, sort of. We have an administrative judge of, um, of family, but it's a big and complicated area, and there's no, there's no comprehensive manual of how to be a family law judge. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but not every single thing that we do is written down. Oh, oh fair enough. Um, Judge, one of the cases that you talked about here today that is on the, uh, that my client was charged with violating the canons and related to is in the interest of Cameron Wood and Cadence Noel. Are you familiar with that or I should am, I? I am not familiar with it. All right. This is on the if the former charges, the minute notice of former charges, and this is on paragraph on page five of seven. What exhibit number? Is this I'm sorry. number nine? Number seven. Number paragraph seven. seven. But it's, but it's well, exhibit well, nine. The exhibit mm -hmm. number. Number nine. Okay. Page five or seven. Now, yeah. mm -hmm. this is one of the, correct me if I'm wrong, Judge, but it appears that uh, this is one of those cases uh, in which they, there is an indication that Judge uh, Hawes failed to appropriately supervise her JA in violation of the canons. And that as it relates to uh, this particular case, she did not handle it right uh, in the sense that uh, she, she thought something was in the emergency uh, section and it, and it really wasn't. She went out of town, nobody else handled it, and as a, as a result of that, charges have been brought for, uh, against her regarding the handling of that particular file. I know nothing about that file. Okay. I'm, I, those names mean nothing to me, Mr. Randolph. Number 17 for the panel of, of the Judge Hobbs exhibits. Is everybody able, been able to locate it? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yep. Now, as to number 17, as uh, Judge Schuster, have you been able to see this document dated November the 4th, 2019? I am seeing it at this moment for the first time.
Let me know when you finish reading it. I've read the I've read the documents. Yes. Now, Judge, does, does it indicate here? This is one of the cases that we said that uh, Judge Hobbs is, uh, has been charged with formally. Uh, does it indicate here basically that uh, by Gwen Marshall, who's the clerk of the circuit court, that a mistake had been made through her office? To be perfectly candid, Mr. Randolph, I'm not sure I understand this letter, but um, what it says is it's our understanding that he filed instructions to place the hearing in non-emergency status. Subsequently received and docketed instructions setting a non-emergency hear hearing. I, I, I don't know. I don't really understand what this is saying. So, but it does say, I mean, I guess I, to, to answer your question, it's, it's Sounds like they're saying there was some mistake made, but I don't understand what mistake they're talking about. But the fact is, this is one of the cases that she's charged with, and even though you don't clearly understand what she, she's saying, it appears to be acknowledging a mistake made by the clerk's office. I don't know anything about the case or about this document. I know nothing about it. Yeah, I'll sustain the objection. You can right. certainly make argument about it later or examine other witnesses about that document. Right. Now, <clears throat> so as far as we're concerned here today, Judge, uh, your position is uh, whether or not Judge Hobbs has been properly trained at the time that these mistakes were made and untimely emergencies, that's not something that that you believe that you have as the uh, chief judge any responsibility for. Is that correct? Do I have mistakes? Do yes, I have, about do I have mistakes about preventing mistakes like this. I'm sorry. Do I have a responsibility for the mistakes that Judge Hobbs made? Yes. Is that what you're asking me? Yes. Judge Hobbs is an elected constitutional officer. She's, resp she's as responsible for the, her ethics as I am. Right. As I am. I'm I administratively supervised, but but no, I'm, she's responsible for her conduct. And you do not believe it's not your position. Your position today is that that administrative code that we talked about is not something regarding whether a person is properly trained at the time that you make the assignment. That that's something that, uh, it, that you are not uh, also, if, if mistakes are made and she's not properly trained, that's not something of, of, of your concern. Is that basically what we're saying here? No, oh, sir. Well, what are we saying? I, 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 I'm saying that the, the public is entitled to have their cases decided, have confidence that if they bring a case, it's going to be decided um, appropriately. Every judge, we all represent the person that appoints us or elects us. We're, we have the capacity to do this and that understand what our basic responsibilities are and we all know that we have to have our um, CJE. I, I'll, I'll be perfectly candid. That 16 year old administrative order that you brought to my attention, still on the books just like you said, um, When I am trying to educate myself as a judge, I ask myself, what is, what is it that I need to be able to do my uh, job cost, competently and maintain my, um, and maintain my uh, competencies? And the, and the way that you do that is through CJEs. 
the, the state JE is not offered as frequently as it was in 2004 because we only have one conference a year. AJS had already occurred as of College of Advanced Judicial Studies had already occurred. There was not going to be um, a, a CJE opportunity for her except through the circuit uh, conference. I suppose if she felt like she was incapable of doing that work competently, that she could have reached out to try and find an online CJE or something like that. But no, I did not think that was my responsibility. I think that's the judge's responsibility to ensure their basic competence. Judge, what does CJE stand for? Um, continuing judicial education, it's the minimum standards that the judges, educa continuing education standards that we're required to maintain. All right, Mr. Randolph, I could just ask some clarifying questions on that. Um, Pre-pandemic, pre um, what were the opportunities judges had to get continuing judicial education and how would they go about doing that? So the, every judge in the first year, I believe in the first year that they're on the bench are required to go through two phases, two week long phases of what's called new uh, judges college. Um, the first phase, phase is sort of how to be a judge. The second phase is specific to a, uh, an assignment area, family, criminal, civil. Um, um, following that, there's uh, basic uh, requirements, 30 hours every two years or something like that. I can't remember the specifics of what you're required to do to maintain your status as a judge in good standing with the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, that's largely done through the um, circuit conference, which is um, usually once a year in July or August, um, or at the College of Advanced Judicial Studies, smaller, smaller classes, more intense, more um, uh, a deeper dive and focus. Um, and, and how that's often typically is once a week in the spring. And how often is that? You said once a year in the spring. Yes, sir. All right. Are there any other pre-pandemic any other opportunities for continuing judicial education? for circuit judges other than those two opportunities you've mentioned? So, the we, we used to talk about doing, we used to be more skeptical of video education, now we don't have any choice. And my, my, my sense of it is that, no, I thought, you, I thought it had to be live education at the conferences or something specifically approved like out in Reno at the, at the a judicial, whatever the, whatever the, whatever the national, it's the National Judicial College. Yeah, so, so a judge could take classes outside of Florida, um, but they would not necessarily be specific to, and probably would not be specific to Florida law. That's correct. That's right. correct. And I think you have to get specific authorization from Oscar, to, certainly for the travel, for the, for, to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And you know what? And I, I did misspeak. Once in a blue moon, we had an issue with, for example, um, and, the, and this is a correction to something that I'd said to you before, it, I just remembered it. We'll have an issue that comes up that is specific to the circuit. We were, the circuit was sued over first appearance in uh, bond setting procedures. We actually weren't sued directly, the sheriff was sued. Um, uh, because of my um, feeling about that lawsuit and an opinion that uh, the federal judge wrote, although we were not reversed, the decision was not um, directly attacked, I, I organized a, um, an all-day seminar for the judges on first appearance and bonds um, setting uh, practice. And I believe that we did apply to the Supreme Court and got authority for, um, for uh, CJE credit for that for that class that, that uh, Judge Akins and Judge Allman and myself taught. All right, thank you. So there's, there's some, there is some additional opportunities for CJE. Well, Judge, you, you said it basically, I, I think I understand your position about uh, this really the judge's responsibility regarding that training, but there are in, in, in other areas, if, if it's a criminal case, is it not, uh, is th that the same rule in a criminal case that the judge is responsible for training? The, the, the administrative order that you, that you um, 
you were citing was specific, I believe, to Unified Family Court, yes. which is a real specific subset of um, family law. For us, typically, those are family law cases that also have either a juvenile delinquency or a juvenile dependency case associated. But no, I mean, it's not at all the same. So that specific training requirement is, I don't know, there may be some administrative order, well, certainly on death penalty cases. Yeah. The Florida Supreme Court administrative order that r requires um, training and we get a report yeah. from the Florida Supreme Court about people that are qualified. Now, there's not a unified family court qualification under that rule like there, like there is in um, criminal court. It's not, it's not a mandate with, a, with, a, with the specific indication from the Supreme Court that if you don't comply, you won't be permitted to sit on a particular kind of a case, a capital case. So it's different, is my reaction. I'm not sure which. Yes. Well, well Judge, one, one final area. Uh, on JAs, you said uh, that. Uh, you told us your position on the judges as far as having a responsibility on training. The JAs do not work directly for you either, do they? That's, cor that's correct. They have administrative supervision t to some extent that is not literally laid out. It's not laid out, is it? It is not. It's not specifically stated, except that, I mean, you, you know, you can read uh, JQC opinions, opinions on uh, and your, so it's your position here today also that you don't have any uh, uh, authority basically over the JA. That has to come through to the judge that she works for no, sir, as far no, as training. No, sir. I mean, I mean, that's my great discomfort case. No, I think I do have responsibility to the following extent. The accusation in this case but this person who was given access to a security accused of shooting a person through a closed and locked door with an AK-47. During the time that that person, that a accusation was unresolved, I had responsibility for security of that facility. I had responsibility for security of our confidential information. Had the unthinkable happened because I had not acted, which I did not, I would have been responsible. Had I, had I not deactivated Ms. Ware's security badge, eliminated her responsibility and authority for our confidential information, something had happened, that would have been my responsibility. So I think as an administrative supervisor, I, I may not have the authority to terminate Ms. Ware's employment and tell the state of Florida to stop paying her. But I think I had authority to say, you are not, you do not have the judgment necessary to be entrusted with this responsibility. Well, Judge, and, and we're back to the question regarding JAs. Uh, so you, you, you told us the instances that you think that you do have some responsibility as relates to JAs. But prior to a uh, few months ago, you've never sent the JAs for any training, have you? I want to make sure I understand your question, Mr. Randolph. I never directed the JAs to go to any training. We made available to them the Judicial Assistance Association. Judge. For the panel, this is exhibit number 14.
the judge is hot. Judge is Hobbs, this the 14? Res yeah, respondent. This is in, I'm sorry, this is uh, the Judge Hobbs' is exhibits. Thank you. Exhibit number 14. Judge Hobbs, all right, I'll strike that. Judge Schuster, throughout this, the former charges as it relates to Judge Hobbs, there were questions about this uh, JA that she had and as to whether or not she was performing as she should have performed uh, regarding her work with these cases. Now, at no time prior to February 25th, 2021, which is on this exhibit that we're looking at now, did you ever order any training as relates to the JA? That is correct. And now you say in this uh, training regarding JAs that it is mandatory. Yes, sir. All right. But back during the time that, that, that the facts that, which led to the charges against Judge Hobbs, you, didn't, you did not make an effort you now say it's mandatory, but you made no effort to help out uh, and by making sure that the JAs were in fact trained, and that which would include her JA, Ms. Judy Worth. I did not uh, direct any JA to mandatory training before February 25th of 2021. All right. Uh, uh, Are there any other cross? Uh, yes, one, one final question. Judge, judge in, in regard to Judge Hobbs, there was another occasion of which this was involving the criminal area, of which you uh, had to get special clearance but you, to get her back in on death penalty cases. Is that correct? For training? Second. On death penalty cases, that she had to have special training that you went back to the Florida Supreme Court and you got special, uh, you, uh, they allowed you to send her back to uh, training again as related to death penalty cases. I don't doubt you, Mr. Randolph, I don't remember it. I have a first question. All right, thank you, any redirect? Just, just briefly, Your Honor. Uh, Judge Shostrom, I appreciate that these events occurred a long time ago and with the pandemic it seems like almost a decade ago so I, I certainly appreciate you know you testifying from memory as much as you have um, I'd refer you to your exhibit 18 which are your sort of uh, the memos to file that you did this is the JQC memo? yes sir I'm sorry JQC the black binder exhibit 18 yes sir and, and hand numbered page 5 Yes, sir. Okay. And you see the notation after 731.19, the text message from me, this would be from you, Judge Showstrom, to Judge Hobbs at 851 asking that she come to my office. Did that happen? Yes, absolutely. So she came to your office that day? Yes. Okay. That, <laughs> I remember the date now, Mr. Uh, now that you showed me the note that I made. Yes. Okay, I, I appreciate we are trying to reconstruct ancient history here, but so following to the next sentence, also text message from me, Judge Showstrom, to Judge Hobbs with Alex Williams' contact. That's from the same day, 731 of 2019? Yes. Okay. So if we flip to the uh, 
Exhibit one, I believe Mr. Randolph, this is JQC Exhibit one, Mr. Randolph made um, reference to it. This would be the report that Judge Hobbs emailed to the commission on August 1st, 2019 at 4.18 p.m. Do you, are you there? Yes. Yes, sir. And you see at the top line there says, she's telling the commission pursuant to our discussion yesterday, July 31, 2019, this is a summary of what occurred. Does that help jog your memory about the sequence of events? Well, this, this is certainly the next day. This is certainly the date after um, I sent her contact information, your contact information to Judge Hobbs. Okay. The memo, the talking points memo, does that represent the first in-person meeting you had with Judge Hobbs and Mr. Sladen about the events of her son's shooting? That was, my best memory is that that is what this was prepared for. Okay, so this would be the first time you saw her in person regarding the shooting? I believe so, yes. Okay. In regards to the training, the, I'll refer you now back to uh, Exhibit 13 in the Respondent's Minor, that's the Administrative Order. And I'm looking at page three of that. And the language there says, judges who are assigned to the Family Division for the first time or who have not served in the Family Division for two years, so Judge Hobbs would qualify under that provision, would she not? Okay. Yes, yes, she, uh, I, she, she'd been in Gadsden County for more than two years for sure. Yes, sir. Should receive mandatory training in the fundamentals of family law, domestic violence, juvenile dependency, and juvenile delinquency. Is it your job as the circuit, the chief judge, to teach the judges the fundamentals, or does that education come from the Supreme Court Education Committee? That would come from uh, the uh, Conference of Circuit Judges or the Office of State Courts Administrator. We have never done that training uh, in the circuit. Are you aware of any other circuits? Are you aware of any other circuits that provide fundamental trainings to the, to the judges of the style that the uh, Conference of Judges does? No, but some of, the ju some of the circuits are very different than ours. I mean, I got 16 circuit judges serving six counties. Miami's got, I think, 80 circuit judges serving one county. So I, I can't really, I've never asked that question of the other chief judges or TCAs. So but I you're not aware of any? I am not. Okay. And I just wanna, I wanna ask, you said you didn't take any action in the uh, Judy Ware um, security badge situation, and that's your regret, but in fact, you did take action. You counseled Judge Hobbs, is that correct? I did. And you, in fact, asked her to counsel uh, Ms. Ware? I did. And she did not, she wanted you to do that? Yes, sir. And you did counsel Ms. Ware? And her attitude was what? I mean, she, she, she said, that her opinion was that um, picking Judge Hobbs when she was down and that Mr. Sladen uh, was pretending to care about Judge Hobbs, but he didn't really care about her, and basically left the office. Um, she was not receptive to my, to my um, counseling. And I know you, you said that you believe that that was a termination offense but you didn't have the, you didn't believe you had the authority to do that, but you did ask Judge Hobbs to fire her judicial assistant? I didn't, not in that way. What I did said, you say? I said very, what I, my specific memory was that I said, this is grounds for termination. And did she terminate her judicial assistant? She did not. Thank you, I don't have any other further questions. Right, recross briefly. If, if I understand normally we've got 
direct, cross, and redirect. But yep. I have one additional question I would Go ahead. Mr. Houston, did the judicial systems assistant Judy Wer apologize to you after this event? Come to, to you and apologize. Not to my way of thinking about it. What she said, I think I know what you're talking about. My, my specific memory of what she said, she knocked on the door and said, I've always had nothing but respect for you. I hope you know that I have nothing but respect for you. That's, that's what she said. I don't remember her specifically addressing the way she spoke to me. I, don't, I, didn't take it as a, I didn't take it as an apology, um, but maybe that's what she intended. And finally, you felt that that is a statement that really offended you, your humanity. Didn't you tell me that? You, uh, you the felt that the mask, I'm sorry, Mr. Randolph, the mask. I'm sorry. Uh, you felt that the statement that w which we're talking about as an apology I actually offended your humanity. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't remember, I, I, I remember, well, I mean, I'll t I, I'm sorry. No, no, look, that was the question. Do you I, remember? Well, there's an objection, you know, I'll sustain it unless you want to impeach him on it. I've got, and I have the deposition transcript if you want to. All right. Let me see if the panel has any questions. I'll start on my left, Mr. Tyree. No. Judge Ruth. Mr. Shafino. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. McElroy, Mr. White, okay. I do. Um, Look, Judge, can you, can you turn to uh, JQC exhibit number 18, page three? Yes, sir. Trying to get something straight in my mind. Um, that's a summary, I guess, of your, well, I'll wait till you get there. <laughs> the, the, the hand numbered page at the bottom right corner discussed Yes, sir, with... number three. Yes, sir. That's a summary of the bullet points of your meeting on August 12th, 2019. Yes. yes, sir. With Judge Hobbs and Ms. Ware. Yes, sir. And that was the first time you met with them to discuss the courtroom issue? The Judge Ware, I mean, Judy Ware, Ms. Ware sitting at the council table. Yes, I sir. believe that is correct. Okay. And then if you would turn to exhibits 20 and 21, they show their JQC exhibits showing Ms. Ware in the courtroom? Yes, sir. And one of them's July 31st and the other's August 5th? Yes, sir. Okay. So your conversation with Ms. Ware, I'm trying to get in my, or my head around did you tell her not to go and then she still went? But it looks like from these exhibits that you first told her, told her August 12th, uh, you talked to her about that and it was after uh, July 31st and August 5th. That is what it looks like to me. I mean, I, well, that's what it looks like to me too. That's why I'm asking you this. That's, so, I think you're correct, and, and the okay. explanation that I would give you for it is well, I mean, a lot of things going on in a yeah, no, no. short period of time. I'm just trying time. to, you know, our, 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 our goal here is to get factually accurate in justice yes, right. and things like that. So I just want to make sure that my analysis of the exhibits and the facts are, in fact, correct. I think that, I think. I think that's what it looks like to me, too. Okay. Uh, second line of questions. I'd like to know in the Second Circuit, like some of the emergency order issues that I'll say fell through the cracks, maybe, were while the judge, while Judge Hobbs was maybe out of the office uh, away because of her mother's passing. Where I'm from in the 15th Circuit, uh, Palm Beach County, I don't know if, if Chief Judge Marks has a standing policy on it, or if the judges just do it. But my experience has been if a judge is gone for a week or so, there's always a judge sitting in to review everything and go through everything. What do y'all do in the Second Circuit? And by that I mean, 
does the judge have the responsibility of getting somebody to cover? Does the judge tell you, I'm going to be gone for a week? Can you get somebody to cover? If you can kind of explain that to me. We have a family law, uh, we have a family law duty judge that's uh, there. Their typical responsibility is to do domestic violence um, injunctions. There is, and I'm trying to remember if it's a memorandum uh, issued by the administrative judge of family or, or an administrative order that I issued. I think it's a memorandum. Okay. This set, that says the, the emergency is supposed to go first to the assigned judge, then to the uh, family law uh, duty judge, then to the chief judge, I believe is what okay, it says. Okay, so in this case, if Judge Hobbs was gone for a week for a family emergency, the emergency motion comes in, it goes to the clerk. The clerk then should be aware that the judge is gone, correct? No, my, my experience, I mean, they might be, but my experience is typically they go to the JA, and if, okay. and if the judicial assistant knows that the judge is out, because sometimes you know the judge is going to be out and sometimes you don't. Um, and uh, typically we rely, I think, on the JA to say, listen, my uh, judge so-and-so is, um, has an emergency and is out, um, and it would go to the, the family law duty judge. Okay. Do you know in this case what actually happened factually? <laughs> I do not. I do not. Okay. Um, and the last question or line of questions, you said there was no writing or policy that dictates how soon you should look and determine if something's emergency or how soon you should set it. You're, you're preferred for yourself. You like to get it out. You like to review it and get out something, a determination at the end of every day. But bef I, I try to get it done. If, I, if I'm working on an order and an emergency comes in, I put it away and look at the emergency and decide if it's an emergency or not as quickly as possible. If I can't get to it because I'm doing something that I can't break from, usually my assistant will give it to me on a break. If, but at the end of the day, if there's an emergency in my email or in my physical inbox, it's got to be done by close of business. That's okay. and and I and there may be a rule or a or a. Well, that's what I'm asking. You don't know if there's a rule that tells Judge Hobbs this rule says you have to decide if this is an emergency in one day, five days, ten days. I, I don't. I'd know. like to know that if you have such a rule. No, I don't know that there is such. I don't know that that's written down. Okay, so that's left for each judge, for him or her to decide himself. In the absence of, of specific authority, yes. Okay, and I understand there's probably a reasonable standard, reasonable period of time applied to that issue. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. All right. I think your answer to my question was, that's right. Yes, I saw sir. you shaking your head, yes. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. The, 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 reasonable given that the word emergency is written on the document. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Judge, real quickly, um, if you have Exhibit 30, the talking points. Oh, this document. Yes, sir. All right. Your handwritten notes, uh, can you tell us when you placed your handwritten notes on that document? Could you say? Can you tell us uh, what you testified earlier that those are, the, ha the handwriting is yours. The, yes, sir. Can you tell us when you put the handwriting, would that have been before you met with the judge or after or when? Yes. The, the, the handwriting, so uh, Mr. Slayton gave me this. and. Uh, Mr. Slayton gave me gave me this, and I made the the marks on the uh, document. And I think this was sitting on my desk as I was as I was talking to Judge Hobbs with exactly these marks on. It. All right. So you made the, the you put in the handwriting before you met with Judge Hobbs. Yes, sir. Okay. Also, uh, back in 2019, how many circuit judges um, were assigned to felony in Leon County, and how many were assigned to family in? At that time. It's a harder question than you might think, because um, we went from three to four. Um, it, yeah, it had to be four. So there were four felony judges. We had two full-time family judges, and then two judges who had a half a family load plus Jefferson County 
and a half a family load plus, I think, uh, guardianship and probate at that time. All right, thank you. So a total of three, a total of three, three full-time family law judges. Okay, any follow-up? Uh, Mr. Williams first and then Mr. Randolph. Uh, and, and this will go to Mr. White's point. Uh, the Exhibit 18, JQC Exhibit 18, the hand-numbered page 3, dated August 12th. Yes, sir. Okay, and then you have the talking points memo. The, it's your best recollection that this talking points memo, JQC Exhibit 30, that Mr. Sladen prepared for you, that is the first meeting you had with Judge Hobbs and Mr. Sladen uh, soon after her son's arrest for the shooting. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. I, I wish that we had dated it. Of course. And the August 12th memo referred to uh, in Exhibit 18, where you're stating that you met with Judge Hobbs and her judicial assistant at 4 p.m. on that day. Could that have been in relation to another incident? And she just brought up the, the issue about sitting at council table? Well, let me ask it to you this way, Judge Sherstrom, and I, I, I apologize for interrupting your reading, but the talking points memo where you and J Mr. Sladen met with Judge Hobbs soon after her son's shooting, would you say that was within a day or so of you finding out about the event? That's what I, that's okay. what I think, and... Yes, sir. Okay. So, and I'm going quickly because I know we're approaching soon after lunch here. Um, <laughs> The memo you're referring to where you spoke with Judge Hobbs on page two, I'm talking to you because I understand your judicial assistant sat at council table during first appearance. You see that? We, uh, where are we now? The second page of the talking points memo, JQC Exhibit 30. Oh, right. Okay. Ms. Ware was not present with you during that meeting, was she? Uh, Ms. Ware was not present the first time I spoke with Judge Hobbs. When you went over that. these talking points? That's correct. Okay. So this, this meeting with Judge Hobbs and her judicial assistant from the Exhibit 18 dated August 12th must have been referring to a different meeting where Judge Hobbs and her judicial assistant were present. Is that right? I think so. Um, Is there something else? Uh, I mean, it's, it, there's definitely two different uh, meetings, and I can't remember if my memory is that I found out about the first time sitting at council table by watching the video. I don't know that I ever knew that it was the second incident of sitting at council table before. You know, and just, just to be absolutely clear, during the, your first meeting with Judge Hobbs, within a day or two of you finding out about her son's arrest with this talking points memo, JQC Exhibit 30, you, you told her that Judy Ware should not be at council table that's too close to you. She represents you as personal staff, subject to many provisions of the code. You probably could not sit at table, the council table, so Judy shouldn't either. That's something you covered with Judge Hobbs? I, I believe that it is, but I, when I, when the first time that I talked to Judge Hobbs was, I, I think I talked to her before first appearance, and I don't know why I would say before first appearance, your your judicial assistant shouldn't sit at council table because it would never occur to me in a million years that a judicial assistant would sit at council table with a criminal defendant in a case. Under these circumstances, it would never have occurred to me. I can't imagine that I would bring this up. That issue, J.A. sitting at council table in a criminal proceeding, without something prompting me to do that. So I had to have seen either someone told me or I had watched the first appearance when I when I did this. So I, 
maybe this was Mr. a Mr. Chair, can I have a follow-up? Uh, let me. I'm uh, finished, yes. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. All right, go ahead, Mr. Yeah. White. Looking at page two of the talking points, the top talking point, it says, I'm talking to you because I understand that your judicial assistant, Judy, sat at council table during first appearance. So clearly this was done after first appearance? Yes, Sometime sir. after July uh, 31st? Yes, sir. I think, I think I'm gonna beat a dead horse, but do you recall when this meeting was? Obviously after July 1st. Uh, looking at that line, I do not think these are notes from the very first meeting that we had. Okay. All right. The, the JA appeared twice at first appearance in a, a detention hearing. Uh, one was July 31st, one was August 5th. You can't recall if your meeting with the J was before or after the August 5th I, one. I, I can't. I certainly think that the meeting with the JA was after August 5th, because I got the August 12th memo that tells me that. Um, I, I can't recall the first time that I told Judge Hobbs about judicial assistants sitting at council table. Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, in Exhibit 18, if we look at handwritten page one, can you look at the bottom of that page? It appears as though you have um, provided um, notes on a phone call that you believe you had with Judge Hobbs on August 2nd. Can you confirm? Yes, sir. Can you yeah, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Can you confirm and tell us if that's what that is at the bottom there? Yes, um, after, I, after I had the, thinking about sending this, I had a call with her and then I made these notes in the smaller font. So that call happened the morning of August 2nd, and in that call you believe that you um, told Judge Hobbs that you were concerned that her judicial assistant had attended the first appearance? Mm -hmm. That is exactly what that says, and that is exactly the date that is referenced. Okay, thank All right. you. All right, Ms. Randolph, any questions, any yeah, follow-up? There was one other question on another topic that I failed to ask you. Just just one question, and I think we've touched upon the recusals. Uh, in this, the second judicial circuit, is recusal on a case-by-case -case basis, or is there a standard order? In the, the second judicial circuit, when you, we speak of recusal, is it, do we have a standing order on recusal, or is it on a case-by-case -case basis? Are we talking about where we send it to a different circuit, or are we talking about just a judge gets off a case in general? Just gets off of a case. That's, that's, that's a, I mean, the specific rule is in the rules of judicial administration. I don't think there's a separate administrative order. I think that the question is, can a judge file something with the clerk saying, if any, if this attorney or this individual appears, I'm automatically recused. Oh, 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 oh. I don't think there is such an administrative order I, that I can, that I'm aware, that I can remember. Right. And, and in, in this circuit, it's done on a case by case basis. That is what you, you told your judges. I believe that's correct, yes. All right. Well, can, can I, I ask follow this? up on that point only? Go ahead. If there were, if, that, huh? if Judge Hobbs entered an order, to the clerk's office stating that she wouldn't be sitting on any cases involving her son's attorney. Do you have any reason to believe the clerk's office would not obey that order? No, I mean, we, we, we've never had it before that I'm aware of, so I'm sure we would figure out how to accommodate. All right, thank you. No further questions. So you don't have that? I mean, Palm Beach County, we do. You can file an order saying all cases involving Attorney Smith have the clerk recuse me, and they'll do it. It's never come to my attention. That it, it may have been done in our clerk's office. Okay. You're just not aware of one way or the other? Not aware of it one way or the other. All right. Well, thank you very much. We will be in recess till 2.15, and we go off the record at this time. 2.15? Yeah. It's 10 till 1.
I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that, Your Honor. Before we go back on the record. Okay, it looks like we are back on the record. And we will go ahead and proceed with the next witness. Uh, who will the JQC's next witness be? Uh, the JQC will call uh, Trial Court Administrator Grant Slayton. All right, sir, if you approach the uh, witness seat, and if you remain standing to be sworn in, yes, I raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right, please be seated. Thank you, sir. May it please the court. Uh, Mr. Sladen, if you would, please uh, introduce yourself to the members of the hearing panel and spell your name for the court reporter. Uh, yes, sir. I'm Grant Sladen, and my name is G-R-A-N-T-S-L-A-Y-D-E-N. Mr. Sladen, how are you currently employed? I am the trial court administrator for the Second Judicial Circuit. All right. And as the trial, uh, first of all, how long have you been the trial court administrator for the Second Judicial Circuit? Uh, about 19 years now I've been the court administrator. Okay. Uh, any other employment um, before becoming trial court administrator? Yes, I worked for the Florida court system for over 30 years now. Um, I also recently retired a couple years ago. Um, from the United States Army and the Florida Army National Guard. I've served for them for 32 and a half years. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for your service. Um, turning to the events of Judge Hobbs' son's arrest on July 30th uh, of 2019, um, did you discuss this matter with Judge Sostrom, the chief judge of the circuit? Yes, I did. Okay. And how soon after Judge Hobbs' son's arrest did you discuss this with Judge Sostrom? I think it was the very next morning um, after the arrest. I, I believe the arrest was on the 31st of July, so that would be 1 August. Did Judge Sostrom ask you to do anything uh, when you spoke to him? Yes, sir. He asked me to get some documents. That, that's standard practice. Um, you know, I get the Chief Judge documents all the time, but he asked me to get uh, a uh, copy of the probable cause or the rest affidavit, just some information. So I was able to quickly get some information for him so they'd have a chance to look at it. Okay. Um, did you have a chance to uh, watch the first appearance hearing uh, of Judge Hobbs' son on July 31st, 2019? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Can you turn in the black exhibit binder in front of you to tab 20, please? And what is that a picture of? Oh, that's a picture of the first appearance courtroom at the Leon County Jail. Um, and that's where they conduct um, first appearance. Okay, and that's a that's a screenshot of the detention. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, of the first appearance hearing uh, from July 31st. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of what you observed at the hearing? 
Yes, sir, it is. Okay, and can you identify the people seated at council's table in this picture? I can identify uh, Gary Roberts. Um, he, he used to work for us as a conflict council. And then Judy Ware um, on the right. I, at the time, I didn't know who the individual in the middle was. Okay, and do you now know who that person is? Yes, sir. I, well, after the fact, I found out it was um, Judge Hobbs' father. On or about August 1st, did you and Chief Judge Sostrom meet with Judge Hobbs regarding her ethical responsibilities? Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, the, the Chief Judge um, wanted to counsel her and had uh, asked me to be present for that counseling. Um, for that counseling, I also had uh, prepared some talking points. That's a standard uh, process that we have. If he's got some important meeting or something, he's usually busy doing things. So I'll prepare talking points for him. So I'll, I'll draft up what I think might be important to ask or say, um, and then give those to him. And I'll do that for anything. I'll do that for counseling. In this case, I'll do that for bar presentations. I'll do that for judges meetings, almost anything. I'll prepare some sort of talking points for him, for him to at least initially look at and react to. Okay. Uh, if you look at the document uh, that's solitary by itself there, I believe one side of it says talking points. Yes, sir. And this is, uh, for the record, JQC Exhibit 30. Um, is this a copy of the talking points that you created for Judge Sostrom? Yes, this is. Okay. It's a two-sided copy. I handed him two sheets of paper, I believe. Yes, sir. Okay. Fair enough. Um, the handwriting on that, is that you recognize that to be Judge Sostrom's? Yes, it is. Okay, and you were present with Judge Sostrom when he uh, went over these talking points with Judge Hobbs? Yes, sir. I gave him this document. I stamped a draft because it wasn't the final document when I gave it to him. Um, he then um, proceeded to do the counseling. Um, I proceeded to stare at the floor, and um, he would uh, cross off or amend things. I saw he was writing when he did the counseling. He did some some modifications before Judge Hobbs came in. He did some modifications once Judge Hobbs was in the room. And at the end, he handed it to me and told me to hold on to this. Okay. So you maintained the original copy of this document? Yes, sir. It's, it's in our files. And we made copies and sent them to, to parties. Okay. And the, point, the talking points that are fully visible, uh, are, would it be fair to say that you, uh, those are points that Judge Sostrom covered? with Judge Hobbs during the meeting? Absolutely, he was very thorough so that things he didn't say or chose not to say, he, he, he crossed off and then everything else he covered point by point. I remember thinking to myself, I did pretty good. Okay, um, and just to be absolutely clear, it's your recollection that this meeting occurred within a day or two of, of Judge Hobbs' son's uh, arrest and first appearance? Absolutely, it is August 1st, Maybe August 2nd is the latest, but I believe it was August 1st. Okay. Were you present with Judge Sostrom during uh, other counseling sessions with Judge Hobbs? Yes, yes, I was. Okay. And in general, what was Judge Hobbs' attitude towards the counseling she was receiving? Well, it, 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 it varied. The very first counseling she wanted to talk more about her um, son's situation and the chief was trying to steer it back to these talking points but she kept bringing up you know her son's situation that it wasn't as bad um, that there's more facts to it the just information like that so it was you know i i, I sensed it as uh, you know a mom is being defensive and and trying to protect their son and the chief judge kept bringing it back to these talking points were you present for counseling between the chief judge and Judge Hobbs's JA? Yes, I was. That was at a, a later time, though. That wasn't contemporaneous with this time. Okay. And uh, during that later counseling between Judge uh, Sostrom and Judge Hobbs's JA, what was Judge Hobbs's JA's attitude uh, towards the counseling? I, I thought it was contempt. Um, I was shocked that a judge would would go ahead and, and counsel, a chief judge would counsel a personal staff to another judge, an employee, and then um, the body language, the demeanor was contempt. Um, I, I just thought that was very rude. I thought, and, and at the end, 
she basically walked out of the room without being dismissed. And 32 years of army service, you don't do that. She just left, and uh, again, I was shocked at the behavior. Would you characterize it as dismissive? Uh, absolutely. And did you get a chance to watch the video of the Haynes detention hearing uh, occurring on August 5th, 2019? Uh, there was a second hearing, and I did see the video. There was a, um, it was in the same courtroom, the same situation. Okay, and if you would turn to, in your black well, so Mr. Williams, yes, sir. Just for clarification, the uh, session with the JA was was Judge Hobbs present, or was it just the JA? No, Judge Hobbs was not present, sir. It was just the judicial assistant. All right. And as far as the time frame of that session with the JA, could you tell us that that was before or after the August 5th court appearance? Oh, very after the August 5th hearing. Okay. It, was a, it was very subsequent to that. It, it was not around that time period at all. All right. Thank you. In fact, the counseling session, the counseling session, wow, saying that with a mask is hard. Mm -hmm. Counseling session with Judge Hobbs' JA and Judge Sostrom that you were present for, was that as a result of the fact that Judge Sostrom asked Judge Hobbs to counsel her JA and she refused? Yes, sir. She, uh, the Chief Judge had counseled with Judge Hobbs immediately before that and asked her to state certain points that were again written down um, to counsel um, her, and she said, no, you do it, which again was surprising to me because Judge, uh, Judy Ware is Judge Hobbs' personal staff, and it's incumbent upon her to, to discipline or, or counsel, having hiring and fire, firing authority over the employee, not the chief judge. Um, he ended up counseling her after all. He, did, he counseled her, and that was fairly close in time. I mean, the same day within maybe a half hour of the other event, as I recall. Okay, and then again, that, that session occurred some time after the arrest, a, a, a date far in the future. Yes, sir, that was, a, that was a separate counseling event. And to be clear, the counseling event with the talking points memo that occurred within a day or two of Judge Hobbs' son's arrest, that only involved yourself, Judge Sostrom, and Judge Hobbs? Yes, sir, that was just the three of us. Okay, thank you. Um, so turn to tab, if you would, 21. Uh, in the black JQC binder. It's another screen snap. Uh, this one is of the detention hearing from August 5th of 2019. Uh, it's been previously admitted as JQC Exhibit 21. Can you, um, first of all, is this an accurate depiction of the video you saw in the detention hearing? Yes, sir, it's the same courtroom. Okay, and the individual seated at council table during this hearing, can you identify them, please? Uh, yes, sir, that's um, Gary Roberts again, whom I subsequently learned was um, Judge Hobbs' father, and then Judy Ware once again. The individual in the middle is Judge Hobbs' father. Yes, sir, I'm okay. sorry, I was left to right. Yes, sir, okay. I uh, just didn't want the record to reflect that uh, Gary Roberts was Judge Hobbs' father. Um, let's see. Can you explain uh, how you became involved in Judge Hobbs' um, attempt to arrange visitation um, at the jail? Uh, I believe the judge contacted me about it um, and, and asked me about the, the possibility of getting visitation with her son, or wanting to talk to her son, I think is how she put it. Now, in terms of a date, if you would turn to tab 18. And on hand numbered page one, lower right hand corner there, this is a, a, also been admitted as JQC Exhibit 18. Um, this is a memo that uh, Judge Sostrom um, talked about at length, but one of the things that we were able to um, determine is that this was something he took down relating to a phone call he had. And if you look at the second half of this page, it begins note, do you see that, sir? No, yes, sir, I did. This letter was drafted but not sent as of 8-2-2019. The phone call described occurred 8-2-2019, around 9 a.m. And if you would, just read to yourself the second paragraph. Yes, sir. Okay, so if, if this phone call 
between Judge Sostrom and Judge Hobbs occurred on 8-2 at 9 a.m. in which Judge Sostrom is telling Judge Hobbs that we are not going to assist you with arranging unmonitored visitation or visitation at all. When is your best guess that Judge Hobbs approached you to arrange visitation with her son sometime before the second? I think it would be 8-1, um, yes sir, it would be on August 1st, probably in the afternoon. Is it possible it happened in the morning? The morning of 8-1? Yes, sir. It is, it is possible. I mean, it takes a while to track down some of the stuff. Again, a lot of events happen very quickly and closely spaced in time. Yes, sir. I hope I'm not conflating some of it. Understood. So after she contacts you, what does she ask for specifically? Well, she wanted to talk to her son, and it was understanding because, you know, here's a mother, her son's charged with very serious crimes, and um, she wanted to, to talk to him and see if he's doing okay and what's his state of mind. I mean, all those things I could imagine. And, and so um, I wanted to help her. I wanted to see if we could set something up for her. Okay, so what did you do th next, I guess? Uh, well, I went ahead and, and started uh, doing what I usually do. A judge asks for help. I try to come up with a solution. So I tried to contact the jail, um, probably spoke to, to one of the chiefs. Um, and eventually was, was um, given to somebody else who would have the information. I think um, now they're called chiefs, but it'd be a major or a captain there. Maybe a, uh, Major Ed Lee? Yeah, after, subsequent to that, I went and looked and I had an email of describing that. Okay. And what did you learn uh, about what options were available to Judge Hobbs? Uh, they had a uh, system set up where you could subscribe and talk to inmates via video. So it was a, a system set up and you have to set up an online account and uh, make it work to talk to them and um, seemed like a good option for the judge. Okay, and this video, uh, it's a video system you say? Y yes sir. Okay. Um, but you can do it from a phone or a computer. Or it's a system where you don't need anything special in your end. It's sort of like a precursor to Zoom, maybe. Okay. So you found out about this sort of new program, and did you take that information to Judge Hobbs? Yes, sir. Okay. So, and you told Judge Hobbs about this information about the program. What did she tell you? Well, I, I, I think that now that I think about it, I think there were actually um, two instances with Judge Hobbs, possibly. Um, because I, I took the information, and then she was going to try it, but had some trouble. It wasn't working, or she was frustrated with it and wanted to find a, a, another solution or something. And, and that's when I had a lengthier conversation with her. Okay. And at some point, did she raise concerns with you about the fact that phone calls or video would be monitored? Well, it, it, in one of the conversations, again, they, I think they happened fairly close together, but in one of the conversations she'd asked me um, about, do you think they're monitored, do you think they can listen in on the calls or something, and, and like they do with telephones or something along those lines, and, and that immediately made me nervous. Why did that make you nervous? Because I, I was nervous that there may be an attempt to have communication with an inmate um, where other people couldn't listen in. That was the implication. Is there some other method to, to use other than the method I gave her? Did you have concerns about the propriety of her request or her statement? Well, that was, that was a concern. I wanted to help Judge Hobbs, but I also wanted to protect her. Okay. So what did you do when, you, when Judge Hobbs made that statement to you? She made the statement. It made me very nervous about you know, how I could proceed. Um, and so I, I, I went and first decided to see if there's some other option. So I remember trying to explore some other option, but I also went and talked to the chief judge about it because I was very nervous about getting in the middle of something that could cause trouble. Okay. And when you went to the chief judge, what did you tell him? Uh, I told him about the communications I had with Judge Hobbs and the, the implication and the way it was phrased at the time it was phrased in the conversation that made me very anxious about it. Okay. What did he say? Um, he told me to cease all efforts to work with communications. Okay. So looking back at Exhibit 18, the hand-numbered page one, is that a fair recollection of what you recall happening? Well, first of all, let me back up. Were you present when Judge Sostrom called Judge Hobbs? Um, I, I don't recall, frankly. I don't recall if I was there. I, I don't think I was, but I don't recall. Okay. 
How did you find out about Judge Hobbs' son using her judicial assistant's security badge to move about the courthouse? I got a call from the uh, clerk's office. Okay. What did they say? Um, somebody from the clerk's office called me and was very concerned um, that he was in the building uh, as it was relayed to me, the doors to the elevator, the, 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 we call the Bundy elevator, it's the elevator on the north east corner of the courthouse, opened, opens into the clerk's office and the door opened and um, Justin Haynes was standing there um, in the elevator looking out into the clerk's office and it unnerved um, at least one clerk because they called me and was concerned about it. So let me back up. The elevator you're referring to opens into the clerk's office. Is that a secure elevator? In other words, it's not open to the public? Yes, sir. It's not a publicly accessible elevator. It goes from the P4 uh, elected official parking area. That's where the sheriff and the judges, the county commissioners, clerk, park, state attorney, PD. And it runs up the northwest corner of the building. It stops right outside Judge Hobbs' chambers um, on each floor. Um, it has a badge reader that you need to have a, a secure badge to get onto the elevator, one of the officially issued Leon County Courthouse badges um, to get on. All right. And, and once you get on the elevator, you have to badge it again to make it go anywhere. So it's like a two-step process. Okay. So yeah. someone without an, an access badge wouldn't even be able to get on the elevator, let alone make it move. Correct. Okay. And um, in terms of the access badges themselves, they are unique to the individuals that they're assigned to? Yes, sir. They have your um, name on it and the department you work for. So they're, they're secured each individual. And then different badges have different levels of access. Okay. So, for example, um, I can't get into secure public defender office areas. They can't get into secure judicial chambers areas. So there's, there's limitations on access. The, Generally, um, judges and judicial assistants have what we call all access. They can get into more areas of the building than anybody else. Okay. And the badges aren't supposed to be given out to other people to use to move around the courthouse? No, sir. It defeats the whole uh, concept of having the, the access levels. And there are many, many access levels. At the time, if you know, at the time that Justin Haynes uh, well, first, let me ask this. The elevator, the secure elevator, opens, you said, into the clerk's office? Yes, sir. It opens up. There's not a hall there because it's a private, non-public area. The elevator just opens up into the clerk's area. If you look straight ahead, you look down the long hall of all the clerk cubicle and work areas there, right behind the, the uh, counter. If you, look, if you look up to the left, there's some, some boxes. And if you go more to the left, it takes you down to the criminal clerk's area. And there's clerks generally walking back and forth, putting things in mailboxes. I'm doing business there. Okay, so it's a non-public area of the clerk's office that it accesses. Yes, sir. It's it's on the it's on the rear side of the counter, so the public can't get into that area. And it's restricted because there's confidential files and things like that. Absolutely, and for security too. Okay. Um, were you made aware of concerns about Judge Hobbs' JA providing assistance? to Judge Hobbs's, uh, the, the mother of Judge Hobbs's grandchild in filing an injunction? A absolutely. Okay, and how did you become aware of that? Uh, I do not recall. I'm not sure if the chief judge brought it to me or another judge. I, I really can't recall. Uh, but I, I do know that when I, I, I found out the chief judge either instructed me or if he brought the issue to me, he told me at that time to, to look into it, to get more information to find out what happened. Okay. And did you look into it? Uh, absolutely. Okay, so what, what, um, what did you find out? Well, the, the first thing I do when there's an issue like that, it was something that had occurred um, uh, maybe a, a day, two or so previously. And so I had to, to figure out how can, I, how can I see what happened, whether someone came and went. And there's generally two ways that you can do it. Number one, there's security cameras on the elevator and security cameras outside the elevator. We're in a very secure building. And um, I can get access um, through other parties to see those security videos or see what happened on the video. The second thing is we talked about our secure badge access and I can get records pulled um, from a vendor um, about who went through what door at what time. So you can usually, if you take those two things and sync them up, you can get a really good picture of how people came and went because you can see someone walking and then you can see, okay, this person used this badge at this time, like at the door that I'm looking at and you can really quickly piece together what happened. OK. 
Okay, so you were able to determine using the various sources of information uh, what? That um, um, as far as the, there was a protective injunction um, and um, I saw a, a woman come up, go in the office, um, and then uh, I saw Ken Kent, who's a, a deputy clerk, uh, come up with no papers in his hand, went into an office, was there for a while, maybe, I'm not sure how long, but it was maybe 20, 30 minutes or 15 minutes. It was a, it was a fairly lengthy period of time. Um, and then he came back out, and this time he was carrying papers, and uh, went down, went, walked down the hall like he was leaving. Um, and then a short while later, if you watch the video long enough, um, he came back again. He came back again with papers in his hand, went into the office another time, and then came back out of the office. So I believe he had two visits um, to the office. Um, later, I saw Miss Ware and um, the other lady, Miss Parks, uh, or Rosa, I'm sorry, Christine Rosa, go downstairs and um, together. So they, they left and went down the hall too. So there's a lot of comings and goings in a short period of time. All right, now, uh, Mr. Sladen, if you would, and for the members, uh, turn to tab 19 uh, in, the, in the JQC binder. It says 8-20-2019, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. cameras access record and video records. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, is this, was this produced as part of your investigation into, um, into that incident? Uh, absolutely, these are the documents that are produced. They're produced by the trial court marshal Bill Wills at my request. Okay, so this is a, a combination of the surveillance footage and the badge access data sort of put together into a timeline yes right? sir okay and in in reviewing what you said the uh, that ms ware and, and ms rosa exit the chambers at uh, it looks like 247 48 do you see that yes sir okay um and then further down um at 432 uh, Ken Kent, uh, oh, I'm sorry, at 406, Ken Kent uh, is uh, entering the chambers. Is that what you're referring to when you say you observed him entering chambers? Yes, sir. That was the, the first time. It says here, W.O. Papers without papers. Okay. So did you um, have a chance to speak with Mr. Kent to determine what he was doing there? Yes, I did. The very next thing I did after I saw it myself and while this was being prepared, um, I contacted him because I wanted to ask him w what was happening. Okay, what did he tell you? He was very reluctant to talk to me. Um, he he, he you know, didn't want to talk to me. He said he didn't want to get involved um, in the situation. And, and I said, I, I need to know. I'm, 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 I'm trying to find some information. I'm directed by the chief judge, I need to know. And he, he shared with me it was some paperwork involved with a protective um, injunction. The protective injunction involving Ms. Rosa? Yes, sir. Is that unusual? Uh, first of all, what is Mr. Ken Kent's position, if you know? He, he is a, uh, uh, he's over the civil division. He's the, the chief civil clerk. Um, I consider him sort of my peer or counterpart um, for the elected clerk of court. He's in a high level position of trust and would take care of you know, sensitive issues. Is that, is that an unusual sort of thing? If you know, for well, I, well, absolutely. I, I think that you know that's the reason I called him because it was extremely unusual. If, if Ken Kent routinely walked in and out of judges' offices all the time with paperwork, that's one thing. But if it was done contemporaneous with you know filing a protective injunction, it it, it, it just that's why I wanted to talk to him and find out what was happening. Okay. And did he indicate to you at all if it was an unusual circumstance? Uh, no, absolutely. He didn't want to talk about it. He was very hesitant um, to talk about it. And uh, again. He said, if, if any, in fact, I remember him telling me, if there's any way possible, I can keep my name out of this thing. And, you know, at the time I thought that might be possible. Did he say who he met with in Judge Hobbs' chambers? Was, was he, he didn't go into detail about it, what happened in the chambers or something. Okay. Let's, let's change gears a little bit uh, and talk to us about the employment situation and status for judicial assistants. Are they, how are they paid? Uh, who supervises them, et cetera? Yes, sir. Well, um, judicial assistants are in a very unique position. They're a state employee. However, they're also personal staff to the judge. 
And uh, the personnel regulations manual has a special section right at, right at the front, I think it's 12, pages 12 to 14, because I refer to it fairly often. And um, it, 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 it covers the unique rules that apply to a judicial assistant. So the, the judge has absolutely authority over the hiring and firing of the judicial assistant. It's not the chief judge's purview, it's not my purview as chief executive officer, it is the, the presiding judge for that personal staff. Um, and uh, strangely, because they are personal staff, a lot of the rules don't apply to them. Things like Fair Labor Standards Act, Family Medical Leave Act, even ADA is personal staff. But all the statutory things do apply as far as work hours and accounting for your time and following other rules. But there are some federal statutes that they're exempt from as elected as personal staff to elected officials. Okay, but the long and the short of it is that the the JAs are personal staff to the judge. They're hired and fired at the discretion of the judge. They're yes, sir, they report directly to the, their judge. Um, and their judge, in fact, doesn't even have to do performance evaluations. The, the, the judge can determine how they review, if at all, the performance of their individual JA. So in a sense, they're outside the system to that regard. So I, and I apologize, but did you say they are except, exempted from performance evaluation? Yes, sir. The, the, all state court employees are required to do an annual performance evaluation for all their subordinates. Um, and it's a very lengthy process. You review how they did for the previous year, and then you come up with a plan of how they do for the future year, and you rate them. And um, it's a complicated process. Judges do not have to do that or use that form. Some judges do, um, some do not. Okay. And, and so judges in, their, in reviewing their JAs do not have to do an evaluation? No, not, not at all. It's not required. And it's in that section of the um, personnel manual that describes their, the, how judges or uh, JAs are different than other staff. Okay. And what about training? Is, it, is the judge responsible for teaching the JA about ethical responsibilities under Canon 3C or is someone, someone else supposed to teach the JAs about ethics? Well, as far as personal staff, ultimately the judge is responsible for that. And um, uh, we do offer training. I have a training program um, every month. I provide training to my staff um, in person. We do it in a usually large courtroom. We call it an all staff meeting. And we have some block of instruction or some training. JAs are not required to come. We send the information out about all staff trainings. But they're not required to come because I can't require them to come. They're not my employees. Um, and it's very similar to uh, the way you run an Army unit. Um, well, one, one month, the training session may be on equal employment opportunity. Uh, another month, the training may be on sexual harassment, um, and, and so on and so on. Ethics, we have a block on ethics I do annually. So we, we offer that training to the, to the, to the court. And um, again, we try to make sure all our staff attend. I have my personnel officer um, keep a, a log of who came to what training, so she'll check off who came to what training or something, especially so some of the things that can get you in trouble and make sure that they got that training. So, And you said this is available to JAs, but they're not required, but they're notified of it? They're notified of it, and sometimes they come, um, but, but I would say the vast majority do not come. It's not something that most avail themselves of. Do, do you recall seeing um, Judge Hobbs' JA present? I, I, I wouldn't recall. I, I, I wouldn't think so. I can think of one that comes fairly often, um, and then another one I've seen at a fair amount. It was not Judy Ware, though, but I mean, it's possible. Okay. What about specific division training? So Judge Hobbs was new, again, to the family division. Um, and you know who's who's supposed to be teaching the judges and their JAs the ins and outs not of the fundamental law, the black letter law about family, but the uh, you know here's how to file this and here's what we do with these. Um, who's who's in charge of teaching um, them how to do that? Well, we have a we have a training program that we do. We um, based on the. Uh, Florida Rules of General pra Practice and Judicial Administration, there's a requirement that uh, circuit judges are assigned to various divisions and rotate. And so we do have a training program set up um, for the, when, when they do those rotations, we have a training program set up. That occurs every two years, so the rotations just happened recently. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll offer that. I'll have my case managers and juvenile meet with the new juvenile judge and go over procedures with them and work with them, answer any questions they have, maybe sit with them the first couple times in court. Um, we'll do that in the criminal. We'll do that with our case managers, especially about specialty stuff like drug court, uh, mental health services, um, those kinds of things. 
Um, and the same with family court. We'll do the same thing at family court. We'll get my case manager involved and, and, and have them um, uh, talk to the judge and work through that process. Is that Kim Stevens? Yeah, Kim, for family court, it'd be Kim Stevens. She's my director of the family courts. She's the director of family courts. And so head of the case managers for family court. So she would be tasked with training Judge Hobbs or her JA on, on what exactly? Absolutely. Uh, no, on what exactly? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, various things. So you may use a different case management system, so make sure that they know how to get into the case management system and use that. So the, the software? The software, yes, sir. The computer software that we've got for either the clerk or the court. Um, there would be, now we've added Zoom training. That's where, you know, we give people Zoom training. Um, they'd be training on procedures and how things work. Um, things they may need to know, just an introduction to who their staff are, who can you ask questions, who are, who are your case managers assigned to your division, and what are the, some of the common problems or issues they have. Okay, so the procedures of the division, but they don't teach them the law. Is that well, they're, are, are, they're not qualified to teach the law. They're, they're, they're case managers, they're not attorneys. And so Ms. Stevens would be in charge of training. Did she, uh, in fact, train Judge Hobbs or? encounter difficulties what what happened well I, I there actually were some difficulties i mean i, I remember one of the issues there was some grumbling um, about how things were going um, in, in the new division and I, I i remember saying hey you know J judge hobbs has some distractions obviously let's try to make sure we get her some training or do some training um and kim stevens is, is the ultimate consummate professional she said I'll, I'll offer training we'll do training and we'll try to figure out training for her and 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 um, she attempted to try to set up training on a few locations, and she would brief me at our manager's meetings. We have a stand-up weekly, and then every other week we have a sit-down meeting for you know an hour and a half, two hours, and go through with all my managers, and that was a topic that came up. They were trying to coordinate the training, um, and, and they were having some difficulty doing that. Well, what was the difficulty? Um, just getting uh, a hold of Judge Hobbs. She had a very uh, tough schedule right then, and like I said, she had a lot of distractions and a lot of, a lot of disturbances in her personal life. Right. Then I remember um, they also trained a judicial assistant, so they were trying to work with Judy Ware and set up training for Judy Ware, and that would be a, a easier to do because the JA generally is there more than the judge. The judge may be on the bench a lot, the judge might be traveling for, for professional reasons, and then you throw on top the personal tragedies that, you know, Judge Hobbs had suffered. Okay, it's, but was there ever a time when training was set up to between Ms. Stevens and Judge Hobbs? I, I believe there there was at several occasions where training was either attempted to be coordinated or coordinated, um, and again, they had trouble making the training happen. Did Ms. Stevens ever relate to you any reason why she was unable to train with Judge Hobbs? Um, she, she did talk at one time about trouble that she had with, with setting up training. She, she, she was very frustrated um, and said that the judge had to leave or wasn't available for an appointment or a time that they had talked about or had set up. Okay. Did she say why? Um, she relayed to me later why. I don't remember at the time whether she told me or not. When did you first become aware of problems with Judge Hobbs timely handling matters in the family division? Um, it was about the same time where you have these managers meetings that, you know, things are slipping through the cracks, there's some issues, they're having trouble setting up training. At the same time, there's some issues with some cases that aren't getting processed or signed timely. Um, there was some thought maybe um, Judy Ware needed some training on e-filing um, just to make sure that's happening. Um, just, so there were, there were various, just a concern, a sort of grumbling around that things weren't going very well. Again, you know, knowing that the judge was distracted by family tragedy, you want to figure out, you know, can we get her some training, get her JA some training, just get things back on track again. Okay. And at some point, did the case managers come to see you with specific concerns? Well, after bringing it up at managers' meetings and talking some at passing in the hall, um, one evening um, I had three individuals appear at my door. It was right around 5 o'clock. I wanted to go home. And uh, they showed up at my door with a, with a tale about these emergency matters that weren't being resolved. Okay. And so what did you, what were the, first of all, what were their concerns generally? Well, well they, they came in and said, hey, we've, we've got some emergency matters. And there were cases where emergencies had been filed um, on behalf of parties and family law cases. And so it might be things like a uh, 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 paternity case or dissolution case, maybe someone needs it. And this is very common in that arena. You have a lot of uh, filings of emergency matters, but 
You'd have cases where um, uh, somebody needs child support right away. Someone wants custody of the kid for whatever reason or something. A kid is not being treated the way they should be treated or there's uh, other issues at, at play. And so they, they want a judge to make a decision quickly because a situation like that can fester and get out of control. Um, so, so they'll file an emergency request. Um, and then the judge can determine whether it's a true emergency and whether they should intervene right then or not. But it takes a judge's discretion and judgment to, to make that call. And so in terms of emergency motions, uh, in, a, in a brief manner, can you explain the difference between a regular motion and an emergency motion in the family context? And, and I know it's a compound question, but in, in addition to the difference, tell us if you track that uh, in terms of keeping a watch on how soon those are ruled on. Well, the, well, the clerk will have a, a, a queue um, for emergency cases, so they'll go into some sort of queue um, when they come in, and that's so that they don't get dropped or don't get forgotten or something. And then we've got case managers that get the cases, and they'll make annotations and say, oh, this case is emergency or this needs to be done. So you've got a case manager that'll, that'll tickle the case in some way to follow up and make sure that that case was resolved. But in terms of determining the actual, whether it's an emergency or not, that's the judge's responsibility? Yes, sir. The, the, the parties may declare emergency on the case, and, and you'll have a lot of parties will do that sometimes to get, you know, expedited resolution. And so a fair amount of cases, especially in the family arena, will say emergency pleading on it. Um, but the judge is the one that makes the determination whether there's a true emergency or not. Okay, at some point after uh, meeting with the case managers, um, did you happen to enter Judge Hobbs's chambers uh, and see one of those case managers sitting there before Judge Hobbs? Well, well yes, sir. Um, Tell us about that. Okay, so I was um, just going up the visiting offices. I can't remember why now, but I was walking around just visiting various judges' offices. Um, and I remember going into Judge Hobbs' office, you know, going in with my badge, and okay, there's a judge in the back, went in the back, and I believe the judge was there and um, Judy Ware and um, Rhonda Harris. And I, I remember I said, hey, Your Honor, I got good news or something. It was good news I was walking around with. And, and Was it a raise? Yeah, later someone was telling me that we had actually gotten raises from the legislature. I was handing out post-its with the raise so they could tell their, their JA um, about raises. But, but um, so I went in and, 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 and said, hey, Your Honor, I've got good news. And if Judge Hobbs was sitting at the, uh, her desk um, in front of a long conference table, and uh, Rhonda Harris was sort of off to the left here, and she looked very upset and defensive, and when I said, hey, Your Honor, um, I've got good news for you, Rhonda Harris jumped up and ran out of the room um, and said, I'll see you later, Your Honor, and just ran out of the room, which I thought was extremely odd, because she is usually very professional, not shaken, and would not be so unprofessional to leave a room like that. Would you say she looked stressed? I think at the time, but that could be reinforced because I saw her a few minutes later and she was definitely stressed. So, I mean, that sort of just reinforced my feeling as something really odd was up. Okay, so tell us what happened when you saw her a few minutes later. Well, I, I went uh, back downstairs uh, to my offices and I saw Rhonda Harris sort of just out in front of my offices on the second floor secure corridor which was really odd because she works on the third floor, she has to work on the second floor. And I, I saw her and I said, hey, are you okay? And just, you know, walking down the hall, are you doing okay? What, what, what's up with that? Or something, and that's when she started telling me about the, how uncomfortable she was, the situation she felt she was placed in. So what exactly did she say had happened? She told me that she was in the office, um, had been summoned to the office, or was in the office, and uh, Judge um, Hobbs had some paperwork in her hand and was asking specific questions um, from that paperwork about how did they know this or how did they know that. And by they, Rhonda said she was referring to the JTC. Okay. After you have this conversation with Ms. Harris, um, did you go to the Chief Judge uh, Sostrom about this? A absolutely, incident? absolutely. And, and what was the outcome? What wound up happening with Ms. Harris? Well, that was uh, independent. That was my decision. Okay, so um, tell so, us about your decision, please. So, uh, so I went to the chief judge and talked to him, um, but the first thing I want to do is just protect my staff um, and get my staff out of harm's way. So I, I quickly uh, sent Rhonda home for the day. I told her, just go home, just leave, um, and don't answer the phone. Um, if anyone calls you, just go home, except me. 
um, and then um, met with my staff real quick, uh, both a criminal staff and a, a family staff and my HR person, and figured out is there a way we can reorganize what we do and send Rhonda Harris to a different location. So can we send her to work in a different place because she was assigned to Judge Hobbs. Uh, the case managers generally worked for two family judges back then. Um, so she was assigned to Judge Hobbs and would have interactions with her all the time. And I thought at the time that would be best. That would protect Rhonda. That would protect the court. That would protect Judge Hobbs. Let's just get her out of the situation so you know we don't have her constantly placed in a situation like that for any party. Okay. So when you said you um, got her out of harm's way, what, what exactly did that mean? Where, where did she wind up being moved to or transferred? And, and I should say got her out of potential harm's way. Exactly. It, you, 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 you don't know, but you don't want to take that risk. Uh, we transferred her to Gadsden County, and it was tricky because I had to do it without telling the principals why I was doing it because I, I didn't want to relay why we're doing it. So it was very tricky trying to organize why are we moving these people. Um, I brought someone back, I believe it was Barbara Hedick, um, back to, to Leon County, and then Rhonda Harris would start working up in Gadsden County, um, and so we had to work that piece out. I had to talk to judges in Gadsden County because that impacts you know, who their case manager is or being assigned. Um, we had to work out uh, mileage issues for Rhonda because she didn't have to travel, so you know, we had to work the financial piece out um, to, for her to now start traveling up there, incurring additional expense. Um, and so, it, and then of course, you know, figuring out what their new duties and responsibilities are, coordinating training, having people go up and train there, and having someone come and train here. And then it was uh, more trouble later because um, we had some other issues in the office that caused, we had to move some other people. So it's sort of a cascading effect ultimately over several months of just moving things around in pieces. Would you say it was a significant disruption to the administrative circuit? Well, well it, it was, but it was necessary. I just thought, again, it protects all the parties um, and it protects the court. One moment, please. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick question I've been meaning to ask? Go ahead. It's driving me crazy. Sir, can you tell me, is uh, Miss Ware, is she still employed with Judge Hobbs? Yes, yeah, she is. Okay, thank you. I don't have anything further. All right, any cross-examination? Good afternoon, Mr. Slade. Hey, sir. All right. <coughs> Just have some questions for you on your testimony that you've just provided. Um, and uh, just a few other things, too. Um, you and Judge Shustrom uh, had a practice of meeting every morning, if possible, correct? Yes, sir. If possible, we'd meet each morning and talk over what would happen that day. Okay, and there may be things that come up that the two of you need to talk about, and that's when that would happen. Yes, sir. That, so think it was a standing practice. I meet with them every morning. I've done that for several years now, um, unless one of us isn't there, which is rare. Um, and then as where things arise, if it rises to a certain level, like you know, an F, a, a level that could cause issues for the court, I'll, I'll try to catch him throughout the day. And that happens more often than you'd think. Right, you, you've, you've indicated that you got certain documents um, at Judge Shustrom's request. Now, did you personally get those documents? Um, no, sir. Sometimes I would, but more often than not, I would get those documents from someone else. So, for example, um, if it was the probable cause, I might contact the jail, uh, talk to a captain or chief there and get that document, or I might contact the MIS folks that have it in the computer system and get the document. If it's uh, time badge or video stuff, I might get that from the trial court marshal, or if he's unavailable, contact the vendor, Sonatrol, directly. Okay, would you identify the trial court marshal, please? Yeah, it's Bill Wills. Okay. Um, 
when Judge Schuster asked you to get these documents or videos, whatever it was, would it be in writing? Did he put it in writing? No, no, it wouldn't be. He would just usually, as very typical, um, we, 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 we don't do a lot of conversations or information like that in writing. It's just verbal conversations. I need this and this, or I need that information. And, you know, I'll brief on what's happening for that day. I may have my calendar in front of me to refresh recollection for the week's events. Uh, but then I'll usually just run off and go get what he wants. And that would be a reason to bring it back to him, not wait till the next morning, but bring it right away. It's something he's asked for, so obviously it's important. So is it fair to say that he would verbally ask you for something, you would get it, bring it back to him? Yes, sir. Okay, would you at any point in time prepare a written report on what you had gotten or your procedure in getting it? Not a report. I mean, sometimes for sake of clarity, I want like, like this um, chart that's exhibit 19, I want something for clarity if it's complex information that he may want to evaluate himself, you know, for, 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 for to use. And the same with the probable cause, those things. It's not a report. Um, again, it's very ad hoc. I, I think one of the things about court administration that people don't understand is very operational. I mean, we probably put out a dozen fires a day. Um, and by fires, I mean like a, a hot issue you're trying to fix right then. And uh, so things are flying quick and you're working fast, trying to get information, trying to you know, satisfy whether it's judges calling about things, other elected officials, attorneys, media, you're just, you're just working trying to get things done. So if you would not have anything here in writing today, it would be based on your memory? As far as the... It's what you recall as to what happened during certain circumstances, what the judge asked you to do. In other words, would you remember verbatim or you would have to just summarize it? Well, some things are, 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 you know, were, were written contemporaneously. For example, the email that I sent to the JQC in early right. October. Right, I'm saying things that are not written. No, it's just, it would be based on, on, on memory, yes, sir. Okay. Now, when, when um, Chief Judge would talk to other judges. Then uh, he would have you to be in the room sometimes? Yes, sir. So it was a, a practice um, that started a, a, a few years before. Um, and he thought it was best that there be some uh, a witness or somebody available um, in the room, um, just in case anything dramatic might happen, or, or just to, to be in the room as a witness. And this was the third instance with a judge that I was asked to do that. All right, sir. You, um, indicated that you had um, talked with a, an, an individual at the jail about Judge Haas visiting her son. And yes, sir. You indicated that it was probably Major Lee or I, Chief I, I, Lee. Yeah, I believe Ed Lee, Major Ed Lee, or Chief Lee now. He was the assistant jail director, I believe. If you will look at uh, Judge Hobbs Exhibit 2, which is in the white book. My books are messed up. Here's Sorry. Okay, you see that's, that's dated August the 2nd. 2019, 8, 19 a.m. From, yes, you, from you to Edward Lee. Yes, sir. And you indicate in that first sentence that Judge Hogg was unable to make the video visitation work last night. Mm -hmm. Now, what type of communication did you have with uh, Judge Hobbs that night? Was it by text, telephone? I, I don't recall, um, but I, I, I don't recall now, but I just remember she was frustrated it was not working for her like they told me it would. Do you recall if uh, she notified you 
that she was going to be leaving town for about a week? I, I don't recall. If you will um, look again at the uh, JQC Exhibit 30, two-page document, I think it's on the left, on the table on the left. I'm sorry, your right, on the table on your right. Yeah. <laughs> um, talking points. Um, you uh, testified that you gave that to Judge Shistrom and uh, he had those talking points before him when he talked with uh, Judge Hobbs, correct? Yes, sir. Did you maintain a copy with you while he was talking with uh, Judge Hobbs? Uh, I probably had a copy in my hand. I probably had one too. Just because if he wants to ask me, that's standard practice. If he wants to ask me questions about a document, I hand him. I have one too, so he can say, hey, what about this? I can see, what did I write? But I mean, I just wrote this document shortly before meeting with him, so it was very fresh in my mind, too. Did you have a copy during the time that he was talking with Judge Hobbs? I probably did, but I was not referring to it. Okay. I, I was staring at the floor the entire time. Well, you testified that um, it appeared that Judge Shistrom had gone down the items on the talking points. And that's why I'm trying to see if you had that document before you, looking at it as he was going through the points well, to, to be able to state that. I, I, I believe so. I mean, I had just typed the document shortly before that and then went through the points. And as he went through, you know, I can remember the points were in there that we put in. I had added the Canon 2B and 3B9 uh, about the attorney stuff, about you know letting others handle that thing. I mean, all this stuff. Even Alex Williams, I, I put all that information in there. I had typed this document out. I all mean, right. shortly before handing it to him. All right. And I thought through my head, what would I want to tell, you know, a judge in a similar circumstance? All right. Let's move to um, Judge Hobbs visiting her son at the uh, Leon County Detention Facility. Did you express a concern about Judge Hobbs' safety with personally going out to the facility? Absolutely. Um, one of the first things she talked about was visiting the jail. And I remember talking to them, and, and I remember just in my own sense, too, that was a bad idea. It's probably not a good idea to, to send Judge Hobbs to the jail in person. You would be in the waiting area. You'd be with uh, families of uh, people that are incarcerated. You'd be other people in the waiting area. Um, it could potentially be dangerous for the judge um, and also it could cause a disruption or an issue, you know, that the staff would have to deal with. So it just it did not seem like a good idea. And that's why I was casting about for some other option, um, the video option. She, she, she didn't want to talk to the telephone. Um, I remember saying that, but I also think, you know, the mom wanted to see her son and see how he's doing or something. So it made sense to me. Okay. Um, Mr. Slayton, are you positive that Judge Hobbs came to you, or you brought it up to her? I think Judge Hobbs came to me. I don't think I would, I would volunteer connecting her to her son at the, at the jail. I, don't, I, don't, I, I usually wait for judges to come to me for requests for service and, and then act on it accordingly and try to do my best to get them what they need. All right, sir. Uh, regarding the video uh, visitation that was available at the sheriff's office at that time, did you consider that to be preferential or special treatment? No, not at all. I think that's why it was a good system because it was available to anybody. You uh, indicated in your testimony that Judge Hobbs asked you if 
the conversations were recorded and, and whether there was a different method available to visit her son. Why did you determine that the, and you use the word implication, was that she was asking you to find an unmonitored method? Well, it just it, the question came up. I was talking to her about using this method, and she said that she didn't want to use the phones, and do you think this thing would be recorded too, or something along those lines. So again, it just seemed like the, the implication that somebody could listen in, she wanted to, to try to talk to her son in a method where perhaps someone couldn't listen in or observe, and, and it, was, it was the way she phrased it to me, it just, it, 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 it troubled me. Right, since, since you thought it was an implication, uh, did you confirm with Judge Hobbs that she wanted you to find an unmonitored method to visit with her son? No, I did not. And uh, you gave uh, Judge Hobbs the name of your contact person at the uh, Leon County Sheriff's Office to, for the visitation, correct? Yes, sir, I, I gave her information so she could you know, work with them directly. If, if she had any trouble using the video system, you could contact this person and work that directly. Uh, do you know if Judge Hobbs ever made contact with that person? I, I have no idea, I, I don't know. I was told to drop the issue later the morning of the second by the chief judge and I dropped the issue like a hot potato. All right, thank you, sir. Now let's, let's move to um, the area of Judge Hobbs' judicial assistant assisting with the filing of uh, injunction, petition for injunction. Were you told as to the parties involved in that injunction when you check this information out? I, I had known sometime that day about the filing of an injunction or some, some information, I believe. So, so when we heard that somebody was there, I was already looking to see what, what had happened. So that had happened maybe a day or two before, and there had been an injunction filed. In fact, if I recall now, there were like counter injunctions or something. There were injunctions on both sides, um, two different women um, against each other or something. So, so I, I knew there was something to do with injunctions or filing of paperwork. All right, so let me, let me make sure I'm clear on this. Probably two injunctions filed, but when you got into it, do you recall if both of the injunctions had already been filed? I can't recall it, tell you the truth. If you will look at JQC Exhibit 19, which is in the Black Book. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you indicated that um, this document shows uh, coming and goings of Miss Ware and Miss Rosa and also of Ken Kent. Yes, sir. Did you find out as to whether Miss Rosa filed the petition? Well, I, I, I didn't think that was the issue. So I didn't ultimately see who filed it at the counter. I don't have cameras in the clerk's office, and I didn't think that was the issue. All right, when you question Ken Kent, 
did he indicate that he was filing a p petition for Ms. Rosa or it had already been filed? I don't think he indicated he was filing it. He indicated that they had to fix it or do something and he was carrying paperwork back and forth to the office while they did that. Did you trans or was that an implication to you that Ken Kent was assisting them with preparing the paperwork? Absolutely. The, the, the number one person over all the civil courts, which includes the family courts, was hand carrying documents back and forth from the judge's chambers where the judge and the JA were present and a party was present in the same chambers. And so the, the twice, the, 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 again, the number two person in the clerk's office is walking back and forth carrying filing paperwork to and from an office with the judge, the JA, and a party present. All right, so if you will look at um, the time of 356, you see where Christine Rosa exit the chambers. Yes, sir. And then if you would look at the, client, the time of 406, Ken Kent. Yes, sir. With, enters without papers. Mm -hmm. So they were not in the office at the same time. Yes, sir. It looks like that's clear. Okay. So your testimony that they were together is not quite correct, is it? Yes, sir. The party was there with Judy Ware and the judge. The party left, and then Kent Kent showed up um, and left, and then showed up and left again with Judge Hobbs and Judy Ware there. You are correct. Were you aware that that particular day that there were problems with the clerk's office and Judge Hobbs' office with the petitions for injunctions in terms of the um, software where they would email it back and forth and and Judy Ware was having problems with using the system? No, it was not. Were you aware that Ken Kent was taking filed petitions and signed orders to and from Judge Hobbs' office that afternoon? No, Ken Ken didn't inform me of that. He said they had to fix something or adjust something in paperwork. <clears throat> Did he indicate it was specifically Christine Rosa's petition? Yes, he was very hesitant to talk about going to and from a judge's office. If he was just carrying a case file up to be signed, which would be unusual for Ken Kent, the head person of the civil clerk, to do that personally. But if he was doing that, he wouldn't have been hesitant to tell me about I was going up to do that. He would have just told me he was doing that. He wouldn't have said, I don't want my name mentioned. Can you keep my name out of this? I mean, he was very hesitant to talk to me in the first place about it, which if it had been a simple explanation like that, that, that wouldn't make any sense to me. Well, Sir, just to clarify, did you assume this dealt with Ms. Rosa, or did he actually say that these papers are from Ms. Ro or involved Ms. Rosa? He, he said the papers were involved Ms. Rosa, yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Layden, um, were you aware that the Third Circuit judge was handling petitions involving those Miss Rosa and uh, the, the young lady, the other young lady? Y yes, as the, as the cases came in, and there were a bunch of them, uh, we worked to get them assigned to a Third Circuit judge. That was something handled by the Supreme Court. And then the state attorney, wherever their involvement was, that was ordered by the governor. So we're very aware that cases as they came in and were filed, they would then be transferred, but each case had to be individually identified and transferred. So it wasn't like a standing order. Any case involving any individual would go there. 
um, a new order would come out, and I remember at one point we had to add, keep adding the case numbers to some requests so that the right case numbers got on there to transfer jurisdiction in the appropriate case. Do you know the process that the clerk would take ordinarily uh, with a case, let's, let's use this one, a petition for injunction being filed with Second Circuit and it was supposed to be handled by a judge in the Third Circuit. Do you know if the process would be to actually file it in the Second Circuit and then transfer it to the Third Circuit? I'm not sure of the process. I believe it is a Second Circuit case and it is not filed with a Third Circuit clerk. It still stays in the Second Circuit, but it gets sent to that judge. We, we've got cases right now we're dealing with too. Um, again, where the, the, the jurisdiction has been changed um, so it's a judge out of county is, or out of circuit assigned, but the clerk still handles the paperwork and the judge still comes to our court to perform the court event. So it's still a second circuit case. It's just being handled by a judge from another circuit since all our judges have recused themselves. Or the Supreme Court has made the determination to send the case to another jurisdiction. And that's a, that's a fairly routine practice. I mean, we do it fairly often. All right. Sir, are you aware that um, Judge Hobbs was the duty judge that particular day? I, I recall she was the duty judge and it had to go to another judge. That was one of those fires I talked about. Who, who do you send it to or where do you send it? I remember that now. So it would not be unusual for other petitions for injunction to come to her? It is very possible, yes sir. In fact, I'd say it's probable. Uh, let's move to the uh, yes. Oh. Let's move to the uh, security badge situation. Uh, you, you indicated that um, one of the deputy clerks. Um, had contacted you about seeing Judge Hobbs' son in, in the restricted elevator. And that's when you performed the investigation on that. Yes, sir. And they said they, and they would recognize him because he worked there um, for some period of time. So they knew who he was. The doors opened. It was reported he was on the elevator and um, had, had them concerned. He had, he had recently been terminated by the clerk's office, um, was our understanding. And then, you know, he had a, a serious felony charge involving a firearm uh, recently, and all those things put together, I think the clerks were very concerned, and they stated so. Do you recall if this incident occurred on October the 3rd, 2019? I can't recall now. I mean, there's probably documents in here that would tell me the date. It would be contemporaneous with the counseling on it. So it would be, you know, the, the, if it occurred, um, we found out about it, um, or we found out about it immediately, then it would probably the counseling would have been shortly thereafter, I would think, just knowing how the chief judge operates. Okay, well, let's, let's move to the counseling session with uh, the uh, judicial assistant, Judy Ware. Yes, when, when Judge Schuster met with Judge Hobbs, do you recall if uh, Judge Hobbs told Judge Schuster that she was not in town during the incident of the security badge? Yes, I, I, remember, I remember her saying something like that and the judge said, regardless, it's your responsibility to supervise your staff. And then he asked her to counsel her.
when I, when I was sorry, just, I'm just thinking out loud now, I believe she was at some JQC thing or something related to that, I think. I'm, I'm just trying to recall back to what she said. But she, she, I remember she said she was not present in the building. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you stated here today that Ms. Ware's body language and demeanor was one of contempt. What type of body language are you talking about? Well, it, it, you know, I've been in the business of counseling people for a long time, 32 years in the Army, up to the rank of Colonel. I have counseled hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, and I'm usually, I've gotten fairly adept at reading people's body language, people's attitude when they come in the room. It's the first thing you do is you look at someone and try to figure out where they're coming from. And she came in the room, she, you know, threw her head back, um, had her arms crossed at one point, um, uh, just the look on her face was, I don't want to be here, um, sat back in a chair, you know, sort of just the whole manner was, was not the manner I would show in front of a chief judge, a, a circuit judge. Mr. Layton, you just indicated that that's based on your years in the military service. Would you not agree that military service is different from civilian? Oh, oh, absolutely it is, and, and that's one of the, the things I think I've been very successful at is, 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 is taking what I had from military service and being able to apply that to the civilian world. Um, my manner, my, my leadership style, uh, the way I deal with employees, completely different. Um, but just, you know, basic, you know, trying to look at someone's body language, their demeanor, their tone, when they're talking, how they're responding when someone's talking. I mean, that is, that's the same. You know, you're evaluating how people act in front of someone, and that was just not respectful at all, the way she presented herself to the chief judge of the Second Judicial Circuit. Was that not also based upon your military career as to how someone should act? I think it was just based on how someone should appear before a, 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 a circuit judge. I mean, it's just, it's just there's a certain amount of respect and decorum that you give, you know, anyone in that position of authority. They're elected by the people. They're representatives of the law. I mean, I, I think you just show them you do respect, even if you're not happy with what they do, you or, or how they're what they're going to do to you. You just show them a certain amount of respect. It's it's the reason we're wearing a tie and coats in here today, and you know. Regarding uh, the JA's response to Judge Shustrom, um, do you think that response may have been directed towards you and not Judge Shustrom? I, I think someone's to me, the judge did all the talking. I did no talking at all. And um, she, she sort of like sneered and then um, said, oh, y'all or something like that. And then she said, um, to me that I'm, I'm kicking her butt or something, like didn't make any sense to me. And um, you're just sitting over there kicking her butt. And he's like, the judge, the chief should say, wait, what, what do you mean, what, what? And then she just got up and walked out of the room, like just left in mid conversation. And the chief just looked at me stunned. Like, I don't know, know what he wanted to do. Now, I'll tell you the difference between the military. If it was the military, I would have gone and gotten that employee and brought him back in the room. But you don't run that like a military unit. Uh, let's go to the three cases um, with untimely decisions. Yes, sir. And you stated that, or you testified that it was toward the end of the day and um, court employees brought, brought these three cases to your attention. Yes, sir. I was sitting in my office and three employees showed up at the door. Did you do any background check on those three cases? Look at the Absolutely. Docket? I mean, they presented information to me when the case was filed, what the status of the case was, what they'd done to try to effectuate the case or get the case signed. So, I mean, I've, I've, they, they described each of the three in detail to me. 
And because they're emergency matters, and I know that we've been having an ongoing concern, it raised it as a high profile issue that I was unfortunately gonna have to deal with that night. Uh, Mr. Slade, you were aware that uh, Judge Hobbs' mother passed in August, correct? Absolutely, and I, I put that in my statement to the JQC that the chief judge directed me to send. I think I put that as the last sentence or last couple sentences somewhere in there because she experienced a lot of tragedies. I mean, that, that, that's a reason you know, to, to, to maybe have some issues like that. Yes, sir. In the case of, in the interest of J.R., um, and I'm using initials since they are children. Yes, sir. Um, the emergency petition for temporary custody by extended family was filed on August 26th and Judge Hobbs' mother passed the following day. Yes, sir. Were you aware that her mother passed on the 27th or just generally aware that her mother passed? I knew that her mother had passed a few weeks previously. Like I said, I, I put that in my email communication to the JQC because I consider that somewhat mitigating. Did you, were you aware that she returned about two weeks later on or about September 16, 2019? I wasn't sure when she came back. I just, okay. Were you aware that she was not in the office when this emergency motion came in? It, it's very possible, but again, judges aren't when they come in. I mean, that's why you have a judicial assistant there. Okay, let me ask you this, sir. If she was not there, would the duty judge handle that emergency petition? If the judicial assistant took it to them or you know, said, hey, there's an emergency, it's pending, we need to get this resolved, the duty judge could hear that case, absolutely. When the clerk sends the petition to the assigned judge, does the clerk also send a copy to the case manager I'm not sure what their paperwork flow is or what their flow is, whether they get one or not. Now, you indicated earlier in your testimony that uh, case manager, in particular, Ms. Kim Stevens, would have a chart in which she would um, track the case. Yes, sir. Family law cases. They periodically review cases. They'll do uh, update cases or do a chart of what's pending right now, what needs to be signed, what needs to be done. So that helps them uh, manage that caseload or work on that caseload. They focus on the pro se litigants um, cases because of just the volume. So they focus on the things where the, there aren't counsel or attorneys to assist the parties. So if, if that case is not handled, within a reasonable time what should that case manager or miss stevens do take it to the judicial assistant and say hey you need to do something about this case can you do something about this case and they will usually send an email or they might go in person with the case file or now we have paperless courts so that's not as easy an option but they could go with a printout of some document that needs to be signed so they'll take it to the judicial assistant and say hey can you get the judge to look at this thing or do this thing Is there a, a written document that, that dictates where that petition would go? Well, there's a, a duty judge system that's set up and there's an administrative order that covers uh, backup judges and backup assignments. And then there's um, further uh, administrative order talks about emergency functions. Um, and there's a list of um, a, a rotation plan about who's the judge for first appearance duty weekends, who's the Leon duty judge for the duty phone, um, who's the family duty judge. So there's very rosters and lists that are produced and promulgated. We send them out to all the judges, JAs and court staff when they, when they change an update, which is very frequent. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of extra duties. Judges are working 24 seven. We have a duty phone where someone can call for a warrant in the middle of the night. If they don't get the judge, they wake me up. Um, you've got uh, first appearance weekend duty. You gotta work Saturdays, Sundays and holidays. 
Um, you've got a family duty judge, emergencies come in, there's a judge that just handles them for an entire week during the work day, and then the chief judge or someone else may handle them at night. So there's a whole series of emergency stuff. I mean, our judges are on duty, you know, th 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So we, we've got to be able to provide access, and hence we have these rosters. All right, Mr. Slay, you know, so let's just use what you uh, just testified to. Yes, so sir. if, if uh, Judge Hobbs is out a week or two, a duty judge, um, the filing is sent by the clerk to the judicial system and the case manager. Right. I'm not sure it goes to the case manager. I, 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 okay. Yes, sir. So you're not sure how the clerk does it? I'm, I'm not sure if it goes to the case manager or they get it later by reviewing the num cases that came in the queue or the docket. I'm not sure how they get the information. All right. Well, what, what I'm referring to is you don't, you're not sure as to whether the clerk sends it to the case manager. No, sir, I'm not. Okay. If you have a duty judge, would that duty judge make that decision on that emergency petition? Well, the, the duty judges only handle certain things. So the duty judge only handles protective injunctions. It doesn't handle emergency matters in a dissolution case or emergency matters in child support or child custody. Um, those things wouldn't necessarily go to the duty judge unless a JA said, hey, my judge isn't out. They can't do this particular document or something that came in. Can you look at it to see if it's a true emergency? So, so the, when we talk about the, the family duty judge, that's handling protective injunctions as they come in. And there's a lot of those that come in every day. So a family duty judge would not handle those emergency petitions? Not unless they were brought directly to their attention because of, of some circumstance with it that where it had to be handled. Yes, sir. It would come to the judge, and if the judge wasn't going to get it within a day or two, then the JA could bring it to somebody else. There's an administrative judge of the division. Um, they could look at that or determine whether it should go to a duty judge. I mean, there, or the chief judge is always available um, to assist with those. The chief judge backs up a lot of stuff all throughout the circuit. All right, Mr. Mr. Slayton, I'm, I'm trying to get through this. Um, you know, I'm sorry if I'm not so, answering. I'm trying to figure out what you're asking. Uh, the, 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 so what, what I'm getting at is, it sounds like you're saying that, uh, testifying that the JA would have to bring it to the attention of the duty judge. If it was a, not a protective injunction, if it was just a yes. run-of-the-mill. Well, this is what we're just talking yeah, about if here. If it was a run-of-the-mill emergency proceeding, um, it doesn't go to the duty judge, is my understanding, that that, that would be handled by the JA. Um, take it to the judge. If the judge isn't available, then it would go to whatever the administrative judge or chief judge worked out to have it handled. It could be the duty judge. So the duty judge is not a general family duty judge. They're very specific, I think, in what function or role they play. Uh, what about if there was a senior judge? Uh, senior judges can, can, can assist sometimes, and if you're, if you're desperate looking for a judge, and believe me, I've walked around the building many times in my career looking for a judge, because something came in, and, and it, it may be very late or even after hours on a weekday, I can't find any judge in that division present, I'll walk around and find a judge. I mean, that's, that's something just people in court administration will do, because if something comes in, you want to get it handled, especially right. injunctions in particular, because they, by definition, are emergencies. All right, let me, let me state it this way. I just want you to confine your answers to emergency petition. Yes, sir. So we can stay away from the injunctions. Yes, sir, I got you. Thank you. Um, if you had known that Judge Hobbs was not in the office for that period of time, would you have still included this case on your email to the JQC? Well, I think I think I would have because it, again, did the, the JA bring it up to anyone or say this case needs to be resolved? This case needs to be happened. And one of the examples that was brought up to the JA's attention, and she dismissed it completely. There were there were three cases, and it was the the third case I think they told me right. about was the Ren. That's that's what clicked the flag. I need to call the chief judge because we're we're going to get to that one. Yes, sir. So. <clears throat> All right, let's go to uh, Pittman v. Smith.
what I'll do to help you with that, if you will go to uh, JQC Exhibit 9. You can continue. And that's on page four of seven at the bottom? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you aware that there was a order of referral filed on December 30, 2017, which orders in essence that all subsequent pleadings and filings are to be referred to the magistrate? Um, at the time, I, I wasn't aware of it, I'm fairly sure. I would have put some information like that in there, I'm sure, in my letter or my email. If you had known that, would you still have referred, included that case in your email? Um, I may still have because it, it, it strikes me as it'd be odd to send an emergency matter to a magistrate. A magistrate, um, I wouldn't think, makes determinations on emergency matters. They, they have to do a written report and then they have to file it and give the parties a notice of everybody and then they've got to have 10 days for people to take exceptions. I mean, it's a long, complicated process. I don't, I don't see why an emergency matter would go to a magistrate. I mean, it's possible, but it doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I mean, if I saw that, I would have disregarded it, possibly. I mean, I think I probably. You, you, you're, when you say saying disregard it, you would have disregarded the judge's order? I would have disregarded the fact that all future things would be referred to the magistrate because it still would have been an issue that this is an emergency. And I supervise the magistrates. I know the. The, the time periods that they have to do things are much longer. The circuit judge can make a decision on the spot. A magistrate, there's a whole process built in that makes it a very long time consuming process. Sir, do you have the authority to just ignore a judge's order? I wouldn't say ignore a judge's order. Yeah, I'll sustain as argumentative. I'll ask your next question. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, let's move to the incident involving uh, Ms. Harris, Rhonda Harris. You used the term summon, that Ms. Harris was summoned to Judge Hobbs' office. Um, what causes you to use the word summon? Uh, summon is a specific legal term. I think that's probably, um, she was called to go to, to the office or, 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 or wanted in the office for, for some reason. I'm not sure why, but she said I was, I was called to the office or maybe she used the term summoned to the office, but told to come by the office is my recollection. Now, were you aware that uh, Ms. Harris was working with Judge Shustrom that particular day? I'm, I'm not sure if she was or not. Um, <coughs> but I'll, I, I don't know why she would be working with him. She, she does family court. I think at the time he was doing dependency court. But that can happen. Oh, absolutely. If, if uh, we've got a very small team of case managers, I mean, I've, I had four because the hiring freezes, I think we're down to three now. Uh, but there's a small team, so they do have to cover for each other sometimes. So it is very possible, absolutely. Didn't you state in your email to the JQC that, um, and it's still involving these three cases, 
that uh, when, when things are brought to Judge Hobbs' attention regarding these family law cases, she addresses them immediately? I believe so, but I mean, I'd, I'd like to look at the document. Okay. But I think when it comes to her attention, I think that's, that's accurate. I think she's responsive. Yes, sir, I think the problem lies with her judicial assistant, maybe. Right, any further calls? Yes, sir. I'm going to okay. move it along quickly. Uh, Mr. Slayton, was the was the moving of Miss Rhonda Harris to another county already in motion prior to uh, the meeting that Judge Hobbs had with Miss Harris in her office? I don't think so. We had we had talked about maybe realigning our resources. It was very sort of nebulous. What might happen? Who might go where? How things would work? I I I don't think that you know there was any urgency to do Rod, uh, Rhonda Harris and to do her right there to move her to a different location. I mean, that was very ad hoc, calling folks together and trying to set that up quickly. But we, we do generally, you know, look at realigning services because, you know, this caseload may go down, this the caseload goes up, and so I put, try to task the resources to where the work is. All right, Mr. Slayton, just um, one last question. Just want to make absolutely sure that um, Mr. Ken Kent told you that, that, that he had an injunction petition from Christine Rosa in his hands that they were working on. I'm sure he said it was in his hands. I think he said I'm working on that case, or it's that paperwork. He didn't want to. He didn't want to tell me about it or talk about it. Did he say that was included in those documents that he had in his hand in those papers? I, I, I can't recall now. I mean, I'm thinking back to when we were talking. I just the, the sense of the conversation was he didn't want to tell me what he was doing, and I said, "You got to tell me." I'm asking on behalf of the chief judge. And he said, well, it's that case. And, and then, you know, I said, what case? And he talked about the injunction case. It was something involved with that. And I'm not sure exactly what papers he had in his hand, but to me, it was very clear it was that case. I mean, the case, the, the, the Rosa injunction case. All right, thank you, sir. Any redirect? All right, I'll go the other way. Mr. White, any questions? One, uh, one little line. Um, Sir, can you look at Judge Hobbs' exhibit binder, uh, exhibit number two? I think it's your email of August 2nd. Yes, sir. Okay, and your email is truthful and accurate, correct? Yes, absolutely. This is the email that I sent. I think the next day I was trying to still work the issue about her. I'm not asking you what you're trying to do. I'm just asking you if it's accurate and truthful. Oh, yes, sir, absolutely. I'm okay. sorry. And you make it clear in there that Judge Hobbs is not seeking special treatment, correct? That's what you say there. Well, I said we are not asking for any special treatment. You said the court. You're referring to the judge, aren't you? I'm referring to the court as a whole, the, the, the court as a whole. Okay, including the judge. Yeah, that would, yes, sir. That would just yeah. everyone, the court as a whole. And right. we speak in plural like that a lot. I understand, but you're, you're making it clear that 
that the court, including Judge Hobbs, is not seeking special treatment. Yes, sir, because I absolutely did not want that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. No questions. Judge Ruth? Mr. Tyree? That's what you're looking at. All right, then we'll go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Um, who's your next witness going to be? All right, we'll take a 10 minute recess and call for record.
We will proceed with the next witness, and then after that, I assume the video. Okay. All right, who is the next witness for the JQC? The JQC will call Rhonda Harris. Oh, ma'am, I'm sorry, stand up and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right, please be seated. Ms. Harris, please introduce yourself to the members of the panel and spell your name for the court reporter. My name is Rhonda Harris, R-H-O-N-D-A-H-A-R-R-I-S. All right, and Ms. Harris, how are you currently employed? Say that again? How are you currently employed? Through the state of Florida. Okay, and, and do you work for the Second Judicial Circuit? I do. All right, what's your, t what's your job there? Case manager. Oh, and tell me, what does a case manager do? Um, we process pro se filings. Okay, pro se filings in what types of cases? Um, family law. Okay, family law cases. And how long have you been a case manager in here? I have been with the Second um, for four years. Okay, and how long have you been? Um, three and a uh, half. Three and a half. Okay, and, and how long have you been a case manager? Uh, well, let me back up. Were you a case manager for Judge Hobbs? I was. While she was in the family division? Yes, sir. Okay, and how long were you her case manager? Um, August of 2019 to October of 2019. Okay, until you were, uh, from the time she was moved into the division until you were moved to different duties? Yes. Okay. Can you explain in layman's terms to us, when an emergency motion is received, what's the normal course that it follows in terms of being transferred to the JA and then a for a ruling by the judge? When a pro se party files a pleading and they have marked it as an emergency, they file it with the clerk's office first. The clerk then sends out an email to the JA, the judge, and copies the case managers. All of us are copied on, on that email as to the pleading being filed. Then the judge would review it and deem it either an emergency, non-emergency, or expedited hearing. Okay, and once the judge makes a determination as to, let's say it's an emergency, uh, what happens then? It stays with the judge's office. I do not um, monitor that case. Okay, so it stays with the judge's office, and the judge's office, the judge or the JA would be in charge of setting that emergency hearing? Correct. It doesn't come to you to set that emergency hearing? Correct. I okay. do not schedule anything on the judge's calendar. Okay. Turn your attention to uh, the case of uh, CW and KN, that's 2019-DR-2449. Um, and for your reference, uh, if you would please open the black exhibit binder in front of you. And turn to tab 26. Okay, do you have tab 26 open? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell us what this is? This is the Riley case. Okay, is this a petition, is this an emergency motion? It is, it's a petition for temporary custody filed okay. by the litigant as an emergency. Okay. What they deem as an emergency. And so I see the petition uh, has a, what appears to be a stamp on it and it's been marked as a non-emergency hearing. Do you see right. that? Mm -hmm. And there's a signature. Do you recognize that signature? Yes, sir. And whose signature is that? Judge Hobbs. Okay. Is that the consistent signature she's used since you were in her division? Yes, sir. Okay. So in this instance, the Riley case that's been set as a non-emergency hearing, what would happen to that case? 
as a non-emergency, it would then go back to me to make sure that everything has happened on it, meaning that it's been served on the parties, there's been everything that's procedural-wise, form-wise, is, is filed the UCCJEA, and then it would be referred to the magistrate for a final hearing. Right. Now, the filing date on this petition is August 26, 2019. And the e-filing date at the top is 1024 of 19, reflecting when the clerk's office received, is that when the clerk's office would have received the determination? So the stamp you see here, the filed August 26th, that's the date that the petitioner filed the petition. Okay. This date is the date that the judge stamped and signed the non-emergency. So the 10-24-2019 is when Judge Hobbs determined this was not an emergency. That's the date it was filed. With the clerk's office. Right. And that would, that would be filed by, by whom? Either the judge herself or the JA. The judge or the JA. That number would tell you, that filing number. Okay. You don't happen to know off the top of your head whose number is who, do you? Oh, they're, they're all different. Oh. It would just tell you who the filer is of this document. Oh, okay. Understood. Uh, if you would then turn to tab 28 in the black binder in front of you. Um, this is the emergency petition uh, in the matter of C, W, and K, N. Uh, I think I erroneously referred to the other one as that. I apologize. That was the Riley matter. Mm -hmm. um, in this matter, C, W, and K, N, um, you see here um, the stamp, and the stamp has been checked as an emergency, and whose signature is that? Judge Hobbs. Okay. And it's difficult to see on my copy, but can you see the filing date that this was filed? August 21st. Okay. And the determination as to an emergency would have been made by the judge, by Judge Hobbs. Is I that correct? So. I would, yes, sir. Okay. If you would then turn to tab. Can I ask a question right there? Because I can't tell. What day was it deemed an emergency? It was apparently handed to the clerk to file. When there's not an e-file at the top of that document, it was not e-filed. So it was filed the same day as the document was received. So it was filed August 21st, and the judge deemed it an emergency on August 21st? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That's what I was trying to figure out. Is it possible that this was e-filed? and sent into an error queue and that's why it doesn't if have it was e-filed you would see that at the top of the document okay referring to the cwakn matter uh, did judy Ware, judge hobbs's ja come to see you about this matter yes okay tell us about that she brought the document to me after it was deemed an emergency and asked what she needed to do with it now. She brought which document to you? The petition itself. After it had been deemed an emergency mm -hmm. and asked you what to do with it and what did you tell her? That now that it had been deemed an emergency it would be set with the judge's calendar and scheduled according to you know her, her calendar that she would have to, if the party's information is not on here, meaning the petitioner or the respondents, the mother and father of this child or children, she would have to reach out to the petitioner to obtain that information in order to send them the notice of hearing, either by email, phone. You know, she had to look, get the petitioner to give her any information she could get if it wasn't within this petition. In order to set the matter on the judge's calendar for, for an emergency hearing? Correct. Okay. And how did she react to what you were telling her? Oh, she didn't have time to do that. She told me she didn't have time to be looking up the addresses or calling the petitioner and that wanted me to reprint this face sheet so she could have the judge. She was going to take it back to the judge and have her deem it a non-emergency. She told me that she did not have time to do that shit. She said those words? Said those words. Now, when you, asked, when you said she asked you to reprint the face sheet, what is that? Is that just, just the first page? Correct. And would that have had the emergency stamp or would that be a clean copy? 
It would be a clean copy. So it could be stamped again? Again. Okay. Did you print her a face sheet? I did. And she left with it? She did. And she said that she was going to have Judge Hobbs reclassify it? Deem it as a non-emergency and that the magistrate's office could worry about setting it. The magistrate's office? Mm -hmm. Does because the magistrate set hearings? They do. If it, like I said earlier, if it had been a non-emergency, I would have made sure that service was obtained and every document was filed pleading that was needed for it, and then I would have referred it to the magistrate for a hearing to be set. So she was putting that work on someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you would turn to tab 29 in the black binder, this appears to be the same petition, C, W, and K, N. Uh, the file date is in the same place. Uh, August 21st. Is this, uh, what, what exactly is this? It's the same petition. It's just now been deemed a non-emergency and dated at the top E filed on 10-23-19. Okay. And where Judge Hobbs' signature would be, I see some initials. Do you recognize those initials as Judge Hobbs' signature? I never dealt with, with, with initials like this. I've only dealt with her signature, the big swoopy signature. So that's the first time you've ever seen those? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please answer yes I'm or sorry. no. Yes. Thank you for that, Ms. Mountain. Ms. Harris, did you take your concerns about the way Judge Hobbs was handling matters in her family division to uh, Mr. Sladen? Took them to Kim Stevens, my supervisor. Okay, and, and together did you take those concerns to Mr. Sladen? Mm -hmm. We did. Okay, and what did he advise you to do? Well, Kim had advised me when we when this first started that just to you know keep monitoring them because Judy had told me the one was going to be deemed a non-emergency, so I just kind of made a note of that, and a mental note in my head that that case you know was going to be now a non-emergency, so it's going to probably be rolling back to me. Um, but then just to continue to monitor them, he wanted the information on the cases. Okay, and at some point did you? Uh write down some things um, for, for Mr. Sladen relating to the cases? Or did, did, you, did you craft an email or did he craft an email? Were you present for that? Yes, yes. Uh, Grant did draft an email. Okay. When that was the same time we were given the information to him. Okay. And he was asking you questions and that's what he was crafting the email? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sometime after that, were you called into Judge Hobbs' chambers to discuss some of these matters, including the CW and KN uh, incident? Yes, sir. Okay. What were you doing that day before you were called into her chambers? I was filling in for my supervisor was out of town, and I was filling in for her with dependency court. I was, so I was in court with Judge Serstrom, and we had just taken a quick lunch. Um, I had not been in my office more than not even 10 minutes yet and um, Ms. Ware had came to the door and said that the judge wanted to see me in her chambers. Ms. Ware came to get you? She did. Okay. And so you walked to the judge's chambers with Ms. Ware? I did. Okay. And where did you go when you got to the chambers? Were you in Ms. Judge Hobbs's office? Mm -hmm. so, yes, sir. So Judy sits out front, and then if you go through the door, that's chambers for Judge Hobbs, and her desk is in the far back of that room. Okay, and so Judge Hobbs, was she seated at her desk? She was. And where did you sit? I didn't. You stood? Yes, sir. Where was uh, Miss Ware? Was she in the office with you? She was. She was back at the door on the couch. She was, was on a sofa? She was on a sofa next to the couch, next to the door, I mean. Behind you or? Behind me. Okay. When you're in the office, um, what, what was Judge Hobbs asking you about? What was she saying? She immediately just started asking one question after the next about why this case had not been set for a hearing, why this case was sent to the magistrate and not had been, um, or why that case had not been sent to the magistrate, that other case. And I just, I told her, I said, I do not schedule things on your calendar. This was deemed an emergency. Judy was supposed to schedule this. She came and saw me. I explained to her that we went through the procedures. Um, she asked if 
when I told her that it was supposed to be, according to Judy, deemed a non-emergency, she even asked me who deemed it a non-emergency. And then whenever I told her the part about the, um, we haven't gotten there yet, but the corrections queue, she did ask Judy if um, she had received that email from the corrections queue. And that, at that time, Judy got up and went to her desk to see if she had received that email, but she said she did not. Okay, let me back up a little bit. Um, she's asking you about who deemed this a non-emergency? After I told her that, she asked why it was not set yet. And I told her that that would be the, something her JA would set on her calendar. But that Judy had told me it was going to be deemed a non-emergency and that it had already been filed as a non-emergency, but it wasn't showing. And so then she asked me who deemed it the non-emergency. So I just said that Judy said she was going to bring it back to you and have it deemed a non-emergency. So she didn't even know that it had been deemed a non-emergency? Well, at that point it hadn't. There was, well, at least nothing was filed. Okay. And so during this uh, questioning, um, did Ms. Ware make any statements? She did not. Did, did Judge Hobbs have anything in her hand? as she was talking to you? She didn't. She just kept looking back down at the desk, and, and I even asked her, so what is going on? Um, what, what's happening? And she said that Jonathan and court admin had filed something against her. Had filed something? And she something? referenced the paper in front of her, and, and she showed it to me, and it was, it was the cases, these cases we're talking about right now. If you would turn to tab 9 in the JQC, the black binder there. I'm looking at page... Five of seven. Are you there, Ms. Harris? I am. Okay. This page, is this, do you recognize this to be the page that she was referring to? I do. And questioning you from? Yes, sir. For the record, this is the amended notice of formal charges that was provided to Judge Sostrom by email from the JQC on October 22nd. And for the members, that's at tab eight. Wait a second. Wait a second. Ms. Harris says you're in Judge Hobbs's chambers and she's referring to what she thinks is a complaint filed by Judge Sostrom was actually an amended notice of investigation from the JQC. Did she ask you where they got this information? She did not. Did she quiz you about how we could have obtained this information at all? The only thing she asked me was who would have said that Judy said that. Okay. And the only person would have been yourself? Correct. There was no Wh one else? Which I insinuated by looking over at Judy, which she said nothing. She just sat there. Okay. During this encounter, how did you feel? I felt very uncomfortable. I did, I did not know, what, I mean, I could tell she was very upset. I did not think she was upset with me. I just felt like she was very upset. She, she, didn't, she didn't know what was going on with these cases. That's how I felt. And that, that I was almost to the point like she was wanting to blame me, but it had been constant correspondence between myself and her ju her judicial assistant as to what the steps were and, and nothing had happened. Okay. I don't have any other questions at this particular time. Okay, thank you. Any cross-examination? Ms. Harris, good afternoon. Uh, I am, my aim is to be very brief with you this afternoon. Um, Did you pull your mic down? I can yes, I'm, I'm going to, thank you. My aim is to be very brief with you this afternoon. Um, you became Judge Hobbs case manager on August 2nd, 2019. 
It was that, in August. I was okay. already a case manager. She, I mean, her case manager. Because she was assigned to family law. Okay. And you, you testified that when the emergency petition comes in, that the clerk's office will send an uh, email to the JA, the judge assigned to the case, and CC the case manager. Correct. And you would, in turn, monitor what happens in that case? If it's deemed an emergency, then once that pleading is filed that it's an emergency, then no case management from myself, no, sir. By Judge Hobbs being new to the Family Law Division, did you work closely with Judge Hobbs and her J.A. Judy Ware? I was right across the hall from them, yes, sir. And they came to you with questions on how to do things? Sometimes, yes, sir. I'm going to refer to this as an unwritten rule, so you tell me if I'm correct or not. Uh, when a uh, emergency petition is filed, family law, dealing with, let's say, um, child custody by a pro se person, then the procedure is to as we pointed out, email, JA judge, CC the case manager, judge makes a decision. If the judge decides it is a non-emergency, then you would handle it. That's correct. Is that written down anywhere? It's like an unwritten rule, I guess, is what the, the non-emergency is that the case manager then would case manage the case. If it's an emergency, then it has to be set. If I can have you to look at um, Judicial Qualifications Exhibit in the Black Book, Exhibit 28. Then in the white book, if you will look at exhibit 16, the second page, say the second, second page of exhibit 16, go down to the last 82119. Okay. Instructions from Judge Hobbs, I'm sorry, instructions from judge, per judge set for emergency hearing. Does that indicate that it was declared an emergency or deemed an emergency by Judge Hobbs on 8-21-2019? Um, sir, I'm sorry, could you clarify which exhibit we're looking at? 16, second page. The last 821 19. Okay. Now let's let's go to the, the meeting which occurred uh, in Judge Hobbs Chambers with you there and uh, the J.A. Judy Ware. Were you at any time blocked from leaving 
Judge Hobbs, Chambers. I wouldn't say that I was blocked, no, sir. <laughs> did you feel threatened by Judge Hobbs while you were there? I did not feel threatened. I felt uncomfortable. I felt like I was being inter interrogated about these cases that had already been discussed with her JA, things that I thought would already have been brought to her attention. When you say discuss with J.A., you mean between you Myself and, and Ms. Ware. I'm sorry. Thank you. If you would look at um, Judicial Qualifications Exhibit Number 6 in the black binder, Notice of Amended Final Charges. I'm sorry, this, this is the amended notice of investigation. When, Ms., when Judge Hobbs was talking with you, you said you were standing up. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Did you see this actual document or just one page? He showed me the document. Okay. And did you look at each page? No, sir. So when she showed you the document, it was, was it stapled together? It seems like it was, yes, sir. Okay. She had it folded, well, she was folding them back as she was looking at them. And if you will go to page six of eight, Is that the page that you're indicating that you saw? Yes, the ABC. That's correct. And those are the cases she was asking about the status. Yes, sir. Your move from being Judge Hobbs' case manager, when you were moved to another county, was that already discussed before that meeting took place? Yes, sir. So that was something that um, was being discussed about happening sometime in the near future? Yes, sir. I was swapping with another um, case manager. Just one uh, follow-up question, and I will check and see if I need to ask anything else. But that, that meeting took place on October 22nd? Yes, sir, that Tuesday. Okay. I may have a moment. All right, thank you. May I read your hand? Ms. Harris, when you said you didn't feel blocked, did you try to make excuses to leave the office at various times? I did. Okay, and were those successful? Were you able to leave? The second attempt, yes, sir, not the first. And when you were able to leave was when Mr. Sladen came in? Correct. <coughs> and Regarding, uh, strike that. I'm done. Okay. Well, let me see if the panel has any questions, Mr. Tyree, Judge Ruth. You know, just very bl briefly, Ms. Harris, you mentioned uh, at the very end of uh, some of the questioning that prior to this meeting in Judge Hobbs' chambers, you had already had discussions with switching, I think you said, with, with someone else, another case manager? Correct. And how long before this meeting in Judge Hobbs' chambers did those discussions about switching with another 
uh, case manager start take place? October 15th, I was in training at the um, first DCA and I got a call from my supervisor asking if I would um, be interested in taking the outer counties. Any idea what prompted that? They were moving the case manager from there, from that outer counties back to mediations and moving the lady from mediations to a case manager. It was just an internal swapping. Okay, so your this this internal swapping had nothing to do with your meeting with no, Ms. Ms. with Judge Hobbs. Correct. Thank you. Uh, briefly, Ms. McIver. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. White. Um, exhibit. Can you look at exhibit number twenty-eight in the uh, black binder? Twenty-eight, right? Yes, ma'am. You there? I'm there. Okay. The circuit judge initials deeming this an emergency hearing. Do you recognize those as Judge Hobbs? The signature here? The initials, yeah, underneath there. I don't know if it's an initial. I don't see initials. I see a signature okay. under emergency. I recognize that signature. Okay. And then on number 29, the next exhibit. Did you say you do not know whose initials that is? Correct. I don't know who wrote that. Do you know if Judge Hobbs' judicial assistant wrote that? I do not. I have no further questions. Thank you. You don't recognize the initials, and, and let me clarify. I think you testified that Judge Hobbs seemed confused about what had happened or what was happening with this particular order? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Harper, if you could turn to uh, the White Book, Judge Hobbs exhibits number 16, the second page. And on August 21st, down to the bottom of the August 21st entry, it says instructions from judge, per judge set for emergency hearing. Correct. Okay, and that page goes through December 13th. Is there anywhere in there that indicates that it, it had been changed to a non-emergency? Yes, sir. October 23rd, instructions from the judge, non-emergency hearing. Okay. And you're not aware of any activity uh, in the interim two months other than a letter on September 23rd from one of the litigants? Correct. Okay. Are you aware of any activity which is not reflected on this document? I mean, did you hear anything about this case? Or, or? When, yes, sir. Judy, uh, Miss Ware, and myself had spoke on a different date, and Judy had said that it had been it had been filed um, as a non-emergency. I called the clerk's office to verify that information, and there was a error in the filing of it, and it was sent back to the filer through a correction queue. So. Whoever filed that document incorrectly, it would have went to an email would have been received by that filer to make that correction. Okay, so there's an effort to file it as a non-emergency prior to October 23rd, but it... It was before. sometime in September, yes, sir. Okay, and then that got corrected October 23rd. Correct. Okay, thank you. Can I have one question? Go ahead, Mr. White. I just, because I don't understand this... Uh chart here it says the source and it has an initials b as in boy m as in m as in m mary what is that the source initials there where are you at sir uh exhibit 16 far right hand corner or five that is, that's a clerk. far right hand column i'm sorry uh, that's clerk entries all of this is clerk entries so i'm not sure what that source maybe it's the person the clerk okay their initials I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Williams, any follow-up questions? No, sir. Mr. Powell, any follow-up questions?
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I only have a couple of questions. I'll make them short. Um, if you would turn to the white book, exhibit number 17. And if you would look at that, please read it to yourself. And you, you mentioned about a uh, document being placed in the queue. And this document here, um, Judges Exhibit 17, reflects that there was a document placed in the queue. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And from your understanding of the question about things that are, were not reflected in the court file was that, to your understanding, it was an order that was placed in the queue, but not on the court docket. Say that one more time. Okay. The, you were told there was an order filed that was placed in the queue, but does that reflect on the court docket that it was placed in the queue. No, sir. On that other exhibit 16, it does Correct. not say that it, anything was placed in the queue. Okay. Nothing further. Okay, thank you. And ma'am, you're free to go. And who will the JQC's next witness be? Uh, before we do that, I, if, if it's with the chair's permission, I'd like to tell you the time to watch for the video, and uh, Ms. Ross I provided her with the Dropbox link if she would like to circulate that to the members uh, to watch that video. I thought we were watching it here. Where are we watching this video? I think we can streamline things if you'd like to watch it tonight. That's fine. Well, I don't, I don't think we have the ability, or some of us don't have the ability to go just to the times you want, so. If it's going to be 40 minutes, we can do it here. My recommendation is then we would go ahead and do that now. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's a move. I don't regard okay. that. And, uh, Mr. Williams and I have discussed this. The um, Judge Hobbs' son is still in Leon County Detention Facility, and he's in protective area. The video identifies him. So I don't, what we were talking about, I suggested that this part not be on live stream, but the panel could see it. It's uh, the JQC's position. I guess the, the closest thing I can think of would be an, sort of an in camera review, but in a courtroom and we just cut the I audio can. feed and the video feed and just you all can see the video and it is what it is. All right. What I'll do is uh, we'll review it in camera and then if need be I can decide later on whether it's required to be made public or not. But in the meantime we'll go off the record and uh, well actually no. before we go off the record let me just go ahead and say this. We'll, we'll watch the video and then we'll adjourn for, for the day. Um, so with that, now we can go off the record and, and uh, I'll reserve ruling later on as to whether it needs to be made public or not. I will work to get this 